So now let's move on with our next thing in our uh, plan of action. So what we're going to do right now is going to be, we will create a consumer group like what we created for our exercise four. Exercise five, simple producer and consumer was just a hands-on on what we have already done. And we will see, uh, find that the consumer will not read anything since the messages have been read already. If you try the same example, Okay, so this is what we are going to do. Let me open up Eclipse and then go down to that particular code. I'll simply say file close out. And let me go down to our exercise four. That's right, no, that was a consumer demo. And I think we're talking about consumer. That's correct, okay? So if you look at this exercise four, and sorry, not three, exercise four and if you see what was the group id that i had mentioned that was again the fourth uh, application so what i'll do over here is let me go back to the document so we will run this code <coughs> we will uh, say that this is going to be the same group and uh, uh, we will see what will happen when we run this so let me just go back over here and uh, run this so control c and let me go back to the window where I have it running. Let me do control C and a clear. Okay, so this is where I typically run my consumers. So I do a bootstrap server, I fourth application. I just describe this because this is something new that you see. So this will tell you what the consumers are reading and where it has found the offset. So just one second. Just connecting my mouse again. I'm using my desktop, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the mouse in my laptop. So you can see here the lag is zero. So this is the way how you can go ahead and connect uh, your check what is the details of your log. So nothing is uh, lagging behind. So everything is already put. So next time you start something, you will not see the consumer reading anything. So I wanted to prove that. Just once again, dear. Connected my mouse once again. Yeah, that is working now. That's good. So now, if I go back and start with the consumer, let's go back to the example. And uh, see, it showed me all this. So let me run the consumer once and see if it is showing me something. There we go. This was that example. Control C. Uh, what I can do is this, the same example. Now, in the example, what I have done is I think I have changed. Hey, I haven't changed it. Okay. So we can go ahead and run the same example uh, with the same uh, group ID and see what will happen, friend. So I need to create a new file. So let me close this. So we have finished off with all the example. And I think I've already done that. So see here, if you look at your example six, that's not this, this is with thread. Whereas this example is consumer demo groups. I would have done that. So let me just go back over here. Let me go down to five was, yeah, that's right. Five was demo groups. So let me open up this particular code. So see here, our earlier code was on my fourth application. So let me go down to consumer demo and see that was fourth application. I'm going to keep the same topic and C first. So control C, let me go back to my consumer demo groups and I'm going to keep the same ID and the control V and see, let's see what happens. So I need to uh, create the uh, jar file. I need to build it up. So exercise, I'll go down to my run as and I'll do a Maven install so that the jar file will get created. Couple of seconds, guys. <clears throat> so nothing is different over here, exactly like the last example. And I'm trying to run this example again. So if you do that, you will see that uh, you will not see the complete set of files. So, sorry, four is already done. Five is what I have to see. One second. No, not this. I think I have to open up file only. And to be very frank, I don't know what I have created. So let me just uh, uh, do it once again. I'm in a, a file and I'm going to do a install. 
to that. Just be doubly sure that uh, things are all correct, friends. And once that is done, I will move this jar file to uh, the running server. And let's go ahead and deploy this and see. And see whether it can, it will show me something. So let me go down to the NCP. This was uh, example five, sorry, exercise five. So let's go down to exercise five. Uh, my target, my this file, go down to lab programs. And uh, yeah, I, this was 5.0. And this was uh, 5.2. OK, so I don't have this uh, exercise 5. See here, this was 5.0. So this is different. So let me copy this file. It's getting uploaded. So I have to be careful when I run this. That's OK. So this is the file. And now let me run the code and show it to you to see whether it's running fine or not. Let me do it clear. And I'll do ls minus l. And this is the quick one second. This is irritating me. This window, let it go up. Okay, this is the code I'm interested in. <clears throat> let me be sure. Once again, friends, five uh, dash zero, not five dot. Okay, so I'm interested in five dash zero. So this one, okay, like the other one. So let me run that code and see how do we test it. The code is ready over here. Let me go go now. Yeah, this is 5-0. So let me copy this code, control C, and let me run it from here. Okay, I'll press enter. Yeah, it will start. And you see that this has got all the topics because in this example, I am working with my uh, first two underscore topic, which has three replications. And you can see topic uh, one zero, uh, top, topic one, topic zero, and topic two is all assigned to this particular guy. But then it is not able to see anything. Okay. The reason is because you saw over here when we ran this, not this. Where did I see the one? Yeah, here. See, it is not having any lag. The topic one has got uh, four uh, items in it, then six items and uh, uh, 10 items, okay? But then not, nothing is lacking, okay? So everything is already read. So the only way how I can start again is by creating a new thing. So you see that we will see no data will be shown to us. The way to fix it is to change the group ID okay to a different name and then to test it so by changing the group id we reset the application the new jar will be called as 5.1 okay with dependencies dot jar and that's what i'm executing and now when i run it you will see the complete set of uh, partitions back once again okay so now we will talk about how the partitions are distributed to the consumer class when we create Okay, when we started with the first consumer class, it showed us something like this. See here, all the three partitions are assigned to the same consumer. Then we create one more instance of the consumer class. This is what uh, in the morning uh, he had done, uh, Gaurav had done there, and he had put it in the chat window. So when he created a second consumer, you saw that there was a rebalancing of the consumer and topic uh, two went to the first consumer and in the second class you got topic one and topic zero this means that the partitions will be distributed between two clients okay so that is what we are going to see okay so to test uh, now to test this we will execute our exercise 3 code and to send data and see if the respective uh, classes are getting the data so this is what we are going to see also close one of the consumers and we'll see how the rebalancing of the consumer happens. So I'm, I'm going to do this by creating two consumers and see how that would happen. But first, let me run the complete example so that uh, make the changes and run the example here. So let me go back. I'm going to keep this as my fifth application. Okay, I save this. Let me recreate the jar. Let me be clear. This is demo groups, that's correct. Right click, I will say 
uh, run as, then I will say maven install. Then move that file onto the server. Just one second. So it is getting created, it's almost finished. There we go. Now, if you go back to the server, so example five, this is that file. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to instead of dash, we had some dot examples that we were doing earlier. So I'm just going to rename this, okay? So that there is no issues. So I will just over here, I will just say rename and I will just put in one additional dash uh, besides this. So it will be five dash dash and then I will bring it to my server. Okay, because I have got five dot, I have got five dash. Five dot was for the earlier example, another a variation of it. And this is our current example. Okay, so that's what I'm going to run. So let me go back and see what should I do. So, okay, just run the example. So that's fine. So let me go back. We will first start with this. No data is coming. Now I will reset it so that instead of running it like this, I will say dash dash, okay? Instead of the top, so control C. Let me go back to my screen. That is my consumer, okay? Right click and let me go back. So instead of uh, like this, it is dash dash, okay? So this is correct. And uh, now I can enter this consumer demo groups and I'll press enter, okay? So when I run this, see here how, because it is going to read it again, right? So this is all the values that was there and all the three partitions is read by this, this particular uh, consumer only. Now I'll create one more consumer, okay? So you will see how the partitions will be reassigned here. So I will say duplicate session, not root, just one second, not root. Password is going to be header 123, lab software Kafka. And let me copy the code that I want to execute, control C, go back to the last window. Oh, sorry, it's in programs cd dot dot slash dot dot slash i'll say cd programs and let me let me increase the width of this okay let me do ls minus l and i'm interested in this code okay so i will right click and instead of phi dot one one is not required i will just say phi dash dash okay and i will press enter so when you create this, there is automatically a rebalancing of the cluster happens and see over here. So now what is going to happen is my topic one and zero is going to be to this particular window. To my earlier window, it will be only topic two, <clears throat> okay? Then what am I going to do is I'm just going to create one more window. So this is going to be my next window. So duplicate session. Not root. Password is going to be header 123. And I would see the lab programs. Let me go back here and copy this code. And run it over here. And instead of 5.1, it will be 5 dash dash. Oops. 5 dash dash. Okay. And when I get this, you will see here how the the second window is going to run two now. The third window is going to run one and the first window is going to run two. So you saw how the distribution automatically happens uh, when we do this here. okay? So that is what is the beauty. When I added a new consumer, it will uh, automatically reassign the partitions between all the different consumers here. So now, what I will have to do is I will have to go ahead and uh, uh, start with the producer. Okay, so let me go back. So we will have to execute the third code that is a producer demo code to make this work. So 
Let me go back to the third code. So first I'll go back to this window. Oh, sorry, this was that window. So this is, this is topic two. This was topic one, two, three. This was also the consumer, right? I don't need to have this consumer. This was okay. This was okay. So that's right. So this was not needed. So this is where I need to have my producer. So see the other consumers are still there. Topic two, topic one, and topic zero. So in this window, I'll start with the producer. So what do I have to do here? I will have to run the producer demo keys, the example that we ran yesterday, friend. So I'm just going to open up my cheat sheet because I don't want to uh, see that because the code is over there already. The third example that we did. So I'm going to run it from there. Just one second, friends. Let me scroll down. Exercise two. And now we will come down to exercise three. The producer demo. Yeah, that's fine. One second. I think it is this one. Okay. Let's go back and see. Yeah, that's right. This is the code that I want to run. And let me scroll down and I will have the key here. That's it. So that's the, this is the code that I want to run. So let me copy this. Do I have exercise three? I should have because I ran this today. So I should have it here. So there we go. I've got the code. That's perfect. So I'm going to copy this. And one more thing. Are we using first two underscore topic? I think so. Because as for the logic in my exercise five, that's correct. First two topic is what we are doing. So that's perfect. So let me copy this. Control C. Let me go down to the third, the first window and let me run this and I press enter and see the 10 topics are created. Now go down to the first consumer. Okay. The first consumer got everything related to partition zero or partition two because he is looking at uh, uh, the, sec the topic two, right? Not partition two, topic two. So he's getting all the things that is there in that particular topic. Now go down to the other consumer. He's getting everything that is there in the uh, partition one. Go down to the third consumer. He's getting everything that is there in the partition zero, friend. Okay. So in case if we create one more partition that will be empty, I mean, I don't know which one of them will be empty in the four. It could be any one will be empty. And then when I put a data, the empty partition will not have anything. Right? So the thumb rule is in a real world, you will always have the consumers uh, more than the producers. So even if any of the consumers fail uh, so that uh, the other guy can go ahead and read the whole thing. Right? Okay. So this is what you will have to go ahead and then try and see if you can do this thing. Okay. So this is what would be there in our exercise number six friends. Okay. So what I showed it to you, try it out yourself. I think Gaurav had already done that when he created uh, our two consumers and saw how it was done, but then I'll give you about 10 minutes. Please go ahead and see this. So any questions before I put myself on mute here? Baska, Brandon, yes, Gaurav. Yeah, Gaurav. Yes. So like if you were having like three consumers listed there, what if fourth consumer comes in? So fourth consumer will not get uh, anything to... Oh, no, 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 no. There will be a rebalance of the listeners and any one of the four will not get it. Not necessarily the fourth one. The fourth one might get a topic. Let's see that actually right now. So it's not, it's no guarantee that uh, it will definitely be the fourth one, my dear. It could be anyone. So I'm just opening up all the windows. Okay. I'm just going to create a duplicate session here. Let me say not true. Password is going to be Hadoop123 lab programs. And let me copy the code from day two. Let me scroll down. Copy this. I have to make a change. That's okay. Let's go back and I'll paste it. And it is not 5.1. It will be phi dash dash. Okay. I run this consumer and see here, he got topic zero, the one that I started now. 
the other one got topic one the this guy got topic two and the first one that has started that is empty so that got up so this is the way how the behavior would be so earlier okay. this guy was getting topic two right but right now he's empty friend Make okay. sense, Gaurav? Okay. Perfect. Yes, and then one of them dies. So again, a rebalancing happens. Exactly. So the moment a new consumer gets added, there's a rebalance that will happen, and uh, he might get, he might not get anything. So it is going to be randomly decided. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Vijay, you had a question, dear. I want to share here something. Can I share one? Tell me. Yeah, just give me one second. So let me stop sharing and go ahead, friend. So is anyone of you experiencing this one? Like when I'm trying to run this for uh, input in my, on the consumer groups, it is getting a timeout. Like not timeout. Like I'm having this error here. That's weird. Uh, this and you have nine zero nine two up and running, right? Sorry. You have nine zero nine two broker up and running. Yeah, yeah. Yes, right. If that is the case, which nine. is okay. is nine two and this nine three. Where is Zookeeper? Well, the Zookeeper is down. Was it down or it's what was down. the error before? It it no it is up and running but it shows some errors here. I don't know if you read it as error. It's info by the way. No, it's just an info. So oh, no, there's no error. Yeah, you showed what... me some other screen, screenshot earlier, right? Can you just scroll it's up? Just the command. So, so I'm trying to execute this command, okay? Okay. And this got this. You're just doing a describe of it. Uh, error executing command field offset by times. That's weird because uh, we didn't have any offset in our zookeeper. Uh, <clears throat> just try running it once again. Uh, okay, at the time when you start, that's the time it's giving you this, right? Uh, it will do this, uh, whatever. In this no, you're doing a describe, okay? That's it. This is actually a describe on that thing. The describe is giving an error. So I'm not too sure as to what is running. So again, the point is in all of our examples, we are trying with, uh, uh, okay, you're trying with two separate brokers, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I killed one. So I ran one of the two. No, no, one more thing. One more thing. Where is your Zookeeper pointing to? Go down to your Zookeeper.properties inside Kafka. Remember today morning I said that it's advisable not to put it inside slash time. So for demo sake, we can keep that. Hey, I, rem yeah. I, moved, I moved it. Okay, okay. So go down to, I think it will be, okay, config. That's right. Then, yeah, zookeeper.properties. Okay. So if you look at this location, see uh, what do you see at that location? Yeah, zookeeper. Yeah, ls minus l. Yeah. Yeah, see, there are multiple logs. Okay. So, ideally, in zookeeper, when you have multiple logs, that would mean that separate instances was running uh, of that. Of, uh, that means you close and started again. So, in a temp directory, what would happen is that these logs, you see multiple logs, that will automatically go away. But then, where are you getting that error? You showed an error, right? Was that at the time of describing you are getting? Or the yes, time when you're yes. starting, you're getting. No, at the time of describing. Okay. I'm, I'm executing He's this it constantly. Online, right? He's getting it constantly, actually. It's timing out all this thing. That is surprising. Yeah, they just try to uh, go to the, not here. That's very really good. Okay. Kafka, that's right. Run it here. Hold on. And you're able to produce and consume uh, otherwise, right? Producer consumers are fine. They're able yeah, to the work. Yeah, before, yeah. before lunch, yes. Because the zookeeper is running, right? Only describe is yeah. giving, giving an issue. Because zookeeper was running. So 
that is surprising. That's correct. It will not show me about the old zookeeper based consumers. That's correct. But then, why is this coming? Let me try. Have you tried with any other? Try with any other group ID, just to see if something related to the group. So it's no, actually that... working. Hung up on that my fourth application. You had uh, something called as uh, uh, this one, right? Uh, once again, let group me give one. you a group ID. Maybe try with group one if you ever tried group one. Uh, one second, can, can you come here? I'm saying like try with uh, group one uh, if you ever created uh, consumers with that. Earlier with the simple one, we tried to create group one. Yeah, yeah so it is working. Coming. But why it's failing for that one? That's interesting. Yeah, for me it didn't fail. It actually gave, gave me the value. So it might be something was not uh, there. So that's the reason because we had that topic and you saw that it, it uh, for for me when I ran it, it showed me it because we had three partitions and it had finished with all the partitions. So that's surprising. Um, what is the class where we mentioned the group name? Or what? No, in the same in the same class we had mentioned it. This one? Uh, not here. Uh, it will be there in uh, yeah demo keys. Look at the uh, consumer consumer. Look at the consumer one. Uh, here itself. See, uh, you got first to uh, sorry. This is only the topic. Uh, you can look at uh, this one. Uh, go down to uh, exercise four. That is consumer demo. The consumer demo, we have got that uh, key. The group ID is given to the consumers. See? So it should have been already there. Yeah, should have so been what there. I think, Vijay, what I think, maybe the topic is messed up between the uh, brokers. That's why it's uh, hung up on. Because we were using the first two underscore topics. So maybe that topic is no longer good. Can you describe the topic and see if that topic shows up nicely? First two topics. First two my fourth, no, my uh, my fourth application. Oh, okay, so that will be for the first topic. Okay, the list one, list one. I meant to say that describe actually that particular topic. Uh, yeah. I forgot the syntax. This is only listed. We want to have the describe one <laughs> once again. Let me get that. Oh, let me remove the list. Okay. I gave one command in the. Okay. Still, yeah, like describe. describe is working. The leader is still there. Just try with first underscore topic, the other thing. Okay, the other thing was working. We saw that also. So something would have been wrong with this, Vijay. So really wouldn't know what the reason would be. So my suggestion would be that create a new topic and then start off with that uh, directly, friend, because uh, it, this might give you some other results what you're having. The same code works perfectly fine uh, because we were trying with multiple different things, right? So I can actually show you the output of, yeah, you can see the screenshot. So that is what the output is, wherein it has finished up with everything. Hey, yeah. I saw your screen too. No, no, I'm just saying uh, that anyone has encoded that issue or not. That's okay. Okay, okay. I can. If anybody else have should I create issue, friend? Why should so I create the topic anyways? The topic is fine, right? What was that? Yeah, most like topic is fine, but could be some other data which might be not good with what this. I'm topic to say why should I create a new topic? I can just leverage the same topic, right? This guy. No, that's okay because we are only testing over here and since that was giving an error so that's what he was saying so that's perfect so no worries so till the time we get into an issue we can continue with that because what we were doing earlier is we were trying to play around with that for some demo right so that was the reason why something would have gone wrong but that's okay till the time you don't have any particular issue we can continue with that only no issues my dear
Okay. Okay, I'll try. Thanks. I'll give you about 10 minutes and then we will uh, move on. So I can close my, let me put a day two. And this is the example that you have that you, you have to try. Finish up this exercise six and then we will move on to a completely different use case. How to refactor our code using threads, guys. This will be a little bit lengthy. If, for people who have already finished six, they can start with seven, but then take some time out and try to finish this. I'll give you about 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, guys. So, Baskar, were you able to finish that? Any doubts until now? Brandon and Baskar? No, I will I'll be doing it later. That's okay. No worries. No, that's okay. No worries. So, just cover that. And if there's anything that is there in concepts, let me know, Baskar. Okay. Thank you. So Brandon, I don't know if you're there, Brandon. Uh, have you tried the examples? What we have done till now? No, he's not answering. Uh, Gaurav and Paris, I hope it's uh, okay for you. And Paris, I hope uh, the last time you got an error in the earlier example, you were able to resolve that, right? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's resolved, yes. That's was, great, thank you. It was a similar problem with which I was seeing, uh, but okay. when I... When I stopped and start the uh, the server with the nine zero nine three eight one. Perfectly fine. So that was with the Kafka server. So that's great. So good. So Scott, have you caught up reasonably with what we have done till now, Scott? Oh uh, yeah, I'm I'm hanging in there. That, that's great, yeah. So things are on your machine, so you might have to spend a little bit of time beyond the session to just see, depending upon your availability, to finish it here today. Yep, okay. Sure, sure. Uh, Susan had mentioned that she has got some meetings, so don't know about her. Uh, what about you, Vijay? Were you able to do this current example here with the same uh, configurations? Because we had a problem with that particular topic, but then yeah. I hope that is resolved, right? No, no, I created a new topic and uh, changed the producer and the consumers. No, it's, yeah, with the new topic, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, okay, that's Again, great. the topic name and the group name, so it's fine. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And what about you, Vinay? Were you able to finish up everything, Vinay? Yeah, it looks like he's not there. So that's okay, guys. So I think we should move on now. So this is going to be a little bit of Java stuff that we are going to do. So we are going to refactor our code so that we can use threads and all of those things. So I'm just going to explain this directly from the uh, Kafka project I have already done. So let me move on. So this is going to be exercise seven. One second, this is seven, right? The so six was consumer. Okay, this was actually exercise six because in our number it becomes seven because uh, the five example we have created a subclass of it and all that. So that's okay. So let me maximize uh, my consumer demo with thread and that's right. So this is that particular example, what we are going to see. So this is going to be our sixth application and group ID and the topic is going to be first uh, to underscore topic only. So uh, in this code, we will have to create a latch object so that uh, we are going to work with different threads, right? So that's why we are going to use this. So just wanted to check with the uh, Java users, that is Paris and others. Uh, are you using a countdown latch anywhere in your code right now, Paris? No, not until now. Okay, so this is a new way by which you'll be able to have a better control over multiple threads and that's something that we will have to see. So try to use this. It's, it's a very good thing that they have uh, introduced. So then let's create our consumer runnable like what we have done earlier. Runnable, I will pass my bootstrap servers, the group ID, the topic name and the uh, latch object. Start the thread and then uh, get your add your uh, shut uh, shutdown hook and this is the java 8 way of doing it so you see this so this is the way how we use it extensively in our code to use the java 8 functionalities so again paris to checking with you are you using a lot of these kind of objects uh, the way how lambda expressions would be done just for my understanding yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong paris yes we are using lambda that's great. So this is the way how we do Lambda and the Spark is everything is on Lambda. So a very, very extensive use of these symbols would be there. So it gets a shutdown hook. 
then we will call a shutdown it will wait uh, in the try block it will wait and in the catch block it will simply print it out and then again uh, in the try after we finish up with this we will say that the application got interrupted and then it is closed then in the inner class <clears throat> in the consumer runnable uh, we will just initialize the latch as usual in the properties object create a consumer and uh, create as list we are not passing something to it last time we had seen some examples of it uh, create the consumer records and then simply print out the key the value the partition and your offset like last time add your wake up exception and then finally call your wake up method print so a lot of uh, usage of uh, uh, threading is over here and uh, how we are passing it on to an inner class of uh, the, uh, passing it on uh, to a new subclass okay so that we can implement the runnable part of it so let me run this code and then test it out so this is what the whole code was about let's go down and i'm showing you how we can go ahead and uh, actually test it out so see over here so after testing it out you will see that at the end that it is properly closing the applications and all that so let me go ahead i had already created the uh, project so it is going to be example six and if you see over here i have got the snapshot jar let's go back to my eclipse and i would move my example six uh, to the jar file from example six so let me go to target okay there we go i have moved the jar file uh, six over here so let me go down to uh, this and copy the code from there from my word document there we go so this is consumer with thread control c and uh, my as usual my kafka i haven't touched it i haven't restarted it everything is the same so with the same producer that is uh, the zero producer that we are using and let me test it so I'm going to say Java CP, the size, demo with thread. <clears throat> and you see that it is going to read uh, the partitions. Again, the same example. So we had topic one, topic two, and topic first. And when I close this, that is where the crux is. You can see here how it is printing out that the application is closing and the application has exited. So the same example like what we did, but then we are refactoring the code to put it into a thread and add some decent way of closing things. Okay. So please try this example, and this is what the output is, what you should be getting friends. Okay, so try your example seven. We'll give you about another five, seven minutes so that you can actually go ahead and uh, uh, try this out. Friend. Okay, so just meeting myself, I'm over here. Any questions, feel free to be in touch. But then this is a simple example, so that's why we are not taking too much time on this. So go through this. If there's any questions, I'll be answering it. So please try it out, guys. Just meeting myself. Uh, Pascal, just wanted to check with you, since you mentioned that you are actually uh, deploying this in production. So are you using any of the confluent APIs like KSQL and KStreams and those things, Pascal? If you're around. And same thing goes for Paras also. Are you deploying uh, this in your uh, uh, environment right now, Paras? Or it is primarily you are going to do that right now? Um, no, we are not using it. Not until now. We are not using it in production until yet. Okay. Okay. That's great. So, because, yeah, Baskar is around. Maybe he's not there. So, that's why. So, he's the guy who said that he's actually using it in production. So, wanted to know how you are going to use it and all that. Because uh, uh, what was told to me is that just give them an intro of KSQL. So, that would be very appropriate for you, Paris, talking about KSQL, how SQL can be done uh, using this. So, that's that's my plan for tomorrow. So, just wanted to check how to use it, uh, how you're using it right now, dear. Okay. No, we're not using, I mean, my team is not using it yet, but yeah, that mm -hmm. will be a good thing to look at. Definitely, definitely. I'll be sharing that. But I just wanted to check how, what all things are you using? Because I know that Confluent has been used within the organization. So what all are you using is what I wanted to check. No worries. So try this example, guys, and finish it. Maybe another uh, couple of minutes. So once you finish it, you will see the proper output coming down on the console. And I look at the code and any questions, I'll be able to answer it. Thank you. Okay, guys, I think uh, we have to move on. So I'm sure you would have had time to go through this and see it. So just checking out with you, Scott, uh, until now, are you able to try with the example, Scott? 
and uh, how are things uh, in your system since you've got the basic stuff ready? Uh, yeah, I'm still working on it, but I got the code deployed. So. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. So guys, uh, we need to move on because we have got uh, a little bit of massive examples that will be uh, nine and 10. So eight is also going to be a small example, uh, but we will test it, we will deploy it and uh, tentatively by three o'clock your time, we will take up our break so that we can spend our time with the last two examples because that will take a little bit more time. So let's move on friends. So let's go down to the next example what we have. So in this example, we want to see, I don't want to read uh, the complete topic. I just want to read from a particular point. Uh, once I know the offset, I will have another code which will tell me what the offset is. And then I want to read some specific content. So that's the purpose of this example, wherein I'm going to assign and I'm going to see, okay? So that's what the class name is. We have got our bootstrap servers, the topic name. We have got our consumer configs, the standard consumer configs. We create a consumer. So this is where we will write our assign and the seek uh, logic. So the assign and the seek are typically used to replay data or uh, to be very precise, uh, fetch a specific message. So what you would do is you would uh, have another class which will uh, run the code, into, uh, run through the whole cluster, give me the uh, number from where my message will be there. And then this is the functionality that you can use. So we will create a topic partition from where we want to read. Okay. Sorry, was there a question, Dia? Uh, no, sorry, I just hit the... Okay, that's okay, that's okay, Dia, thank you. So, uh, so the, uh, the topic partition will tell me from where I want to read from, okay? Then it will put an offset on a particular point and just going to put an offset onto the fifth topic, okay? And then I will uh, assign it to my consumer, that is the Kafka consumer that I've created, and I will say arrays as list, and I will read from the topic partition. That is what is the assign. And then I will call a seek, in which I will uh, seek from the partition to read from and the offset to read from. So in between that, I will be able to go ahead and do that. So I'll just keep a track of number of messages to be read and then a Boolean variable, uh, which will be true or false and the number of messages read so far. Okay, and then I will poll for the new data. I can put into a while loop, which will keep on reading in a real world please don't use this while loop guys. You can create a inner class thread which will ideally do that thread. And then I can read the consumer records, what all records I'm reading, I'll increment it by one. And the same logic what we did earlier, I will get the key, the value, the partition and the offset. And then I check if the number of messages read is greater than the number of messages to read, I will make the uh, flag that is keep on reading as false, and then I will say break. Okay, so a pretty simple example, but then the content of this example is it's not going to read everything. This is going to be a specific code, which will have a UI and all that. And uh, people have implemented, and especially JP has implemented this kind of a way wherein if you want to read a particular topic, a user interface will be given to the person. He can specify from and to, and then there will be an OK button, and the information will come down on the text box or a text area, what you have created. It will show you for you okay so that's the purpose of uh, this particular example so let me go back to the code so i'm just going to give you a demo of this so that you can see how it is running and then you will go ahead and do the actual part so this is going to be the seventh example so let me go back over here and this is what is your consumer seek demo i've already created the jar file so you see over here so let me go back to my bin SAP and move that jar file that is my exercise seven. <clears throat> there we go, go to target and move the jar file onto my programs directory. That's already there. And then I will go ahead and run the code. So Java minus uh, class path, the name of the jar file and the name of my class that I want to read from. I will say control C. I'll just press it enter over here. Yeah, that's okay. 
so there is no new line character and i can directly go down to my uh, zookeeper is running my kafka server is running this is the temporary window that i keep and i can go down to a programs and simply run this okay and let me press enter so this code will go and then it will go back and read a set of partitions for me so you can see over here so from a particular set of values although it's separate offsets five six seven and eight it is going to read that particular set of values and then after after it is finished it will simply go back and then it's been done friend. so it will just uh, read the consumer seek demo for a set of values what i have mentioned you can simply do a and then this is just showing you that the uh, the uh, it has discovered the coordinator and all of those things you can just do a control c and the job will be done the crux here is i'm not reading the whole thing i'm just reading a part of the thing so that is what the example is how do we go down to uh, go down to a particular point and then seek from there so just test how this would be working guys so i'll give you about a five minutes where you can go back and test this so after that, we will take up our break print. And once we come back, we will go down to our example, wherein we are going to do some monolithic code, guys. So that would be our partitioner example. And then we will have our uh, serialization part of it, wherein we are going to use UTF-8 and UTF-16. That is your custom serializer. OK, so let's go ahead and try this uh, uh, eighth example print. And this is the way how you will execute it. So it will give you some time. Please go ahead and carry. And uh, before that, I just wanted to check with you, Gaurav. Oh, did you actually, I, I, I know that you're trying all the examples. So until now, have you tried the earlier example all good with that? Or is there a doubt in that, Gaurav? No, there. everything is good. Thanks for asking. That, yeah, everything is good with me. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. So others, I, I know most of you are actually trying those things. So you'll actually have to try this so that you can have it. If you're busy right now, that's perfectly understandable. You can go ahead and try this. But then either in the class over here or sometime off, whenever you get some time, please try these examples because the focus of the first two days of the session was to let you know what Kafka is and play around with the vanilla Kafka. From tomorrow onwards, we will go down to Confluent and we will see how does Confluent work, guys. So that's the objective. So please go ahead and try this and uh, uh, we will go until about some time and we will see that. Tell me, Bhaskar. Hey, um, so uh, how, how is the other clients using um, to read from a specific uh, offset? You said like some use cases where some other client is using. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so see, uh, what what people have is the earlier code that all, all that I have executed that is uh, reading the whole topics and all that. So, in yeah. case if if you want a particular uh, area to be done, you can actually, and if you know what the offsets are, you can actually go down and use this customer assign and seek something similar to this. People have created a UI, especially JP and CP have created a UI wherein you can give the offset number. The, it typically will allow you to read five messages, you know, and then when you click on OK, it will show the whole message on the text area for you in a non-editable format so that you can start uh, your coding from there. So that's the way how people are using it, Pascal. Mm -hmm. So the offset rate, may I say, as a good practice, is it like uh, advisable to somehow uh, record the offset in uh, a transaction yeah. log or something like that? Yeah, it is always right because if you're going to do some further analysis on the data and what we are doing in JP is uh, uh, very different from what you're doing. You are saying that you're going to keep on the record only for two days, but in JP... No, no I think see the two days is uh, the current setting, but uh, okay. I, 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 DevOps, we have to work with DevOps uh, what their suggestions are in the future. But uh, see... Uh, the main problem is like whether we got the message, not because of tip, uh, Kafka, like we started the application application errors and whatever, right? To recover it, uh, also to reconcile and audit, we okay. have to make sure that uh, producers sent uh, 100 messages and with the certain offset and the consumer also should have an easy way of finding that one. Right? So that's, that's kind of what we are coming at. No, no, you will have a small challenge in that basket because if the producer is going to write the multiple partitions, you cannot uh, ensure that number from what the client had sent. 
because uh, uh, yeah, you saw the program, uh, it was basically 10 messages that were sent. But then if you look at it, if it goes to the partitions, then they are, the numbering will be different and the order will be different also. Yeah, yeah actually, um, I'm fine with the multiple partitions, but I, at the end, like uh, when we read a message, uh, mm -hmm. it has a uh, it has an offset which we'll have to record that okay this offset has been processed successfully or this offset is errored this offset is ignored okay 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 that, that is possible yeah, yeah that is possible dear so depending upon which partition is going so who's going to do that and how so uh, i think something similar is what has actually been done by uh, city for their work so what they do is that they have got this uh, continuous uh, monitoring system what is there so mm -hmm. that kind of details will come down over here and based on the value of the details automatically the work orders are generated and then uh, the the uh, activity would happen on that also so something similar is what city is also doing so mm -hmm. they also use the same way different partitions have got but i know that my record is going because it's got a key so i know that it will definitely go down to this partition and then i will keep on looking at the offset number of the partition and then do it i think that's what you are looking out for Bhaskar. Right? yeah so just uh, yeah making sure that when a message was processed it was successfully processed whether it's uh, ignored for on purpose or is it like successfully processed if it's error okay. also so it's come to we, we come to that we we actually account for it like okay it's errored out for certain reasons uh, but if we count all the ones it's uh, it's matching up with what producer was thinking that they had said that that is possible here yeah. So okay. ir irrespective of the number, the way how the data goes into the partition, so that is very much possible. So if you're just looking at the count of it, so all that you'll have to do is that uh, at periodic level, you'll have to find out what is going to be the count over there. And then you can sum up the count and then you can do it. The only okay. challenge that you will have is what will happen if you're keeping the number of days as seven and uh, after seventh day the data starts uh, going away right the earlier uh, uh, monday's data starts going away so you mm -hmm. will have to cater for that only so that so every day you'll have a count and when you go down to the seventh day count uh, after 12 o'clock you'll have to delete the oh, before uh, seven days what was a count that should be numbered and you should come down to a proper number that is the only okay. headache that you'll have to do friend otherwise it yeah, needs to be simple okay okay <coughs> so uh, maybe in the so I, even though our team is uh, started using the confluent way it's uh, we are our users we are not the ones who are deploying or anything so uh, and we are looking for like a uh, ways to see uh, easy way to browse the messages in uh, kafka uh, the logs obviously and uh, okay. is, is there any other tool which you suggest or uh, yeah, so in case if you want to see the status of all those things, we have got some tools that is available. Uh, in fact, I don't remember it right now, but during the break, I'll just check it up and let you know. There are tools available, friend. So okay. we typically use some of these open source tools that is there. But if you're using Confluent, Confluent has got a lot of good UIs and all those things. So, okay, okay. so it's just that uh, yeah, we, uh, we want to understand so that we can ask the uh confluent team owners here to share us a read only option or something like that because at the mm -hmm. end we are uh, dev teams are uh, researching the issues and for that you need to know what 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 was the message that came in kafka or whatever right so that, i think that's the reason i'm asking that's perfectly right, friend, because there are fantastic browsers what uh, uh, this one gives you, Confluent gives you, and okay. uh, I'll show some of these things tomorrow, but okay. then even if you look at Confluent uh, UI on the screen, you will see that fantastic browsers are there, and based on that, now since you have understood quite a bit about how these things are going to work, you can go ahead and ask uh, for the DevOps how the things will be done, Bhaskar. Should okay. not be a challenge, and even after the training, my I'll share my email ID tomorrow, so okay. even if you're facing anything, feel free to just reach out to me and uh, we can get into a quick uh, five ten minutes discussion and help you out so no issues on that friend sure, sure, sure. Pretty open yeah, to that. yeah mainly uh, I, I would definitely be looking forward for the confluent option meaning capabilities of the confluent for uh for okay options. okay okay definitely because that's something that you are using and that is a commercial tool so they are pretty open to the new ideas and they're pretty good that's what i would say okay. so tomorrow once we look at it we can see how that that thing would work there no worries on it oh, thanks so, Sure, you're welcome. Okay, guys, I think uh, uh, now should be the time when you should finish up with your exercise eight, my dear. 
So if you have finished up with your exercise, that's good. So let's take up a quick uh, break. And once we come back, uh, we will talk about uh, what is this concept of bidirectionality concept what we have and uh, the two big examples that we have that is exercise nine and 10 guys. So that's something that we will see after the break. So it's about three thirty-three year time. We will take up a break and uh, 433. We will start off by around 348 uh, or, or let's say 350 uh, time, your time friends. Uh, sorry, uh, we will start off by 350, that means 320 year time. It's almost about three reaching 35. So we will start by 3.20 your time, guys. So let's take up a quick tea break. Be freshened up because we have a little bit uh, coding to be done and the session is going to get a little bit uh, complex. So let's be freshened up and come back, guys. So we will have a tea break till uh, 3.20 your time. Okay. So we are off for the break and once we come back, we will start from our next topic. So this is what we will be starting up, uh, starting up friends. So before I go, any questions till now, dear? Anything that uh, requires uh, my assistance, friends? No, I presume you're a... Okay, great, Paris, you have no worries. Others, I hope it's all good, right, dear? Okay. So that, that looks to be okay. Of course, you can reach me anytime, friends, even after this. No worries. So let's take a break and we will start off by uh, 350 year time, uh, 320 year time, friends. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, Scott. This is Venkat. Uh, you're there, Scott, because my system got restarted. Hey, yep. that's great. Mm -hmm. so, so you are the presenter now. So uh, are you able to see my screen, dear? Let me, let me check. Hang on. Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, but looks like you are recording. Can you right click on my name and make me as a recording because the recording is there with you because all the sessions will be recorded, right? So uh, I have just gone off. I just saw that uh, my system was rebooted at that particular time. I mean the internet and uh, you are the host. Okay. Do you, see Do you see some red light blinking besides your name? Uh, beside my name, yeah, it says stop recording. Uh, no, 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 no. You'll have to say uh, change, uh, give it to me, you know. You'll have to pass on the recording sessions to me, dear. Okay. Just see if you can do that. More ask to start video, allow record. No, Put it no, no. No, I, I, I think leave it, leave it at that. So, just uh, you'd be there till about uh, five o'clock our time, right, Scott? Or would you be stepping out before that, dear? No, I'm here the whole time. Hey, that's fantastic. So let it be there. So when I stop the recording, automatically it will go away. So no issues on that. Thank you so much, dear. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Great. Okay, folks. So I think uh, we should uh, continue to start. Okay, I think that's what if I'm not the presenter, I cannot. Yeah, Scott, you might want to mute yourself, dear. I try to mute you, but I can't do that because I'm not the host, but that's okay. We'll manage it and we don't have anybody over here too. So some people are not there. We just have got about six people. So I think Vijay has stepped out and Brandon is not there. But that's okay. So let's continue from where we left off, guys. So if you look at your time, yep, it's about more than 20 and uh, we are all set. So if you see, we have seen different examples and that's something that you will have to go back and then check it once whether you have understood everything, friend. So now let's move on to the next thing in our pipeline. So if you see the way how Kafka has come up, uh, they have got a very good bi-directionality compatibility. That means you can go ahead with, uh, with the new versions that will work uh, with the new code. If you are there with the old version, that will work with the old code also. So look at this particular link, which will tell you about the bi-directionality and how it becomes easy for developers. So that's the reason. Hello? Yeah, yeah, please. So one question, sorry. I no worries, friend. So can you open the document once? Uh, sure, just one second. There we go. Yeah, that's yeah, right. I was running the eighth one like uh, seek thing within which we can right. reach from particular location of offset. Right. So, yeah. Sorry, I lost you, my dear. Are you speaking? 
suddenly sorry it's again got mute okay so the okay. intention was to read from a specific record right based that's on that correct that's right so, but can you tell me what is the expected output here it should go ahead and read from the file l onwards that means in between the record so this is a record from where it has to continue reading okay and if you look at this for loop it will keep on incrementing the loop and then it will end right at the end uh, not till not till the uh, end from five so l five messages. five messages that's right the thing was i ran it mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm saying it properly or not can you just can i just quickly share my screen once uh, yeah yeah why not dear so let me stop sharing start sharing your screen dear Yep, it's coming up. Okay. okay. So, so this is this guy. Okay. Okay. I have this producer, which is again producer demo keys. Okay. That's okay. I have only one consumer group right now. I kill all the other okay. ones which are running parallel. Okay. Okay. And this is running in the thread mode, infinite thread mode. Whatever we uh, see. Okay. 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 Let me kill one second to show you what I'm running. About this guy. I have to check the class name. What is the class name? I think it is consumer with demo only. You are right. No, this one right. Demo assign seek. Oh, sorry, demo assign seek. That's right. With thread will uh, read everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let me start the consumer. Oh, consumer. See? It's reading only some part of the message, right? Okay. Actually, I was running with all the whole program itself, and I'm trying now, and I recognize that I changed the class now. Okay. 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 No worries. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Friend, you can stop sharing here. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. So let's uh, move on. Yeah, that's great. So that is one of the beauty. So I opened up the document, and you can see how you can upgrade Kafka. It has got a way how you can uh, see the old version and the new version running. The complete implementation logic is given to you. Okay, so that is what is the beauty of this. So just wanted to share this with you so that you will understand that, guys. And now uh, what we will do is we will talk about a partitioner uh, code, the way how the partitioner will be helpful. Uh, Vijay, you might have to mute your phone because I can't do that. I'm not the host friend. So if you can just mute. Thank you so much, dear. Okay, so let's talk about the custom partitioner example. So, okay, so the use case is we are having a retail site where the consumers can order products from different parts of the world. And based on the usage, we know that most of the consumers come from either US, India, okay? So US or India. And we want to partition our application in such a way that uh, orders from US or India will go down to their respective consumers, whereas orders from anywhere else will go down to a third consumer. So we are going to introduce a new concept over here called as partitioner class. So the concept of partitioner is a way how you partition your code. And this thing is coming from the Hadoop MapReduce perspective wherein we had the partitioner interface. So that's how the logic is. Okay, so the country partitioner will implement the producer.partitioner interface. And when we implement the partitioner interface, you will have a constructor that will be a map in which we initialize the partitioner class with a map of configuration properties. This method initializes function that is specific to the business logic of your application. Like if you want to connect to a database, you'll put it in the constructor, like something similar to that. So in this, we want a very generic partitioner that takes the country name as a property. And then based on the country name, I want to map the flow of the messages to the respective partition. And we are only interested in India and USA right now. And all the other countries will uh, be uh, pushed on to the third partition friend. Okay. So just once again, I just want to have a little bit of the water throat is drying off. Just once again, dear. Back again, friends. So uh, <clears throat> we will use the config properties dot put. Like an example, I say partition zero is USA, partition one is India, and partition two, if I have, that will be the general part of it to map the flow of the messages to the partitions. 
in the future you can use this format to uh, get the specific countries if you want anything else other than india and usa so trying to create a generic kind of an application then you have got the partition method which is going to be called for every message so in this case we will use it to read the message and parse the name of the country from the message if the name of the country is in our uh, country to partition map it will return the partition id stored in the map if not it will hash the value of the country and use it to tell and decide which partition it should go to so i'm only interested in india and usa and all others will go down to the rest of the uh, uh, to the same partition i mean the third partition will contain all the other countries here okay just once again okay back again and then we will have a close method wherein we will shut down our partitioner so using this method uh, will ensure that any resources acquired during initialization are cleaned up when you shut down the system note that when a uh, kafka calls configure the kafka producer will pass all the properties that we have configured for the producer in uh, to the partitioner class it is essential that we read only those properties that start with the partitions parse it to get the partition id and store the id in the country to partitions map so that is what is the logic that we have in the uh, country to partition map so you can see over here how we have the logic for our uh, the partitioner <coughs> you write the complete business logic over here dear and then you will have your partition method sorry the business logic will come here you will have your partition method the way how i split it uh, based on uh, add a colon to the code so partition 0 and then what is the name and all that and see how the rest of it will be i will convert into a hash code and i will do a mod of the partition so that we go down to the third one okay so this is the logic <clears throat> then we will have our producer as usual okay nothing new in the producer code exactly the same way as what we have done earlier the only new thing what we have over here is in the properties class itself i will say that partition 0 means <coughs> just one second some weird reason the throat was suddenly getting dried at the end so back again <coughs> so uh, partition 0 is usa partition 1 is india and all others will be put in the same way so the same code what we had the beauty is again we have got a callback method and in the on completion like what we saw yesterday we will say that uh, the message was sent to which topic <clears throat> to which partition and uh, what was the offset id that it was sent okay so that was the logic that we have in the partitioner class then <clears throat> we will go down to our consumer class same way consumer will have a topic name and a group id okay that's what in arc 0 arc 1 what we are having <clears throat> again the inner class is being used over here everything will remain the same but like last time <clears throat> in the arrays dot as list i pass on a consumer rebalance listener okay so you know that by default this will be called you saw that in the earlier code right so there will be a on partitions revoke method that will be called and a on partitions assign method that will be called so what we will do in that is when a partition is revoked we will write a sysout stating that the partitions is revoked <coughs> specifying the details and when the partitions is assigned we will also specify the details of it what partition is assigned to whom friend okay so we have got the partitioner we have got the consumer and we have got the producer and the consumer and finally at the end of it we will simply say we poll it and we will write the same wake up exception like what we did last time and we will close it the first step that you will have to do is you are going to create a new topic called as part demo okay and that is going to have the number of partitions as 3 replication factor is only 1 and then we will write our <coughs> you will deploy our jar file with a simple producer with the part demo 
okay <clears throat> what you can do is you don't have to create all the four instances then and there create the first consumer <clears throat> you will see all three coming to him create the second consumer you will see that again it will be reassigned two will go to one one will go to the other one you create the third consumer each one will have one one and you create a fourth consumer any one of them will be empty right? <clears throat> that's what you can see so once all the, when the producer and once all the four consumers are there then you can in the producer you can keep on saying usa that's the name of the country colon <clears throat> whatever is the order number or whatever you want to write i prefer the order number this will go down specifically because I have got this particular uh, key uh, in, in between. <clears throat> it will go down to one partition. India will go down to another partition. And USA will go down to the same partition that we had used earlier. And France will go down to another partition. So our business logic was that all India customers will come down to one partition. USA will come down to one partition. And all the other countries will go down to the third partition. So that is what is the example we are going to see here. Tell me, friend. Any questions, so, somebody? Yeah, you, you you put the partition in the producer itself, right? If this uh, zero, it's USA. For one, it's India, kind of thing. That's right. We are controlling the data that goes to what partition we want to, isn't it? That's correct. So what what I want is the producer itself will be able to say how we want to go ahead. So the beauty is I'm not using, I know right at the beginning that it will go down uh, to them. So this is the message, the way how you get the message See over here. So in config.properties, I'm specifying the way how I will, just mentioning that partition zero will be USA, partition one will be India. I'm not putting it. The actual part of it, how it will be put, will be decided by your uh, method called as partition, <clears throat> okay? In which you are writing the business logic. See how I'm splitting based on the colon. I will get the country name and I check if the partition map has got a country name and that's how the way how I uh, really distribute the data, my dear. Make sense? Okay. And that you say, is it the actual message or is it it's a key there? Uh, no, no, this is the uh, part of the message. So that means the part way the how message. you write. That's correct. Okay. It's not the key. Had it been the key, it would have been easy for me to directly put it as per the key, right? Because you already know from what we've seen earlier, once you have got a key and a message, uh, all the similar keys will go down to the same partition, right? But here we are uh, specifically customizing it based on the message only, friend. I'm not using a key here. It is basically uh, the, the message itself is the whole part. And from the message, I will just see how, what is the initial part of it. And then I will uh, tweak the whole code here. That's the whole logic of how do we do this. Okay. okay. Cool. So, <laughs> so when I have this, uh, sorry, uh, when I have this, then I cannot have a key. Is that what it is when I do this? Uh, th th that's right. Uh, so, so if you're having this, there's no reason why you should want a key because uh, I'm controlling everything, but still you can have a key. Okay. But then the uh, partitioning won't be done as for this. So ideally speaking, they're mutually exclusive uh, friend. That's no, idea. Let, let's say, let's say, um, because one partition may not be enough for let's say one country. I'm just I'm, I'm taking your example itself, right? So okay. I I probably need like a two partitions for one country. Yeah, then you'll have to break up the logic further to see how to add that. That means the business logic has to be given how that uh, it will be distributed. So you'll have no, to So I that. will uh, actually I will put like a USA into partition one and two. Okay. No, but then, okay, okay, you write the code how to do that. That is perfectly okay. That's what I was saying. You have to write the code how the data will be distributed, yes. right? Then I will need a key. No, I would still need a key is what I'm saying. I mean, a key, let's say order number is, is my key. Right? Order okay. number, because I don't want same order to be in multiple partitions. Then uh, my message will be jumbled. Meaning yeah. I might get one processor older message, later, later message, older, whatever. Right? No, 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 see, see here, if you're using keys for distributing, key will already ensure that it will go to a specific partition only, right? You're yeah, yeah, so, to... yeah, that is correct. So that, that's what I'm saying. So uh, key will make sure that is handled, but uh, mm -hmm. in that case, then I don't, meaning I cannot use this something like a, a that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, slightly that's correct. upper level group, yeah. 
That's right. So you cannot do that. So what you can do is that you can have something which will key will say that it will go down to a partition. Let's say that uh, you have you are, you are putting pushing it to your partition, and then you have got separate uh, inner partitions, and that is where you can use this. Whether you want to go for uh, some set of countries in USA, uh, depending upon the time zone. Okay, whether you want to go to which of the time zones, there, there are three time zones and how the data should be separate. So if you have got two levels of classification, the upper classification is based on the key and the lower classification is something that you can control. So that's the purpose of this, my dear. Make sense? No, no. So the key, I thought, is the lower level configuration, isn't it? Is it no, no. Key will be the upper level configuration. All of them will go down to uh, US only. In US, you have got three time zones. So which country, okay. uh, which, which cities have got those three time zones, that's something that I want to go down to the respective one. So that's the way how I look at it. And that's the way how we can do that. If you wanted something different, uh, uh, because uh, primarily what will happen with the key is that one key will go to only one partition, right? So yes. I can't have it uh, in a separate way, one key going to three partitions, right? I cannot do it, right? Yes, yes. That's the reason I followed that analogy, my dear. So it, it meets my requirement also. And I might want to further classify it. That's where I will use this. So we have used in uh, uh, CP also in one of the use cases where the top level will go down to one entity. Inside that, there are further lines of specialization. And for that, we have to write this code, how to split it up. We have to write a custom partitioner code for doing that, my dear. Okay. That was so the idea. So technically, USA will go to, uh, let's say, three partitions. That's Okay. USA will go down to one partition, okay, and from inside that, okay, if you want to spread it across, so so you have got two levels, so you will create something called as say a, a topic, okay, inside that there will be three, three topics, and inside the three topics you might have different partitions, so what I'm trying to classify is one will go down to one topic only, you can't have one key going to two partitions, right, based on your logic, right? Yes, so that's the yeah that's correct. That's the reason I was saying that let's say USA is not a key, but okay. uh, USA plus time zone. A technical order number is the key, right? Okay, okay. Um, so order number can go to only one part, one of the partitions. Let's say USA has three partitions. Okay. I will. Uh, this code will say that go to one of these three zero one two okay. or the. Uh, 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 partition. That's correct. That's correct. So if the key is saying that uh, uh, the way how you're classifying it, so based on the message that comes in, if you're classifying it into different ways, you can handle it. So it all depends upon how we are configuring it. What you're saying is also okay. perfectly correct. So based on USA plus the three different groups, I can set it, set it up directly. So if okay. it is going directly, then I might not need the partitioner at all. The partitioner is just a way how, if you want to handle it, we can do that. But then the uh, defect, the default method always applies, my dear. Okay. So is it like a like widely used, or is it like just a uh, there is no, an no, option? No, no, no. It is widely used. So depending upon your classifications, people might have three or four levels of classifications, right? So hmm. you will have to decide how do we control these things and how the subparts are going and all that. So if, if you look at it, a particular order will go down to one within that order based on the uh, city of the order, it will go down to the other. And based on that, there will be the third classification and the fourth classification. That's how the actual project is uh, there in JP for some of those things. So we can actually have multiple levels of classifications and see how it works, my dear. Mm. So what is it like, what is it like a, a real, real use actually on this? Let's say I have 10 partitions or uh, some X number of partitions. Okay. As a con consumer will still be getting it from all, meaning is it like by this I will improve my performance or? Uh, no, no, the advantage of this thing is that I would know what will go down to which one. So let's, let's say that if it goes down to a specific partition, then I would want a consumer to only read from that. Why do you want one consumer to read from everything? Because he will be getting the whole of USA. I want to know only California. So once I put it into a specific partition, the consumer can read from only one partition, which is handling the California area, right? So as simple as that. So it helps me to narrow down the congestion of the work and have people focus only on that. If I find that California has got a lot of orders, I can create a consumer group only for California also, right? So you can scale your application. That's the whole idea. No, but you don't scale, so, uh, since you touched on it, do you scale this like by adding more consumer groups? 
Uh, no, no. The reason I said scale is because if more data is going to combine into a topic, I should have an efficient way how consumers will uh, subscribe to that, right? And yeah, I will add more consumers. Yes. So I will probably have more partitions uh, for California. Let's say uh, if we spread split uh, USA as uh, states as partitions, obviously California will uh, get more of partitions. And That's correct. Mm -hmm. Within that, uh, then obviously I will add more consumers. Technically. Like I have four partitions, I will have four consumers at the no, least. No, it is, it's not adding more consumers. See, uh, the, the difference between a consumer and a consumer group is consumer reads from one particular topic. And if it has got more partitions, then I would ideally need a consumer group so that each one of them will read individual partitions, right? Yeah, yeah. So now I, I, yeah, I, when I say consumers, I adding a consumer, I by default assume that there is a consumer group within which okay. consumers are there. So I was trying okay, to okay, differentiate okay. between like multiple consumer groups. Yes. Multiple, okay. like adding multiple consumer group is not solving the um, scaling problem, right? It is mainly solving uh, different applications accessing the same data problem. That's correct. That's correct. So, so that's right. So, in case if you want to, so, so these are based by this, you'll be able to tweak the flow of the data and see how things would happen. Because what will happen in Kafka is that we have got a topic and we have got a partition. We don't have multiple levels of uh, layering how we can help us out, right? So, within this, we have to play around with it and see how the whole thing will work, my dear. That's okay. idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. No worries. So, guys, uh, what we should do right now is go down to these three classes, uh, put them into uh, the code and uh, create a completely new topic because we don't have it and then test it out. And at the bottom, I have shown you how you can create multiple consumer groups so that you will see how the uh, data is properly distributed also. So please go ahead and try this. And if you're comfortable with that, that's good. It's about uh, for, uh, 3.45 my time. We'll give you about 15 minutes for you to test the whole thing. Once it's done, I will deploy this and then we will continue on with it. Okay, so that's the whole thing. So please go ahead and try it out. Any questions, please ask me. I'm available over here. Thank you so much. You basically doesn't need four instances of consumer, right? You need only three because the partitions are only three here. That's correct. Uh, what I wanted to show was uh, last time, in case if any of the consumers go down, so that another consumer can take it, there'll be repartition happening and automatically the fourth guy can get it. Otherwise, what will happen is that two partitions will go down to one consumer, right? So that's the reason in the real world, you will try to keep it more than the number of partitions always, my dear. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Guys, you can reach out to me to see if there are any issues. So just checking up with the people. So uh, Paris and the Gaurav, were you able to work on it, dear? Yeah, I was able to. Uh, it was working fine. So I was just working like, uh, I mean, thinking like in what ways uh, this can go wrong. So uh, whenever like producer initializes, it just goes and talk to Kafka and get hold of the, all the partition information, right? So even if I restart producer or Kafka brokers, this should not matter. This should not matter. That's correct. That's the way how it works here. But if you look at what could go wrong is uh, even if the consumers are not there, since the consumer rebalance listener will automatically be called, uh, you will have the uh, uh, listeners all, always working. You know, if any of the consumers goes down, it, the rebalance listener will be called and automatically multiple uh, uh, partitions will be assigned to that particular user. The only flip side of that would be uh, 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 if you're expecting that some person is supposed to get a message and if any of the uh, listeners goes down, then you would see that the messages go down to the different people also. So that is the flip side what we have in this kind of uh, thing. So that's the reason why we can go for some customizations uh, and all that. Like for example, in a general listener uh, versus the way how we have done it here. In this way, even if the listeners go uh, uh, increases or decreases, it will still be the three the three partitions only, India, USA and others. Whereas if we have what we have done earlier, three separate listeners, if one of the listeners goes down, uh, the rebalancing happens, right, Gaurav? So that, is, that would not be happening in this case, uh, Gaurav. So that's the advantage of doing it like this. Make okay, sense? so you mean to say like... 
for instance, like we have three consumers, and if uh, one of the consumers is supposed to be only reading USA data, we might have to configure that consumer to read through a specific partition, right? That's correct. So as of now, that's the way how it is happening. So we are not looking at the partition right now. So the partitions can be anything. Even then, you can go ahead and uh, uh, ensure that they can read the data. You can see on the top, we are having it as partition three. Okay, we uh, the way how the data is. So uh, try to create only one partition and then try to put the data. You will see that all three of them will be getting the uh, same message. But uh, you know, that's the reason I said create four instances and then check how the partitions happen. Don't start. If you start putting in the data from the very first one, you, you might see some wrong data coming across also. So that's something that we will have to take care and ensure in this thing. That's the only flip side of doing it like this. If everything goes on fine, then I don't think so. there's an issue with this. Garo. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, make yeah. sense. Thanks. Sure, sure. So guys, it's about uh, four o'clock your time. So let me go ahead and run this code. It will take me also about 10 minutes to finish up the whole thing. So let me do that because I haven't created any project, etc. So let me go back to the screen and I'm going to create our exercise A, which is going to be the current one. So let me go back to my Maven project, <clears throat> create a simple project. This is going to be I'm sorry, there's a small typo. You uh, are T. Okay. It should be uh, Garo. Uh, uh, what's the complete name of the organization? It's Albertson, right? Albertson. Right. Yeah, right? you're missing, you're missing a T in there. Yeah. Albertson. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you, buddy. Albertson's Kafka. And let's create exercise eight. And I will say finish. Guys, that was uh, purely uh, coding way, guys, and nothing deliberate. So don't take me wrong. I just get by mistake, right? Okay. So now let me create a package. New package. SMS Albertsons, that's correct. I will say finish. And I need to put in the three codes over here. The first code is going to be this one, okay? This meeting over here, my code. Back again. The first one will be my uh, partitioner code. So that would be country partitioner. So I'll just copy that and control C. Let me create the code, right click new class, country partitioner, and I will say finish. That's good. I'll just remove the class and I'll copy paste the code and put it over there. That's perfect. Let me copy this whole code. And yeah, that's right. Fill here. Control C, Control B, Control S. That's good. The second one I would want is called as simple producer. Class simple producer finish. And I will remove the simple producer code and copy the whole thing. So that's what I'm doing right now. That's the code. I'll go, and see. I'll go back and paste it. Okay. Now let me sorry. Create one more class. I think this is called a simple consumer. It will be clear on that. Yeah, that's right. Control C. Control B. And I will say finish. Okay, uh, let me go down to the country partition and see 
what is the error? Okay, I will import the list of things. Java.util. Let's see what is the Java level packaging. Let's go to the Java compiler. Hey, that's what. I don't know why. It should be 1.8. I'll say apply. And I'll say OK. Okay. Hey, that's because I didn't change the form.xml. So we on my part. So let me go down to the form.xml. Copy everything from dependencies to build. Let's go back and fix it. That's okay. Control V, Control S. So half of the error should vanish. Let me say save. That's what I thought. Yep. So no error coming in the partitioner. In, uh, I have to add a breakup exception from my comments.errors <clears throat> and all good, no errors. Okay, I've, I've got some error because I've got take my package. So right click on exercise age, run as, oh, sorry, Maven, and then say update project. I'll say okay, everything good. Let me create, I'll say run as. Made and clean. Okay, I should get change the uh, JDK properties, Java build path. I don't need the JRE. I need the uh, default JDK. Apply. Okay. Let me run as and say made and install. Take this up. So it will load everything. Couple of seconds. Okay, almost done. That's right. Uh, I see my exercise eight. So let me put the velocity and go to exercise eight. And I will copy the eight example here. That's perfect. Okay, so now let me go back to my table working. There are some chat messages. Let me scroll down. Um, are this one is, once again, particular for supply, but it's in the name of. That's correct because we are talking. Okay, once again, when did you get this? Okay, so. You can continue, uh, you will see these as well. So you can continue once you start the producer, you will see these as well. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, just let me know. That's correct, Vijay. We will be talking about a simple serialization right now. The Avro serialization, we'll be doing it along with the uh, Confluent uh, system thread. So that will be in the Confluent, Vijay. You're correct on that. But today we are going to do a simple UTF-8 serialization here. Thank you, friend. Yeah. So that's perfect. Let's check this. Okay, uh, just point it to me, Agarov, when that error comes. So I don't, see, oh, what I do is that with a lot of this technology changes, I don't try to remember the things, how is it? Look at the code and then try to go ahead and see. So that's the reason consciously uh, that last the three years, a lot of new things have come up. So when I see something, I will just check how is it and continue with that. So. I don't recollect when they had, if I had seen that error or not. That's the reason, Gaurav. No worries. So let's create our sure. things. Sure. So I've got my Kafka server running. I've got my broker running. The third is just a temporary session. Let me create the fourth one here. One second. Yeah, let me do it here. And I have to change this because we will have a producer over here. So that's better. This at the top. I will have one consumer over here. And I should have multiple three more consumer windows. In fact, four more. So I will just a duplicate session. Just a duplicate session. And I will just say one more duplicate session because one I can close, whichever is empty, I'll close it. 
I don't know whichever is empty right now. Dear. So, not true. Password is going to be header 23. Not true. Password is going to be header 23. Not true. Password is going to be header 23. Okay. 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 Okay, on the first one, I need to start with my uh, this one. Okay, first let me create the topic part demo. So control C and go here and yeah, it's in separate lines. I'll keep it like this. So that's great. Control C. Go down to my third window, not this, this one, and create the topic. Topic part and move will be created. Fantastic. That's done. Then I have to create, uh, okay, I have to get the name of the Java code. That's okay. So control C. Let me go back to my first window. Let me do ls minus L. It is here. Okay. If you take it back, I will right click and I will delete this. Hold on. I think that here, wherever my mouse is, that's the place where it is based. Right click. That's good. I've got a space also. Part demo. That's right. I'll press enter. So you can see over here that it has gone. Uh, that's okay. What is it saying? Ah, this is okay. So, uh, friend, the reason why this is coming is uh, this is what is the error that you're saying, right? The reason why you see this is because of the current version. So, what I used to do earlier was in the pom.xml, let me show that to you. Because, trust me, Gaurav, when I say this, I haven't seen this exception before. Okay, so that's the reason it didn't even strike me what this was. And in fact, I didn't even know what you were saying, friend, unless I saw this. So this things what you're seeing right now, 27 and all that, trust me, I've never seen 27 because I've seen till here. In all the examples, what we have done, I've seen it only till here. And uh, this is because we were doing with 2.0 before. Okay. So when I started this new project, I saw that uh, we have to work with the current version that we're running, 2.1.1. So that's a new thing what you're seeing. So this, I was not even knowing that it, it throws an error, uh, Gaurav. So that's the reason here. Make sense? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So what it does is configuration was supplied to the single name from it. Actually, so where is it looking from? So now we have got this error. Okay, let me do this. Frankly, I don't know what it's trying to say. Let's go back. Okay, somebody else also have got that. So let's go back and see. Okay. okay. Let's see what they're saying. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is funny but let's not assume that it doesn't matter but let's see what it says that's a pretty good one but what are what is ours let's go back to our code for us it is all it's an info okay so even one he's saying it's uh, ignored that's wrong Okay, so this can be suppressed. Okay, how can it be suppressed? Okay, the future releases it will be suppressed, is what he's saying. So I uh, commented those two out and I again just ran the program, uh, it's running fine. So I think uh, maybe other configs have superseded this, or maybe this is no longer required in recent library versions. Uh, one second here, what did you comment? Which line? Uh, the one where you're defining yeah, the 37, 38. So if you comment these out, uh, I can still see the logic is working fine of partitions. 
So I have to look into the port because I'll show you. Not that I have to show you, but then see, friend, this is the way how. So, Kafka, sorry, okay, yeah, that's better, 2019. And this is what is the ports that I do. So, when you said Java code, see, I have got this Java codes, I've taken from this codes and pasted it here. This was the second example that we were running. And you can see the year when this was created. Okay, so I've got this course long back. Some of this course I have, have created recently, but then these ports are very old ports, including the agro ports of this, because this is what we have already covering it from the last year or to JP Morgan and to City and uh, those clients. So this is from there. So I've been using this for a long time. You're right, I haven't checked the version. So as per the new version, looks like you commented these two lines, right, Gaurav? Yes, that's right. And actually, I take this back because I can see my partitioning is not working fine now. Okay. okay. Uh, because there is no other way in order to tell it, right? Other than these two lines. Because uh, that, that's something that I wanted to check because if you comment these lines, uh, there would be no where how the producer will not know where the data has to go. So this was important, but then what is it trying to say here? Uh, let me look at the error once again, Leah. So, not get yeah, this one. It says producer config. Uh, that's okay. It's, it's saying that it is not a known configuration. Okay, okay, okay. So, what it is trying to say is you write something with producer config dot something, right? So, all that it is trying to say is that I put a property value. So, it's saying that partition zero is not a known producer config. That's okay. That's what it's trying to say. Okay, it's not saying it's a, something wrong, but it's trying to say that, hey, I don't know that it is a producer config. Okay, see here? <laughs> yeah, but sure. it, it is, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so that's what it is. So I will ignore that. So that is not going to cause me any issues. And what you said is again, right, uh, that's not going to get the right name, uh, Vijay, because uh, this is the way how I configure it. If you comment it, there has to be a different way how to configure it, and then it becomes a little bit of a challenge, Vijay. So this is the right way how yeah, you're yeah. doing it, right? I don't know, what I'm trying to say is, yes, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, if you comment it out, there is no other place in the code which we mentioned yes. which partition yes. should yes. take that. That's what I'm saying. Yes. What's the yes. reason why that, that, not working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's right. So if you comment it out, you won't be able to know where it is coding. You're perfectly right in that. So that's the reason you should not comment it out. So that's that's perfect. So we know what the error is also. So no worries on it. Now let's continue. So once again, what is this? What is this? Okay, what we were trying to see earlier. Um, anyway, so yeah, yeah, we can we can ignore that because not a major thing. So we can close this. <coughs> we are working with our exercise nine. So perhaps just see what we have. Control D has to be removed. And with exercise nine, this is uh, working with a custom partition. Okay, I don't have to put this in hold. This is also okay. Minimize this. I was giving some errors here. No, that's okay. So what was I doing? Yeah, I created the uh, yeah part demo is created. Once again, I think it is created. So let's go back over here. That's right, part demo is created. And uh, yeah, so we have to run this code and uh, this is at this window. That's right. We already started with that. That's also okay. Okay. Now uh, let's go back and run our consumer. So I'm deliberately going to start with only one right now. Okay. And show to you that it will come down to that consumer only. That's the reason. So I will say control C. I will run this. Oops, 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 oops. I should change it. Clear. Yeah. And uh, Looking to, oh, hold on. I think I will probably paste it from here. Let's go back. So, so. It should be simple consumer. I'll paste it over here. Control B. And it is simple consumer. Okay, that's perfect. 
We can copy this, control C, and put it in here. Okay, it is expecting a group ID also because that's what is in the argument that I'm doing. Just one second. Go back to the pool. So that's right. So what I think about group ID? Oh, I didn't copy it anymore. Sorry. Group one. That's better. So it was there in the cheat sheet. We're copy pasting it somehow. It didn't come in me. So control C. Let's go back to my code. Let me do it clear. And I enter. Really? And this is also new. Uh, so let me just uh, tell that. So whenever we run this, see all these values, what we are seeing in the consumer config values. Okay. These things was never shown. Trust me when I say from the earlier 2.0, this was never shown. So this is something new that it is actually showing. So in version two, this was never shown earlier yet. So that's something new for us. So yeah, so what is it doing? Uh, yeah, so all the you know, setting offset for partition demo zero. I thought we had, yeah, yeah, there it is. So it is showing for partition demo zero, for partition demo uh, two or uh, one, and uh, this, okay? So earlier, the way how it is used to show was only this. Okay, it was not showing us this in fall. So see, we are saying that it is resetting the offset and all that. This window also I have never seen. I've seen it till here. Uh, what I just highlighted, yeah. So if you show me that all the three things have been set on this particular machine. So now let me just test with one client. I will just say India colon zero zero one. Okay, it is coming. I will say USA colon uh, 002, that's also coming in France, colon 003, that is also coming. Okay, so all things goes to the same partition, and you can see over here it is be getting distributed into the separate partitions, and that's why the offset is still zero only. Okay, so now let me create my second window. So, like this, this one. Okay, so go back over here, control C, and then paste it over here. So now what will happen is that there is a reassignment. This guy got only demo two, and this guy got demo one and two. See how the change is? Now it is only showing this, whereas for the first time also it was showing this only, but then we also saw this thread zero, thread zero, info uh, attributes also, because I haven't hadn't seen this info attributes earlier. Okay, because I haven't worked with this version. Okay, so that's the reason it was coming like this only. So which version it was there. So now let me again try uh, India colon 4. Okay, India comes over here. That is in, uh, I don't know which partition one or partition two. Then I will say USA colon 005. That also comes over here. France should definitely go down to that one now. France colon 006, and that's correct. So you see how the partition was set to those things. Now, let me create a new window. So let me go back to this once again. Like this. Okay, let me close this. So we can see it over here. I'll just increase the top it a little bit more. So let me copy the next code, Control C, and I will paste it over here. Okay. And it is joining the group. So zero is to this guy, two is to this guy, one is to this guy. Okay. So now I will say USA colon uh, 007. Okay. USA goes here. Uh, India colon 008. Okay. I'll go down over here, okay? But then different consumers are getting it, but then the partition numbers, it's, it's zero, one and all that. So it is all going to the same partition number. See, you can see two coming. And then I will say uh, Germany, oh, sorry, wrong window. I will say Germany colon zero, zero, nine. I'll press enter, Germany goes there, okay? So far, so good. 
I'm deliberately going to create one more guy. So I don't know where that guy will go. Okay, so let's go here, make it a little bit more big. Go back over here, control C, right click and press enter. And you will see a rebalance. So two went to this guy, zero went to this guy, one went over here, this guy's empty. So I'm just going to minimize that guy and I'm going to put this over here. Okay. So now again, one last thing. I will say India colon zero one zero. India goes to this guy. Earlier, uh, India had gone somewhere else. I don't recollect where. Okay. So then I will say USA colon zero one one. USA goes over here. And then I will say uh, Kuwait colon zero one two that will go down over here okay so this is the example which will show how the partitions are rebalanced and how the uh, data goes to the different uh, partitions okay i am tweaking how the partition should be distributed and how the value would be okay so this is a quick example to show you how the rebalancing of the partitioning happens with these instances okay so that was our second last exercise for today. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll simply close these windows because we have tested those things. And I really would not need these windows again. So I will simply close these windows because I'm, I'm pretty okay with one consumer and uh, uh, one uh, producer. Okay. This one is the empty one. I'll close this also. Okay. And I will do it clear and i will just run this one will be acting like a producer and one will be acting like a consumer i will say clear that's also okay and uh, that's it so any questions on this coming a particular example friend of what we tested we are very clear as to how the custom partitioning happens friends okay no question so one question is, um, it seemed like it was a little confusing and the consumers were receiving from different partitions. And I, I would think correct. you would want it so that one consumer would be attached to one partition the whole time, right? No, no, if you want to do that, then what we will have to do is that we should ensure that all the instances are ready before the producer can start putting it. So right. That is that. So if you do that, that will solve that problem yeah. as well. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but then again, you might have that problem because if any one of the consumers goes down, okay, the other there will be again a reassignment happening, and the uh, if we go down to the new, a new uh, partition which was not being used, the fourth guy that was not being used, you know. So again, there will be repartitioning, and the data will change. So this is a problem that is a really a scenario what uh, Kafka will have to do that. So this is a lot of people have been saying that, but then as of now, they didn't have a, a graceful way of doing it. But then that's a problem what we have as of now, Scott. Okay. Sure. So that's something that you will have to take care and see. Just one second. Hey, that's okay, Vijay. No worries. So the last example, try to do it whenever you can. One question. This is Vinay. Yeah, right. sure. So uh, actually, so we are saving that uh, message queue information for the seven days, right? So just I'm asking, is there any um, encryption, decryption uh, logic internally maintained for the secure of those messages? Kind of? No, 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 no. As of now, it is unencrypted. But then mm. in case if you want to use a Kerberos kind of a setup, because mm. if you look at your big data environment, Kerberos is a standard setup that has been done. So uh, within JP, they have uh, uh, created a Kerberos cluster and they have secured the data that goes into it. But then the de facto thing is, it will show, uh, read it as it is, friend. There is okay. no encryption there by default, friend. Okay. You will have to create it, friend. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah, well. Okay, guys. So now let's go down to the last one. And this is something which would be a little bit confusing, but that's okay. So we are going to have five classes uh, over here. So what we're going to try in the last example is we are going to see how do we do serialization. Okay, so if you're coming in from a database background, you can think of a topic like a table and the messages that is sent to a topic is like a record. 
So those records are not just strings or numbers like what we have been using. We can have multiple columns in a record. So when working with Kafka, we should be able to send a record of multiple columns. Similarly, if you're coming in from an object-oriented background, you will see that a Kafka message as an object, and typically you'll have multiple fields and uh, uh, methods inside there. Okay, so sending simple strings to Kafka may fulfill some of the requirement, but that's not in a, a real use case. So what we're going to have is, uh, you might want to send some custom objects like a supplier object or an invoice object. Uh, and if you want to send some objects uh, or a row like structure, you need to implement your custom serializer or your deserializer, or you might want to use your Avro serialization. So that is something that we will be looking at tomorrow when we talk about our confluent thing. Here we are writing our own uh, UTF-8 and UTF-16 kind of packages. I'm using UTF-8 right now, okay? So to understand the concept of serializer, let's create an example. First, we have got a supplier class, which will serialize a supplier object and send the supplier object as a message to Kafka. We will create a producer who will produce, uh, send the supplier object to Kaf, uh, uh, as a Kafka record. Earlier we were sending simple strings, but here we are going to send the whole object instead of a string. And that's why we will uh, create a serializer to convert the supplier object into a byte array. Okay, and uh, this is one way. So remember Vinay was asking, do we have some kind of serialization? So if, you, if you send it using UTF, we are automatically achieving the serialization in one way. Okay, so then we create a, a deserializer who will convert that byte array back into a supplier object. And Kafka doesn't know how to serialize and deserialize our object, so we have to create our own serializer and a deserializer. Finally, there will be a consumer class who can read the supplier objects from Kafka and then print it out. So there are going to be five codes that we have in this particular class. The first one is going to be a supplier serializer who will implement the supplier interface <clears throat> and the generic type is a supplier. There are three standard packages, uh, sorry, methods that will be there inside this uh, class. You will have a configure, you will have a common method called a serialize and close. We are not going to do anything in the close method. The main act action happens in the serialize method. So the code is straightforward. If the data is null, we will return null because we don't want to uh, do any serialization. We simply convert the name and the supplier start date to UTF-8 bytes. Then we allocate a byte buffer and encode everything into the byte buffer. Now, you also need to know the length of the supplier name and the supplier date at the time of deserialization, right? So we encode their sizes into the byte buffer also. And finally, we return the byte buffer array. That's it. So this is the way how we do our serialization. So in continuation with what was asked earlier, unless we do serialization or unless we do some kind of encryption using Kerberos and all that, the objects and the Kafka uh, topics will still be readable, guys. If you are concerned about that, please have serialization implemented in the code way. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We have got a supplier standard logic, the ID, the name, and the start date. And what I'm trying to do over here is in the serialization, we are only going to serialize the name and the date. The ID is going to be the same, okay? We are not going to serialize that. And we will have getter and setter methods and a default constructor for it. Then we have got our supplier serializer, wherein we are going to convert that into UTF-8 bytes. I'm not using the constructor. In the serialize method, I will get the size of the name and the size of the date, convert that into a byte array. And then I will get those data based on the encoding and uh, I will uh, use the byte buffer and allocate the size of the name and the size of the date and get a byte buffer. And finally, in the byte buffer, I will, uh, once again, this is the supply serializer. So in this, I will get the ID, get the name. I will also put the serialized name and the uh, size of the date and the serialized date and finally return a simple array for us, okay? So this is what is the serialized method going to do, converting the contents into a simple array part of it here, okay? And then of course, in the cache, throwing an exception and that's it. 
in the producer everything remains the same so what are we going to do in the code itself we are going to create a topic so please remember guys you are not supposed to write in a production environment the topic in the producer but i'm just showing it over here so that you can do that also if you want friend okay so we did that and here i'm showing you remember what paras had mentioned earlier this 9092 and 9093 are only the lookup part of it automatically so that you can connect to these ports and then you can connect everything like the way how it happens in cassandra you just need the lookup part of it and after that you can connect to the whole cluster so instead of putting one in a real world you always put two but i'm going to run only a 9092 i'm not going to do it on 93 so since it's two we look at the first one and it will continue the serializer is going to be the string serializer okay the key serializer the value serializer is going to be our custom class remember i have created our value serializer so that is what it is going to be friend you had a question yeah, i have a question so uh, yeah tell me that uh, bootstrap servers uh, like let's say we have uh, five brokers uh, so if you just specify two uh, minimum like you said two sh uh, should be there is enough right. or do we need to really specify all the brokers no no no, uh, no, no, no. no you don't have to specify all this is a kind of a lookup thing like what paras had mentioned earlier right so this is a kind of lookup this is only for me to uh, be in touch with the cluster and automatically that will ensure that it will get us connected to everything <laughs> so the bootstrap servers is just like you connect to the receptionist and she will point to where the person is sitting of course she will never know what the person is actually doing she will only know that the person is sitting over there so that's the way how it works garo Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I created the uh, properties. Then I create the producer. Of course, I need a date format. And then I create my supplier, the de facto supplier class. I'm putting two objects over here. Okay. And then I put those two objects as a producer record into my code. Okay. And that's it. So that is what is the supplier producer is complete. I am not putting it into a loop or anything friend here. Yeah, then under there mm -hmm. um, after supplier objects created scroll down. When you are right. putting the message in the producer when you saying send you are defining the key as SUP. So both will go to the same uh, a, a partition. Same That's partition. correct. Right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so you can tweak this, but then since I had only one that is going to be over here, so I was continuing with that. So th this okay. is again uh, customizable here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thanks. So we created our uh, the first one that is the supplier class, supplier serializer, and then we have created our supplier producer. Okay. Now we have to deserialize it. So I have got my supplier deserializer. <coughs> this. we will simply get the details from our uh, binary get all those values and then uh, put it in a, the default values getting the deserialized names getting the size of uh, the date the date bytes and get all those things and the string and uh, i return the supplier object in a deserialized fashion so the business logic of what am i doing is everything in the deserialized i'm not doing anything in the configure and i'm not doing anything in the close also and finally i will have my consumer so see here i'm passing the topic and the group over here which should not be done in the real world this is just as a demo that we are seeing and finally i look over here i get the poll <coughs> i will I get the object and i am getting the id the name and the start date so it will simply print out the id the name and the start date for us okay so that is what this particular code is going to do so there are five classes that we have over here so if we can run those classes now when we test this what should we ideally start with friend should i start with my producer or should i start with my consumer so just look at it when you are actually running the code so that it will be helpful so we'll give you about uh, 10 minutes so that you can go ahead and run this and at around uh, just once again uh, four uh, once again hold on 
but that's right uh, at around 4 50 i will go through the board and i will run and show it to you guys so we'll give you about 12 minutes for you to go and finish this okay so that we have properly done with this and then we can i will actually show you that so just meeting myself for about uh, next uh, uh 10 minutes or so if you have any questions please ask me here thank you Let's just stepping out for maybe another two three minutes, guys. I'll just be back again. Okay? Thank you. Uh, one quick question, um, Venkata. Yeah, friend. So we need to create that supplier uh, topic, right, uh, ourselves? That's correct. So the pojo, the uh, the serializer, the deserializer, and the two ports, my dear. Okay. Now, Got what it, I meant to ask is like, yeah, topic we need to create, right? The topic as well. The no need, no need, no need. In the code, we have specified the topic, my dear. See here. So it is a part of the code when you execute it, the topic gets created. Although this is only for dev or testing environment, in the real world, you should never do this, dear. We're creating the topic as a part of the code, my dear. Make sense? Okay. 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 Sure. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Back again, folks. So. Just checking up our friends, were you able to finish it? Gaurav, Paras, Baskar, Scott, and Vinay? Yeah, mine is working fine. Hey, fantastic, Paras. Thank you so much, friend. So others should be doing it, no issues. So I'm going to show it on the session itself so that you will be comfortable with that. So let me go back, close my other windows. So that I can create my. In fact, I'm going to use the same code. Let me create uh, a new package first. Yeah. Create an event project. I will use the simple project. I will use my Albertsons Kafka. And this is going to be my exercise line. And I will say finish. That's perfect. Yeah, there we go. So first thing I will open up my form.xml file and go down to my XML version. So I will copy everything from dependencies till the build. So we'll see. Go down and create this. That's perfect. So my XML file is ready. I will go ahead and create a package for me. New package and from the ALPRT. Sorry, ALPRT. I'll go sense and I will say finish. Let me create my classes over here. The first class I need to create over here is called as uh, sorry. I think I selected the wrong one. Right click, new class I want. I selected package by mistake. This is going to be sorry, supplier, S U P E L I E R. I will say finish. And I will copy the supplier code from my uh, snapshot of the code that I have. So there we go. And let me copy the supplier class. And that's it. Control C and Control V. Supplier is done. You said the spell. You spelled it incorrectly. Ah, sorry, sorry. Thank you, friend. So three P's is what I have put by mistake. So that's what I was wondering what went wrong. Sorry about that, friend. So let me change this. There should be a V factor. There should be a V name, and I'll remove the one P. So okay, that's right, friend. That's good. Now, let me create the second one that I have that is called as Supplier Serializer. Control C, right click, new class, control V, finish. And let me remove the Serializer code, copy paste everything. Let me scroll up. Okay, let me go down. Copy everything for the serializing part of it. That's it. Control C, go back, Control V, Control S. 
that's taken care of. Now, let me go back to this upgrade user. Control C, right click, new, class, paste it, and I will say finish. And to remove this, let me copy paste the complete uh, code. So from my button, I will, oops, a small class, so that's it. Control C, and then put it over here. That's taken care of. Some error. Okay, let's go back and check the uh, Java compiler. Okay, uh, Java guys, I just need your help, guys. Why is it that some of the things is taking 1.5 as the default level, whereas I've made 1.8 as the standard thing? Why does it happen, my dear? Just for my understanding, that's all, nothing else. Java guys, any idea? No, not sure. Okay. Can you click okay. on the okay. Java build. Click on the Java build path. Okay. The, sorry. Uh, can you go back uh, and uh, the Java build path underlined right above one dot five. Okay. The link. Yes. The, so I'm just taking it here only. Uh, so it looks like yours. Uh, uh, maybe uh, just hit cancel uh, out of this and uh, go to. Uh, Hit cancel, come out of this, and go to uh, like file menu or edit menu where the settings are there. I think it's under edit menu, right? Maybe edit menu. Uh, where are the Eclipse settings? Uh, uh, Windows. Windows. Edit menu Windows. Okay, preferences. And uh, now, if you go to uh, Java and see build, uh, no, um, the compiler. Compiler. So. Huh. You do have one dot eight. This is what I tried, you know. This is exactly what I tried. Install GR is on the left. Okay, so oh, there's also a default. <laughs> okay, I do not. <laughs> No, no, I tried this friend, you know, trust me. These are the two things what I tried. After that, I left it, my dear. So, you know that I, I, I almost stopped coding in Java for the last about four years, you know. So I don't want to play around with it. 14 is uh, what I, I quoted my last example. Last four years, I'm all at the Scala and Python uh, with the Hadoop part of it, you know. So when Kafka started coming in Java in 16, I said, oh my God, I have to start again. I said, no, I'm just going to do the, uh, 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 explain the examples, not getting into coding. So that's where I faced this thing. No issues, I'll just change that. Go down to the Java. Yeah, Java compiler, that's correct. And I will increase it to 1.8. And I will say yes. And I will say okay. Because this thing always stumbles me, you know. God knows why this thing comes, but that's okay. So producer is done. Let me create the next uh, class. Let's go down and deserializer. So control C, right click, new uh, class, <coughs> finish. I will remove the, this and go back to the here. Okay, I'll copy it from here. And, and, yeah, that's it. Control C, uh, Control V. That's also done. And finally, I need the last one that is consumer. Control C, right click, new. Class control E finish. I will take the whole code and paste it over here. That's it. Control C and control. Okay. So now right click Maven update project. Okay. So that those things are taken care of. That's nice. Now right click. Uh, run as Maven Tree. I need to change this. This is guys. Nice. One more thing, uh, Bharat. If you can I set a GRE library by default in a project, or do I have to make changes for every damn code that I uh, bring up over here, dear? Can I do it something at the project level? 
that is? that is at the project level so if you see there enable project specific settings so if you disable that at the top uh, the check mark uh, right below java compiler that's where it takes the uh, like uh, eclipse default and with this you are overriding it okay once again if i remove this i am overriding it right uh, if you enable that enable project specific settings that's when you are overriding eclipse settings the first check okay. no it was already enabled by default that uh, maybe if you see the right hand side configure workspace settings maybe something uh, eclipse is holding uh, the right top corner so just click on that en enable project specific settings or disable that so if we go in there yeah then now uh, yeah go in there that's also so it is set to dot 1.8 yeah so i think by default whenever you create project uh, no no friend it, it is create you know this creating the jre it's not using jdk that's right maybe See, it is using it is using jdk i mean it is using 1.8 but it is using the jre of 1.8 i want the jdk of 1.8 to be done any quick way of doing that friend uh, you can right click as well uh, quick way is like uh, just right click on the jre system library in this view uh, no uh, don't go inside uh, don't go inside okay right click right click then. No, no. I right click that JRE word, uh, the Java word down below. Oh, uh, yes, oh, right okay. Click. Properties. So there also you can quickly change environments on the right or workspace default. Last one. Last one. Last one. Workspace default. Yes. Next time onwards, this is for every project. This will be there. Only for this one, it will be here like this. For now, this will be here for this project. We need to see why a new project uh, gets a default. Maybe workspace or some some uh, okay, default okay. setting is there. Yeah, yeah, no worries, guys. I, I, I tried this once, you know, for 15, 20 minutes. I tried, and I said, okay, that I just giving an issue. So just a frank opinion here, no worries. So now I have got this. So now let me go ahead and run the Maven team. I'm a Java developer with about 11 years experience. But then I'm sorry to say Java really sucks. If you look at the way how it works, if you look at Scala and Python, it's amazing friends, nothing against anybody, but then it's really amazing as a person who is both Java and knows Python and Scala. That is really very good. My dear. <clears throat> then I will say Maven install. Okay. So, so you will teach us Scala tomorrow, right? That's what you promised. That, that's correct. So we will, we will again continue with Java. The first example is what is going to be Scala. Okay. And in fact, to be very frank in the complete of this thing, you don't need to know a lot of Scala, just the basic syntax of how Scala would work, how the uh, code will be there. So the first example is what we need to do, need you to know. So that's something that we will do. The other examples, unfortunately, will be on Java only because uh, uh, that's what the team said that okay, introduce them what is Scala so that they know what it is uh, when, when you have to go ahead with it. Because uh, uh, from the Java perspective, the other developers whom I uh, taught about 10 guys, so they they all had to work with Scala in the projects uh, recently and they realized that they have to get into it and very soon they have to get into Python also because they're getting into the machine learning part and all of those things, you know. So that's where the trash is, just as an FII for you, dear. Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so this is done. And then let me quickly copy this. Just another two, three minutes, and then we are done there. Let me go down to. I think it's I see nine. Yeah, that's right. I'll go down to targets, and I'll drag and drop this nine over here. So from your examples, Garup, what should be first run? Should we run the producer or should we run the consumer first here, friend? We should run the producer first, right? Oh no! No, you haven't tested it. So in our example, producer doesn't do anything. So that is a, a catch over here. We have to run the consumer first, my dear. So let me just go back and go to the cheat sheet. So guys, how do we run the consumer? I completely forgot. Java space minus cp, and let me give the consumer name. The consumer name would be. No, your jar name. Your jar name. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Sorry about that, friend. You're right. So I was thank you, Paris. I was literally going to write the consumer name. So no, it is a jar name. You're right. And jar name. Then a com dot. Uh, let me just go back. 
and uh, Albertsons, Control C, and uh, oops, yes, yeah, Albertsons dot oops, this is that is done from the Albertsons dot uh, the class is called as uh, supplier consumer. Okay, supplier consumer. Okay, so this is the code that we will have to run. So let me go back over there. Control C, because I have got threads in that particular code. So this is the code, and I will run this. It it will wait. Okay, there it is. So this is something new that we are seeing in our, our, of course, I don't see in the new version, I don't see any of these things. And last time in the, in the earlier versions of version two, it stops over here after consumer. Where, and it doesn't even show this, these are all info. So these are all the info things that it is creating new. Okay, so that's good. Now let me go down to the producer and let me go back to this. And all that I have to do is copy this. And here I will say supplier producer. <clears throat> okay, so that's done. And in fact, I'll just copy this for you in the documents so that exercise, this is exercise 11. It's, oh, sorry, exercise 10, last one. Exercise 10. And working with a custom CDI station. Okay, and I'll just paste this so that you have it with you anytime you want to check this. Control P, that's done. And let me test it. Go down to this window. Sorry. Let me copy this. Control C. Go down to this window. And let me go down to the other window and keep it ready. And I'll press enter. It'll automatically create the object and see here how it is giving me the IDs. Okay, so this is the standard thing what I have done earlier. Okay, so it is simply going to give me the IDs based on the code that I have. I have hard coded the code, and since I did not put into a loop and all that, it immediately comes down the producer. Okay, and uh, this is again something new uh, uh, that it is printing out. This was not printing out earlier, so now it is printing out this. So it, it was not even printing this. Okay, the producer network thread. I really don't know what is this cluster ID. Okay, so it's you see that for every code it is giving this metadata, the cluster ID code. We need to check all these things. A lot of new things is what they have. Hey, what is this? Connection could not be established. Okay, 93, that's correct. Okay, it was not even giving this earlier. Okay, trust me, friends. So 92, uh, we were able to ping it. 93, it is giving an error. Okay, it's giving a warning. Okay, last time it was not even connecting to 93 itself. That's what I said earlier, right? So a lot of new things what they have got in 2.2. And uh, this is something new that I'm testing because we might not be working with this for city or for them because they have got the standard version as two. And hopefully next year they will change it to the next version. But a lot of new things they will also see, friends. Okay, so that is it for this particular code. So all of these things are given to you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I have please. a question. Uh, part of the program uh, actually creates the uh, topic which doesn't exist in the Kafka. Okay, let's go back. So when you, let's, let's go back to the consumer. So I've given the consumer name and see here, uh, arrays dot as list as uh, that particular topic name. So it will this particular code when I'm subscribing it, it will actually go back and see if the topic is there or not, and it will, you'll be able to see that. So this is uh, on so the producer we, level. Yeah. How do we stop this? Uh, like at uh, at the Kafka level, or what's the right way to do this uh, from the consumer you side? Uh, yeah, you should never do it within the Java code. You will always do it like what we have been doing earlier, right? So you should allow the admins to create the topics and through the coding level, you should never create topic. That's the thumb rule what we have. Because if you do it like this, nobody will have a control of uh, the way how the things would happen there. The security and all those rules might never be enforceable. So this is never the recommended way. But just for the purpose of example, we have created it in the Java code right here. There is a problem right? on Sorry. the day one the word file that was sent. There are certain attributes 
which are defaulted. So there you can turn auto create off, right? That's correct. So if you go down to the properties file and if you create auto create off, then you can never do this. Even if you do this, this won't get implemented. You know, the topic will never get created. So, so what is happening is since auto create was on, so when we configured this as a de facto manner, it works. But uh, if you change that into configuration value, uh, the topic will never get created. So in the real world, the auto creation will always be off for us. So that's the whole idea here. Great. Agarab, uh, makes sense? Yes, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So this, this is the way how we go ahead with the whole thing. So I think that will be it for today, friends. So tomorrow we are going to talk about the Confluent. For the whole day, we will be talking about Confluent, what are the capabilities, and we will be starting with the first example of how to go ahead with it. Okay. So please try all these examples, go through it and see if there's any question, and I'll be able to answer all of those things tomorrow. So thank you so much for your time. Scott, appreciate you being the host, my dear. So everything is good. Thanks, Gaurav, Bhaskar, Paras, and Vinay. So Thanks. we will catch up tomorrow then. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, Bhaskar. Thanks. Thank you, Bhaskar. Sure, 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 sure. So thanks, uh, Scott, for all this. So let me stop the session. I don't think so. I'll be able to stop it also. You might have to just close it at year end, Scott. So just take care of that here. Uh, what we will do today is to uh, move on to another layer of uh, processing. That is what is uh, going to be via your uh, Confluent APIs. So that's something that uh, we will have to start up and see how did we go ahead. So got only about four of us over here. Uh, let's give maybe another uh, two, three minutes more for the others to come. So any questions on what we have done till now? So if you go down to the document, go down to my cheat sheet, you will see that what we have done on day one, day two, and let me mention what is the plan for today. The plan for today would be A, we will uh, set up uh, our, or we will start uh, with our basic example in Confluent, with our basic example in Confluent. And uh, others, it's, it's getting down, uh, uploaded right now. This file is getting uploaded because yesterday also this file is a huge file. And it is restoring forex data. Okay, give it a couple of seconds. Uh, this should get uploaded. Our other things are already uploaded. Uh, only thing is that uh, uh, I don't know why this file gets uploaded every time. I need to check that out. No worries. So if you go down to the documentation link, I should have day three. Let me confirm that so that uh, we are not running into any issue. Let me scroll up. Go down to the link that you have to see. This is that link. Okay, and please uh, download this whole document and all the contents by today or by tomorrow because it will be removed day after tomorrow, friends. So we wouldn't have this uh, document live forever. So please have that downloaded here. I'm going down to that folder. I should have, yeah, there we go. So day three contents is also uploaded. And if you look at it, I should have three folders. And uh, yeah, so that is also there. I don't know why this file got created. Day three. So it should actually be day three dockets. So I need to find out what is this, guys, which is the latest file. Uh, that's surprising. So let me go down to your Kafka stuff. Give me a second. Go down to P drive. Go down to ZLN uh, Kafka. Go to day three. Yeah, there is only one file. Let me just open up that file so that uh, there is no confusion. Yeah, all the contents are there. Okay, let me scroll down. This is about the next exercise 13. Okay, good. Then exercise 14. And then exercise 15. Yeah, that looks to be complete. So I think I can delete that additional file that was there because this looks to be something different. So let me go ahead and say remove. Yeah, that's good. So day three content is already there and you can use that. Yeah, so it looks like a lot of you are there. I'll just mute you, Bhaskar. A little bit of a noise. So Bhaskar is there, Brandon, Gaurav, Paris is there, Scott, uh, Vinay, and uh, Vijay is there. I think one person is missing. That should be... Um, 
yeah, uh, Susan is missing. So she should be coming in soon. So let's continue. Before we go ahead, uh, let me know in case if you have any doubts or any questions from yesterday folks, so that if there is something I can answer that. So anybody having any doubts? Uh, Brandon is uh, trying out with examples. Anybody here for the complete set of examples and the downloads and everything is there with you. So it should not be a challenge. You can follow it up. So that should be as a backup. So when time permits and the organization is getting it trained, I think it should be important that we should understand those topics, but work-wise, if something is there, we can't help it. So that's the reason. So uh, uh, Baskar, uh, uh, all good till now, were you able to pra practice it here? Uh, I, I didn't do much yesterday, but I will be doing when I have time this week. Okay, that's perfect. Great. Uh, Gaurav is following hands-on from what I said. Same thing with Paris. What about you, Scott? Were you able to spend some time yesterday on the examples that we have done? Because everything is running for you right now, friend. Yes, everything is going yeah. good. I just need to kind of follow through with the last exercise. That's okay. That's perfect. Because I saw that you were replying back on the topic, so that's good. Uh, tell me, Gaurav, you had a question here. No, no, I was just saying like, yeah, everything is good at my end as well. So everything is working fine. That's perfect, Gaurav. Thank you so much. Uh, what about you, Vijay? Uh, you are not there for the last example. I hope you have, uh, uh, sorry, I got confused whether it is Vijay or Vinay. My apologies, dear. Oh, it's me. I, I had to drop off at the end. So it's only the serialization example I haven't executed. Okay. But yes, so, that's yeah, that, try it out, dear. So no issues on that. Try it out. So that we could go for Vijay. And uh, uh, Vinay, are you there, Vinay? How is it yes, going? Uh, yeah, from my side, it's good. Yeah, everything is working. Yeah. That's perfect, buddy. So right. no worries. So that's great, dear. So we have got everybody. Only uh, Susan has left. She should be joining us very soon. And uh, we will continue with that. So until now, what we did was uh, Vanilla Kafka, and we saw a lot of examples on that. And when we look at the industry perspective, we have got a dedicated three days uh, or four days given to Confluent. Like for example, in uh, JP Morgan, we have got course one, that is what is the uh, basic course, that is what I have covered with you. Advanced course is where we look at Confluent and that itself is going for three days and there will be a fourth day uh, with a deep dive on this. So when this course content was given by your team and told me that everything has to be covered, so they said that yes, we are using the Vanilla Park for the first two days, you will have to cover it up properly so that uh, with the ex examples so that people will be able to understand how to use Kafka. Whereas on the day four, with a lot of new things that is coming up, it is okay if we can just give them the steps, what has to be done and uh, what it is, and uh, we can take it up further from there. So I said, that's perfectly fine. So that is what is the plan. We will start with one example on the Confluent, that is the uh, standard uh, code, the way how to compile uh, this uh, using Scala. Okay, uh, so that is something that uh, we will look at. <clears throat> and when we use Scala, uh, you have to understand something called as SPT, that is a simple build tool. Okay, so we will go ahead. Uh, you won't believe if I say that it is just as simple as saying SPT compile and SPT run. Okay, so it uh, is basically. Get... Yeah, question. please. I know you touched on it that you want to uh, um, go with the Scala language for this one confluent thing. But any reason why um, doesn't they support Java? Because we will be using Java here in the in our no, chance. No, 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 no. It's not being Java. It is Scala that is being used in our sense. Because if you look at the language perspective, when we talk about a code that is written in Java, this is a code written in Scala and in Python. The general joke is that by the time you finish up with your import statement in Java, my Python code is finished. And if you look at what we are trying to achieve uh, ahead, that is machine learning and those components. So you would really have to get down into Scala, into Scala and Python. So why are you think, even thinking of Scala right now is that because we have got a lot of Java developers. And the same thing is what happened with JP in 2014 when we introduced Hadoop. So a lot of Java developers. But then for a fact of the matter, when you talk about a SQL guy, a guy who works on the uh, SQL part of it. No, no, hold on. Uh, one second. Yeah, I, think, I, 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 I got the intent of what you're trying to compare the languages. 
but technically for all the platforms not just not just when we use spark or scala but we are trying to migrate to one point in java as well so let me ask one question to baskar in that platform baskar which language are you guys using i know you are using kafka of confluent but are you using scala or java itself no we are using java because is a oms so yeah I don't know how, what who communicated that will be using Scala, but I just want to let you know. Like, yeah, I think it might be the data science uh, side of the teams. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a lot many number of jobs that we wrote in uh, integration side, uh, which are technically the Spark jobs, which we wrote in Scala. Once again, but, once again, once again, dear. So I got disconnected. I don't know what was the reason, my dear. So something went wrong. Surprisingly, I got disconnected. I just came back. In fact, uh, when I was discussing, I just heard that you told me that you wanted to say something. So I paused, and suddenly the line went away. So can can we just start from there, Vijay? I'll appreciate that. So what I'm trying to say was, I don't know who communicated that we'll be we are using or we will be using Scala at Safe Bay. There are different teams. Our one among which is Baskar's team for offer for OMS, which they are using Java already, and they are using Confluent version of Kafka. I just want to say that whatever you are going to train, that's fine. I'm just saying that we are using even Java here, not just Spark. I don't know who, uh, not just uh, Scala. Uh, no, no. Uh, the vision right now is that you are going to move out of uh, some applications that are already using Scala. So that's the reason. If you could see Susan who who was there, the female who was there, she had mentioned that they were also they were using it. Yes, you guys are Java guys, but then within the organization, there's a lot of traction on Scala. And what was told to me was that uh, uh, cover up the Scala part of it also, so that they would know how the thing would work, so that the people will come to know how the things are. I have got the things in Java also, so that is what I was trying to tell you, uh, Vijay. Uh, that uh, that is what the traction is here. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So within the organization, they're using it in both the ways of doing it. So just as a word of caution, just as a way of letting you know, when we talk, because the way how Albertsons is planning to use this is, uh, you're planning to use the other ecosystem components also. Okay, so this is what uh, is the roadmap that we are saying that your company would have. So when we talk about the roadmap part of it, you already have got it is an existing Java shop. Okay, so no worries on that. So then when we talk about uh, the other ecosystems like your Hadoop, wherein you are primarily using high velocity. So that is still using Java and uh, no concerns on that. Java and SQL. And uh, when we talk about uh, the Java set of people whom I trained, uh, I think in the first week, I don't remember. Just one second, I'll just go down to my calendar so that you can see. I had a five day training with you people wherein we had Java and they were all clear Java guys. But then the mixture was, yeah, see, this is the one. So in the seventh of uh, this month, so for five days, I had a training for them on Spark part of it. So they wanted primarily on uh, the uh, Java part of it, but they also wanted one day on Scala so that they know what it is. And being a Java guy, you can move down to Scala and see how the things are. And there's a lot of traction that is happening over there. This is what was told to me. I wouldn't do anything about Albertsons. The first time I got introduced to your company was this month from the vendor who was in touch with you. So the roadmap is when I spoke to the training managers, etc., they were saying the Spark will be primarily with Java to start with because you are a Java shop, primarily with uh, Java. But then there is a lot of traction. The reason I'm saying Vinay is uh, uh, Kafka is okay because it is there in Java also, it supports Java also and you can work with this. But then when you go down to the next phase, what we are looking at, that is what is machine learning and they have got a component called as graphics. So when you look at machine learning and graphics as a component, the language that will be used for that is what is going to be Scala and Python. We really wouldn't be doing machine learning in Java because first of all, the APIs are not there. Okay, the way how the Anaconda libraries function, there is something called as a Anaconda library that is it. the way how it functions and looks at uh, things. I don't know whether you are aware. In Java 8, can I go ahead with some notebook, uh, Vijay? Nothing against you, I'm just uh, taking you since we spoke, Vijay, that's why. So do we have any concept of notebooks in Java? 
At least I don't know. No, no, there is no notebook. Whereas in your Jupyter, there is something called as a Jupyter notebook. You code everything in the notebook of the runtime environment. Okay, and then you also have got something called as the Zeppelin notebook. This is what is going to be for Scala. So if you look at the uh, SQL guys and the people who are going to be deployed on this, they will be working with these components. This is just as an FII for you, friend. Uh, uh, we will have to see how the whole thing would go ahead and see how it happens. A simple example is, uh, give, let me give you my own example. <clears throat> I worked for 11 years in Java and the last four years when I said that I'm not using Java, what would that mean? That would mean that the people in the industry that is deploying are moving away from Java, right? So Java is a fantastic language. Oracle comes ahead and gives me different versions of Java. That is a very fabulous thing to look at. But then the fact of the matter is when you go down to machine learning and graphics and all of those things, it is all going to be Scala-based uh, and uh, Python-based maybe. So just giving you the perspective of what it is and what your organization is looking at. So it was purely from that idea, maybe. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. So that is the objective. That's from where we are coming from. So we will start with our first tool. So when we talk about SPP, it is going to be a simple build tool. And for compiling, you have to just say SPP compile. And for running, you have to just say SPP run. That's all. Nothing else. So that's the first example that we will see. Then we will do a example of uh, a schema validations. Uh, and when we start talking about Confluent, they have got a schema registry, which your vanilla Ka Kafka doesn't have. So schema registry, how the schemas are uploaded, we will see an example of that. After that, we will talk about the other things what is there. So if you look at Kafka also, you are looking at Kafka only from the existing 10 stuff that we did and other enhancements, etc. But then there is a lot of things that is additionally in Kafka. So if you look at this, you have got something schema registry I spoke about. Then you have got something called as uh, Kafka Connect. So my job today would be just to introduce to you what is Kafka Connect, uh, <coughs> set up the environment. And over here, you will have to also set up something called as Docker. Because so that uh, when you want to start with it, you would have the complete environment ready on your own laptop so that you can go ahead with it, right? So that's the whole idea. So just wanted to check with you folks, are you working with Docker and are you familiar with those things or Docker is a new baby for you? Yeah, we are I'm familiar. aware. Yeah, we are familiar with Docker. We are familiar. That's that's great, Paras and uh, Baskar and uh, Vijay. So that's great. So have you set up something, Paras and Docker, or you are aware of it? But then, uh, are you really using Docker to set up the images and all that, Paras? Just for my understanding. Yeah, yeah, we do. We are that's aware. Of, I, my team is aware of it. We are not using it. But... Okay, okay. So that's great. So the, over here, that's what we will be doing. We, we set up a complete uh, Docker image, and then we have got something called as Lando. Okay, so that is what is nothing but we are Hadoop part of it. It's called as Lando, and of course the name is changed right now. And uh, I'm not following it for a long time. Even I was surprised to see that the name is changed. Just give me once again. I'll give you the name for that particular tool. Just a second, folks. So. It is called as uh, lenses.io. Okay, the new name for that is called as lenses.io. Lenses.io. So that is what is Kafka Connect. After Kafka Connect, we will go down to set up your environment and then do something called as KSQL. Okay, what is KSQL? How do you do SQL part of it? Just set up the environment and know that this, this kind of a beast is available. And then along with Kafka Connect, we will also talk about something called as streams. Okay, so all these three things are going to be done in a very good way with the new implementations of it. So we should ideally have the latest version of this, which I have downloaded and I've given you the details and all that, which you will have to do. If I'm not mistaken, it is five dot something. Just give me once again. It is five dot three dot one. Okay. So five dot three dot one is where all those things are there. So whenever you set up your Kafka uh, in your Confluent, this is what you'll be getting. As usual, your Zookeeper and Kafka. That 
is what was the heart of it. But then they also introduce us the Kafka schema registry. They also introduce us the REST API for Kafka. They also have got something called as Connect and KSQL. And remember yesterday, Bhaskar, you were asking me about the UI and all those things. That is what is there in something called as the control set. Okay. So this is what you will be having it when you start with your Kafka environment and I can help you out with it to see how did we go ahead and do that. So that is what is the perspective of this. Towards the end of the course, we will just uh, walk through everything to see if we have any questions on anything and then we will go ahead with it. So the plan for today is primarily to work with the uh, Confluent kind of an environment. And in the Confluent environment, whatever we have done yesterday, same thing can be done. And in addition to this, a lot of new things is already coming down. That is Kafka Connect, KSQL and Streams. And that is what you will have to focus on. So we will have to see how that will be beneficial to you and how you're going to do those things and, uh, and all of those things. Okay, so that's what is the plan. So let's get uh, started. And just one second, somebody went offline, but that's okay. Okay, uh, I think three people, two people went offline. So no, I think it was only Vinay uh, who's not there, that's okay. And uh, Susan is still not here. That's also perfectly fine. So let's continue friends. So let's see, start with our day with the trying to see a basic example of how we can do it in Confluent. And the whole idea is we wanted to do it using Scala. So this is what is going to be the first example. So till yesterday, I think it was exercise number 10 that you did. So we are going to start with our exercise 11 for today. And this is what is going to be testing a simple Kafka uh, uh, message, sending, uh, testing a simple Kafka message in the Confluent API, Confluent API. Okay, so for this, uh, let's see how do we go ahead and do this. Let me go back to my document and let me scroll up and let me go right at the beginning. This is actually example 11. So the version of Confluent that is already there, the reason why we are sticking to this earlier version is because this is what is used by the banks right now. We talk about City, we talk about the JP. So even they are using Kafka primarily as a messaging layer, what you guys are planning to use it. But then Kafka has gone up in the last three years. I mean, Confluent has gone up in the last three years to do a lot of things other than plain messaging that Kafka was doing. It has invested a lot in your connect APIs, how you can connect between different components. They have got a way how when you get an incoming message, you can use your SQL style of analysis. That is a KSQL. They have got your, uh, what do you call, Kafka streams. So these are the three new things what you have and how what you can play around with. Okay. So let's uh, start with the basic stuff. And this is already installed for you. So let me go back to the image. And if I go down to my lab software, and you see that I have already, we already have got your a Kafka, and this is what is already there for you. Kafka 4.1.1 is already there for you. So we are going to work with this Kafka 4.1.1. Okay, just one second, there was a small chat window. Okay, Gaurav was saying that we are using uh, Confluent uh, 5.2.1, that's correct. So I'm going to work with the uh, latest Confluent, that is uh, Confluent 5.3.1, to show you how the new things are there. So that's correct. So you can try this very well in the existing Confluent also, because the beauty is that it is backward compatible, Gaurav. Okay, so I readily had this for the existing clients. And, and, and the basic trouble what I had was when I was talking to see who all are the people who is coming, what is the skill set, that was a complete blackout on that particular part, you know. So last week I was trying to get in touch with the people to see who all are there. So very, very difficult to get that kind of an information from the team as to see who all is coming, what is the skill set, so that I can tune my post to your things, you know. Vijay, uh, you want to say something, dear? Okay, I'll just mute him. It was by mistake he had unmuted. So that was the reason. So to be very frank, I was not even knowing what you guys are using. When we started off, you, uh, <coughs> we, I came to know that you're using Confluent 5, my dear. So it was a little bit too late. I can't change the contents right away, dear, right? So that was a challenge, Gaurav. 
So that's okay. So this is what we will be working. The same example will work in your uh, the latest version of Confluent also should not be a challenge. Just once again. Okay, so this is what was, yeah, the price data, what I said, I need to look at this particular file to see what it is so that uh, uh, that will get uploaded. Anyway, in, it should get uploaded very soon. So we will stick down to that. Let me go back to my document. So the first thing that we have to do over here is that when we talk about a deployment descriptor, we don't have anything called as pom.xml and all of those things when we talk about Scala. You will simply have a tool called as SBT. That stands for simple build tool, wherein you will give the details of the packages that you're going to uh, load. So we are going to create a file in my lab programs. First of all, create a directory called as first and simply put this file as it is into the simple build tool. Okay, so no changes to be done in that. This is the standard version that we are working with. Then we will uh, open up a Java code. This file will be there as it is into your first folder. Okay, this is going to be the simple producer. You know that in the last code, I had given the topic in the Java code itself. This is the same way. So this producer will be created by default. I should not say producer, this topic. Okay, so it should be this topic will be created by default. The key is going to be key one and value one. And the properties are the same. Last time we saw that there are three standard properties. We'll create a Kafka producer, a producer record, send that record and then simply close it. So we have got this code with us, okay? So then what will you do is you will execute the command as shown below to compile your program. That is going to be SBT compile. So you'll go down to that particular directory and just say SBT compile and then simply say SBT run. Trust me, that's all that is needed. So we have got our producer already there. Then this producer will be uh, generating a topic, right? The topic uh, will be, where is the name of the topic? Uh, the key value, the record, what is the record that it is putting? You just give me one second here. So my record is over here. Okay, okay, we're simply going to put the, uh, the key and the value, that is key one and the value one is what it will print. That is what the record is going to do. Then we will test it with the simple consumer, the standard console application that we were doing. So you will go down and uh, uh, print out the values of Kafka console consumer. Please remember, you will not have the dot sh. I have deliberately kept it over there. When you talk about the Kafka console consumer, let me show that to you. If you go down to your confluent bin and you see that we don't have the dot sh at all, okay? So you will have to be careful in removing the dot sh. The bootstrap server, you know what it is because I'm using from the default uh, server dot properties. The topic name is going to be the simple producer topic. That is what I have kept over here. Okay, and uh, we are going to see from the beginning so that it will, it will return me everything. So this is how we will test it with our existing code what we are having right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and test this out. So any questions on the things that we are seeing right now, friends? Pretty simple. Co create a folder called as first and lab programs, which should have two files. Okay, then call SBT, compile and SBT run. And we would need to have Maven and set up for this. And I've already done that in the image. Uh, if you try to do this on your own, there's a lot of steps that will be uh, required. We need to set up Maven and all those things. I've already done that in the image for you. And then I have shared the image for you. So you can directly go ahead and say SBT compile. We'll take a couple of seconds. So let it compile properly. Then we will say SBT run. So you're executing your uh, producer. It will finish it. Then go down in the other console, start with your Kafka console consumer and see whether this particular key value is being printed. Okay. So that's what you're going to do right now. Folks. So we'll give you some time in trying to do that. Take your time, understand what it is. And let's go ahead and do this exercise level. Thank you so much. I'm just going to put myself on mute. Go ahead and let's start with it. Thanks, folks. Now just as a precaution, if you have got any other services running, just ensure that when you do JPS, you should not have any services running, guys. Okay? So please take care of that. <clears throat> now, for running this, we require something, right? What do we require for this to run, my dear? Because this won't run exactly like the way I said. Zookeeper and broker, right? Exactly, friends. So if you scroll down a little bit, 
in case if you want to start your zookeeper, this is the way how I will start my zookeeper. So go down to your confluent package and uh, zookeeper server dot start, and they have kept everything in the etc Kafka folder. So you will just start your zookeeper and your Kafka server. So please remember that is must over here for this thing to work. You should test. So I will just write it down over here. And you also please make a note of this. We need to ensure we need to start with the zookeeper and the Kafka server for this thing. Okay. So we will have those demons running. And this is the way it's just below. I have said, how do we start our zookeeper and your Kafka server? So please keep that ready and let's start with it. Okay. Vinkit, in the server properties of the Confluent Kafka, do we need to change the log directories? Right now it's pointing to. Uh, That's 10. okay. Uh, ah. No, let it go to 10. That's okay because we're not having anything. But in the long run, you will have to do that. Friend. Both the zookeeper uh, log directory and the server log directory should be in one location but in the current example let it go to the default location it should not be a challenge to us so we have to start the registry to link it no 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 the registry is for the next example remember we had asked me yesterday about the schema yeah, registry yeah, yeah. thing right yep. but that will be for the next example right? sorry one more thing we need to create the topic as well right Simple uh, produce a topic. No, 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 no. Uh, keeping it in the code. So we have oh, done okay. it in the last example. So we are writing it in the Java code only. Okay. Sure, sure. Fantastic, Paras. Thank you, mate. So, Venkat, to in order to check the description or describe this topic and etc., can mm -hmm. we have to move through Confluent only, right? Same command. Similar the same command. Com the same command will work, but the dot sh will not be there, dear. Okay. Exactly the same comment, friend. We just started with, yeah, hi, friend. So we just started with the things. What you will have to do is that if you can go ahead and download uh, the video uh, in the same URL what I have shared with you earlier, you can download it from there. I will give you the, I mean, the stuff for today. I'll give you the link of it so that you can download it from there. This is that particular link. Day three stuff you can download. And uh, we're starting with our Confluent uh, classes because yesterday and day before yesterday we did with the Vanilla Kafka and we're going mm -hmm. to go ahead with Confluent Suzo. That's what we're doing here. Okay. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm enjoying for some time and uh, I have to go for other meetings. So uh, I'm going to on and off as well today. Sorry about yeah. that. No, that's okay. So just cover up the beauty is that everything is recorded. So you'll be given an access to the recording also. Yeah, so awesome. that you'll have handled everything. One sure. Thing, Thank so you that. so much. You're welcome, dear. Just one more thing. Uh, uh, maybe yesterday when you were discussing, there were some people wherein you were using some of the uh, uh, Spark part of it, right? So how are you using Spark just for the understanding of the current crowd? Because I know Albertson only from the earlier batch and this batch and talking to some people, you know. So how are you oh. using Spark right now just for the this set of uh, crowd? Oh, okay. We are using uh, Spark to process the data. We are not using Spark to uh, read from Kafka Q, Kafka okay. topic. Okay. Yes. And, and what language are you working on right now? Uh, when Spark you talk Java. About Spark? You're doing Spark it. Java. Okay. In yeah. Spark Java only. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you have somebody who's working in Scala that you are aware of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's me. <laughs> we are working on Spark with Scala itself. Uh, who, uh, once again, who's that? Uh, Jay. Jay? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, so, okay, okay. So that's good. So since you're working on Scala, so that's great because when you had asked me that question, I was having a doubt, my dear, uh, are people doing because that is what was told to me, Vijay. So I got confused. So that was the no, reason no, for the question. The reason why I asked the question was, mm -hmm. there was an initiative or a discussion happened sometime back mm -hmm. because of the knowledge base being available. Should okay. we migrate everyone onto Java, even the okay. existing Spark jobs? Okay. That was the discussion. Okay. It didn't happen yet, but there are jobs still on Spark itself. And, and, and any of the new Spark version that we are implementing, we are writing in Java. So there is a, a bit of a conflict here. Someone is using count, uh, Spark and some Scala, someone is using Java. Okay. So even the same thing with Kafka as well. So that's it. And I'm asking, uh, okay, okay. why are we not starting with Java? Okay. So, okay, okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now it is clear. Earlier I was a little bit confused, my dear. So no worries. Thank you, friend. 
because uh, Susan, when we were talking earlier, there was a little bit of a discussion on uh, uh, are we going to cover up these things using Scala and all that. So I was told that yes, uh, start with Scala, let them know how it can be done. So that's the reason why originally I had created this application using that, you know, so that was a confusion. Anyway, no worries. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Great. So you can start with the doc and see what we are going to do on day three. So this is what is the roadmap for today. And we are starting with our exercise number 11. Another two minutes and then I'll be showing it on my screen also. Uh, Paris, we're trying some examples. Just ensure that we don't give a dot SH. That's the only thing. Otherwise, the same code, Kafka code will work in Confluent also, Paris. Yeah, yeah, I tried. I tried that. It works, the description. Oh. Okay, okay, fantastic. Thank you. Hey, Paris had a question. Yeah, it worked with the Kafka and Zookeeper, but why do you run Kafka Confluent and Zookeeper? Okay, hey, that's because uh, when you, it is not in config, it is in etc config, uh, Paris. So you're not supposed to run the uh, normal vanilla Zookeeper. You should okay. be running the Confluent Zookeeper here. Okay, cool. So, and that is in. Uh... It's in ETC here. Let me scroll down in the document. It is there in your uh, ETC Kafka. See here? Okay, ETC Kafka. Okay, okay, all right. So let's go ahead, guys. We need to start with this. I'm going to do that. First, I need to go ahead and go down to the folder. So CD lab software uh, confluent four. Sorry, confluent dash four. Yeah, yeah that's right and uh, this one second i think i'll stick to that let me just check that's right i'll stick to it then i will start first with my zookeeper so i will simply copy paste this command and run that should make it work so Control c i'm just going to go down to a, a default page that's what i thought it has to be in the same line there we go so this is the way how we start with our zookeeper. And let me start with the Kafka server, the script for starting with the Kafka server. That also I'll go down to that particular directory and run it like this. Yeah, I don't want it in the next line too. There we go. So let me first start with my zookeeper properties. Control C, I'll go down to a prompt, run. So you will see the same standard zookeeper what we were seeing earlier that starts and it is there on port number 2181. Now let me open up a duplicate session. Let me open up a duplicate session. There we go. And give the credentials. Now to password is going to be happy with 123. And go down to CD lab software at Confluent. And that's it. And let me start with the second one. I need to start with my Kafka server properties. So control C. Let me go back and run this. So this will start. And, and please remember when you do a JPS, you will see that the name is different, friend. It is called as, uh, it's simply not called as Kafka. Uh, the name will be different. So let me show that to you right now. So let me open up a different prompt. And let me go ahead with not true. Password is going to be Hadoop123. And when I do a JPS, you will see that Kafka is called a supported Kafka. Okay. So see over here how it started with the defaults and uh, it is coming back and telling us that it is already done. Okay. So please remember the name of the daemon would be different. So note the name of the uh, the uh, Kafka daemon in Confluent, sorry, Confluent will be supported Kafka. Okay, it's not Kafka, it is going to be called a supported Kafka. Okay, perfect. And uh, let me simply copy these steps uh, into my cheat sheet also. So at any point when you're running, you will be finding it easy to use this. Okay, so I have got two daemons running. So far, so good. Now, let me go back to the exercise. And uh, I will first create a file called as build.sbt, simple build tool. So let me go back to my lab programs. I'm going to create a new folder over here called as first. 
and inside that i'll create a file called as built dot svg just once again let me just go back yeah that's right build dot svg and this is the contents that i'm copy pasting into that then I will have my producer Java code, simple producer.java, control C, and right click, new, file, and I'll call it a simple producer.java. Sorry, R is missing, producer.java. And I will copy paste this complete the code that I have that is going to be the producer. Control C. And uh, control D, I'll save the file so far, so good. So these two files are already uh, kept for me in my uh, program's first directory. So let me go down to the prompt, go down to, I did a JPS and showed you that uh, the names are different. So just for understanding sake, I'll just copy paste those things into my code. Okay, the names of the demons, I'll just paste it here so that you can see them. Okay, so now uh, I will go down to my command prompt. I'll go down to lab programs first. Once again, uh, that's right. A CD not to lab programs, so it is not to lab programs, that's correct. LS minus L. I should see, okay, F is category, CD first, okay? And if I do LS minus L, I've got this program here. Now, all that I have to do is type SBT compile, and this will go ahead and compile the code for me. Give it a couple of seconds. So this is the simple build tool that comes along with Kafka so that the necessary compilations can take place. It needs to download something to see here, it is setting the SPT version to a particular level. Okay, it is downloading the project definitions. Same thing like Maven. Okay, and they will create a folder, separate folders, etc. I will create. We'll just wait and see. So once everything is finished, I can say SPT one. So this finished updating those. It will have to download some specific directories also, so that dependencies will be inside that. Wait for a couple of seconds, folks. Once that's done, that is the primary purpose of uh, doing this, so that you will come to know how things are. So there you go. It is setting the current project to Kafka test. Of course, you can do this in SPT shell also and do that. But then I'm, I'm running it in the normal way from my uh, current folder. It's updating it. Wait for a couple of seconds. And then, yeah, see here, it's downloading the uh, default dependencies. Primarily, the Scala jar files is what it would need. The Kafka clients, it's downloading all the necessary default ones. Now it is downloading the reflect the Scala library. And once everything is done, we'll simply come out and say that it has compiled it. Let's wait. And right now I'm telling you friends, before I might forget this, so please remember that when we go down to the coding, okay, when we go down to Kafka Connect and all of those things, you have to change the memory of the image to seven gigabyte. Right now it is two gigabyte. I have already changed the image at my end, but that's okay. You don't need it right now. If I go to VM settings and you see the memory, so now it is coming up. Give it a couple of seconds, there it is. Mine is already kept to 6.2, okay? So you need that because otherwise that will that will end up being very, very slow. Okay, that's it. It has finished with the compiling. It has finished with that and it says that it is a success. So now if I do a LS minus L in my uh, project, you will see that uh, we have got a project and a target. 
that's already over there. So now all that I would need to do is I have to say SPT run. Okay. So the compilation is done and I will say SPT run so that it will run the simple producer code. Let it finish. And since we are doing it from beginning in the consumer, I should see that message anyway. So see here how it is loading the project definitions. A couple of seconds. And then we can go ahead and see that it is done. Okay, there we go. So the producer is complete. Let this uh, keep on running. Let me go down to a duplicate session, not root. Password is going to be Hadoop 23, CD lab, programs. And uh, uh, let me run my, uh, sorry, I, I can't do it in programs. I need to go down to Kafka. So CD dot dot lab uh, software and Kafka because I'm going to run my program that is uh, the standard code, okay? That is Kafka console consumer. So now let me copy paste the syntax. And you want to run in Confluent, not in Kafka, right? Okay, that's right, that's right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Paras, appreciate that. I was doing it yesterday, right? So got stuck to that. CD lab software, Confluent, and version four. That's correct here. Yeah. Thank you so much. So this is done. Now I will say slash bin and uh, this is what the syntax is okay so control c let me copy that and go down to my code that is the last one and simply run this so the code has started the bootstrap server is a de facto default one localhost 9092 and it should produce i'm surprised i'm oh, sorry from beginning got missed out Control C, clear. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Why is it not giving me anything? Oh, okay. So it looks like it has come in two lines. So I have to keep it in one line. So let me go back to the cheat sheet and paste it. Yeah, I thought that was the reason. So now it is in one line. Now it should come. So Control C, let's go back to the confluent, run this, and press enter and I should see the value when coming because that's all I'm printing, okay? So if you see the code, you see what we are doing and it is simply going to print the record and uh, it, the key was key one, the value was value one and that's what you're seeing over here. In case if you want to run it again, so I can run my SBT run on the producer once again and once it's finished, you will see the uh, second one also coming. Okay, so SBT run it is still going on. Give it a couple of seconds. Yeah, there we go. It has loaded the product definition. Once it's finished, I should see two value ones coming over here. Okay, so this was the example of how do we run it. Yeah, there we go. It finished and you see the second value one also coming. So you see that irrespective of the language, <clears throat> the complexity is not there much. But then uh, if you look at integrating Kafka with the uh, Spark kind of a layer and the components and all that, Scala would be a better choice. The reason for that purely is uh, you don't want people to work on different languages for different products, right? So you might say that, hey, let me continue with Java, okay? So with Lambda, Java become a little bit more easy, but then the kind of uh, libraries that is available and the way how you would want to go ahead with it, you wouldn't have that kind of a thing with uh, Java. Flow. So yes, you guys are experts in Java, fully agree with it, but then uh, people are slowly moving down for the new capabilities of the new languages. And you're still in Java uh, 8, Whereas if you look at the market, it is still about 14 has already come, right? So a lot of changes has happened in Java. And even in Java 9, you have got the uh, notebook kind of an environment. Okay, so that is available from Java 9 onwards. Unfortunately, it is not a Java 8. Right? So a lot of traction happening in the language perspective also. Okay, so this was the example. That's it. I'll do a control C and our purpose is solved so that you will see the message coming down over there. So that was the purpose of our example exercise number 11.
So now what I will do is uh, I will go down to the next one. That is what is going to be, how do we play around with the Avro example, okay? The source code files have been shared with you and you already have got those things, okay? So what you will have to be careful of is to see how uh, the uh, new things would work inside that. So we are going to try a detailed Avro example using Confluent, okay? So I mentioned here in Confluent, we do not have the assets files for the scripts. So one additional component that you will have to start is called as the schema registry uh, library. So with the start, the schema registry would start and we will go ahead and see what are the additional things, what it has. So when you start the demons, you would see these uh, schema registry also getting started. So let's look at what does Avro give us. So there are a lot of pre-built and reusable serialization systems that is already there. Okay, Avro is one of them. And in fact, it's the most popular serialization system for Hadoop and its ecosystems. It offers you two things, or four things in fact. It allows you to define a schema for your data. It generates code for your schema. It provides API so that you can serialize your data according to the schema and embed schema information in the data and provides an API so that you can extract the schema information and deserialize your data based on the schema. So ultimately everything goes to the Avro serializer and the deserializer part of the code. And we are going to use that in our current example. The producers and the consumers will only use the generated classes to create the data objects. The serializer and the deserializer takes care of everything. So the way how do we do that is you will define the Avro schema for your message record. You will generate a, a source record for your Avro schema. Also create a producer and a consumer. But then the new thing what you will see here is that uh, they use the Kafka. We will be using our Kafka Avro serializer and your uh, T serializer over there. Okay. So uh, with all these things ready, the beauty that uh, Confluent has got is uh, you will be using the schema registry. So this is a new layer that we started earlier. See here, we started with the schema registry. So what does that give you? So we know that the Kafka Avro serializer and deserializer takes care of everything. But the important thing is how will they communicate with each other about the schema? The deserializer should know the schema. Without knowing the schema, you cannot deserialize a raw bytes to an object. This is where the schema registry is very, very good. So instead of putting the schema in the message itself every time, they keep it in the schema registry and that's what the beauty is. So the Avro serializer will store the schema details into the registry and simply include an ID of the schema in the message record, not the complete schema. When the uh, deserializer receives a message, it will take the schema ID, gets the registry from the schema registry. And once we have the schema and the registry, you can go ahead and deserialize it. Okay. So that's why we have got uh, to start with, we will work with your agro producer and the consumer example. I have already shared those things with your friends. So if you look at your day three, you have got agro producer. Agro producer has got agro producer dot Java. There is a Avro tools file that I would need to convert the AVSC file where the structure is into a .java file. Okay, so we will primarily have a AVSC file. And if you look at this AVSC file, <coughs> just once again. The throat went bad, that's why get yeah, friends, no worries. So the AVC file will have the structure in a JSON format. So I've got a record, the name of the record is click record, and I'm having fields in the form of session ID, the browser, the campaign, the channel, the referrer, and the IP. So I've got about six fields over here. The business will continue with the six fields for some period of time and we already have got a way how we can convert it into a uh, .java file with Avro tools. We will see it in our code so, friends. So Venkat, that is manually created, the AVSC file has to be manually That's correct. 
That's correct because it's a JSON file, right? So we will create the AVSC file manually and then using the Avro tools, when you compile it, you'll automatically get a .java file friend. That's the way how we do it. Right? Okay, and how about the headers to this message? So that's about the message body, right? So hmm. if I'm no. adding... See, header, here, I'm, here I'm having a flat file, my dear. So okay, this open a, this flat file. Yeah. So this is my click record. That means the body message which I want to put on Kafka, right? This That's is my, this is how my Kafka message will look like. But if I want to add key value pairs on the header or my hey, message, hey, hey, hey. the message is only the value. The key is something that you can add separately, right? The key will not be there in the JSON file, my dear. That need not be in. Okay. In okay. The That's file. right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be a separate file, my dear. Okay. Sure. So I have got this file with me now. So this is what is the folder structure, what I showed you of the files that we have, the producer. So the Java file, the SBT file, that is the way how I'll compile something. Okay, this is like a Maven and that's what it is. In fact, using the confluent.io Maven package and the dependencies, etc. And you will have the uh, Avro file, uh, sorry, you will have the uh, AVSC file also. So these are the, four files that is important over here okay and that is what i'm having it in the diagram here the first one is a java code this is a jar file that will convert the avsc file to a java file the svt file is for adding dependencies and the avsc file is the structure in a json format what we're doing so what we will have to do is we'll have to convert the avsc file to a java file so i will use java minus jar the name of my jar file, I'll compile the schema that is called as clickrecord.avsc. The most important thing is the dot at the end of it, okay? Once you do that, you will automatically get a dot java file, clickrecord.java that will be over there. Have a look at the java file and see how the conversion is happening here, okay? So that is what is for the producer. You'll repeat the same step for the consumer also. The consumer also has got four files. You will create the Java file. Once that is done, trust me, that's all. You will go ahead and do an SBT compile on the producer. You will go ahead and do an SBT compile on the consumer. Start the producer and uh, uh, check in the console to see if you're getting results. Yes, you will be getting the results. Go back to the consumer and you will get the results also. So this thing works. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, question. Yeah, can, you go, can you go a little uh, bit sure. on the producer side? Okay. So there is a click record dot AVSC, right? That's right. And as we said, as you said earlier, this is a schema and we need to use this command line in order to convert to Java code, right? That's correct. So the, technically both of the schemas are same and the producer and consumer is using the same schema right. uh, in order to produce and consumer. And that is the reason you have in both the locations, is it? That's because correct. Two different clients as such. No, no, two separate folders, my dear. So yeah, so I mean, what the, some is someone is producing the same message and right. someone is consuming the same message. Right. So, okay, that is the reason you have the same schema in both of the places and you're trying to compile the Java code out of it. That's okay. correct, my dear. Perfectly right. Okay. okay. Because Great. initially I was confused, like, why we have the same file. Now right, I got right. it because there's are two different systems altogether. Okay. Exactly, exactly. That's right, my dear. That's good. So no worries. So this, this ran. Now what happened is the producer said that, hey, I am going to change my schema. So if you go back over here, we have got something called as producer one. So he said that I'm going to change my schema. And then I can't force my consumer also to use the uh, same schema. He might say that, hey, uh, uh, I don't want to use that schema. I'm happy with the old one. A lot of differences will happen. So some people might want to change it. Some people might not want to change it, okay? So in such cases, let me first go to the producer one, go down to the click record 2.avsc and go down to this and show you. See here, earlier, your click, let me open up the click record also for you so that you would come to know what it is. So let me go down to your producer, open up the click record, sorry. Yeah, this one only, right click and edit with this. So this had basically six records. Now in a click record 2.avsc, it has those six records, but he's adding two more records in the form of language and your operating system, 
okay and uh, i don't want any changes to happen on the consumer side with the same code i should be able to read this so that is where the schema changes become so effective because whenever the schema changes both the parties have to go ahead and make the changes in their code right so here one guy is uh, making a change in the code and the other guy says hey i want to work with the old schema only uh, you can continue to work with that here so this is the new code and in the new code let me go back to my document in the new code you will go ahead and again recreate the java file from the avsc file okay and then do an sbt compile and an sbt run the beauty is that you will see the new record also coming back on the old consumer of course something would be different in that but then you would be able to see the record changes so as long as you have got a schema registry which is going to keep a track of the schema that you're going to use and how you're going to do that you can keep on changing the record i don't have to worry at all okay so this typically happens when we are there in a schema evolution kind of a phase we are starting with a project we don't know how the schema is we can keep on changing the schema over a period of time it changes so this is what is the beauty of uh, the new schema coming up and the things and and seeing how it would go about with it okay so we have we are having two producers but we are having only one consumer so this is um so this is mainly like if you're adding additional attributes which are probably optional then it it really doesn't matter no no one, one more thing it's optional but then the moment i go with a new schema how will the old consumer get my new schema my dear by default in java no it, it doesn't because you have to actually do a recompile meaning your consumer has to use the new schema to compile and generate yeah. the code uh, exactly 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 but here you see i don't have to do that basker the beauty is uh, so, so no, you don't have to do it because uh, the uh, the message you are publishing is not breaking it's like a, it's satisfying what was there so you are publishing additional like records right that's a true to also look at the code there is a small modification i have done it in the code also so look at the code just once again so if you look at the java file let me go down to the uh, producer look at the java file let me open this so the first thing is in the serializer i'm using the api for the kafka avro serializer then i am uh, keeping the registry url this is something new that i'm having which is going to be running on 8081 and then i am passing my id my channel my ip to the consumer okay this is what is the first producer let me show the second producer to you my dear let me go back to the second producer okay and this also i am opening up my java code okay so in that java code you see here that see the first one i was doing only id channel and set ip in the second one i'm doing my id channel ip language and os so some people might say that yes you have made some and the third one also so uh, the people might say hey that's okay i'm not interested in those uh, new attributes what you are doing but i still want to go ahead with this so that is what is the beauty of this avro doing wherein the code doesn't break just because one party has changed it my dear that's what i was trying to prove here basker yeah yeah got it so it's like in the xsd xml xsd way you are adding additional attribute which you are saying that ignore ignore your additional attribute yeah because i don't want to use this additional attribute so i'll ignore it yeah. but uh, but then i don't i will not be forced to change my code because you know that uh, in the earlier languages you were forced to change the code right that will not happen here dear that's why yeah got it so okay yep. can you can, can you go to the first producer once again the java yeah yeah, yeah sure there we go right? can you go to the topic name on top this is going to be avro clicks and can you go to the second one That same topic problem. right yeah so i, I think I, i kind of didn't found one question the so the thing was we are publishing to the same topic right yeah, that's when right. both the producer are, are running both of them will be producing two different messages one is of right. the old code syntax and one is of the new syntax right? that's correct that's correct but the consumer is going to consume only the old one and it is going to ignore the new one 
No, no, no. It will that see at least it is able to read right in the normal Java syntax. You know that if the uh, uh, syntax is changed, if it is recompiled, the schema has changed. Uh, it won't even read it. Yes, I don't want to uh, use additional properties. I fully agree. Yeah. I, I'm not interested in these two lines. I'm only interested in what you were doing earlier. But then that will not help, and he will have to again recompile his code, right? So what I'm trying to show you is with the aggro with the schema registry, the beauty is that I don't have to, the old Java code, what he has done, it will still work with my new updates. So yeah. unless if it is needed, the producer can keep on changing new codes, my dear. And this makes the interaction between the two systems in a fantastic way. That's what I was trying yeah. to prove here, Vijay. As long as the initial schema data elements are still passing, Right. And the consumer can still consume them, even though additional elements are being added, is what you're saying, right? Exactly. Exactly, Vijay. That's what I was saying, my dear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do over here and see how this happens. And this will happen only thanks to the schema registry URL that is over there. So what Confluent has done is it has open source that and you can actually download the Confluent uh, at the new library also and we can work with that. So what we will do next is we will immediately tell you to, at the latest stage, we'll tell you to download the library while we're discussing it and we will uh, work with 5.3.1 which is going to be something new that is required for the other packages. So that is the latest stage. But this is the code that we are going to run right now. Understand what we're doing and see that you are comfortable with it. Okay, so that's great. So let me just go back to the code. I think that's all what we have for this exercise. Just to let you know that I think uh, the EDS team, uh, they are planning to move towards Avro, but uh, probably maybe next okay. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, uh, just one second, Bhaskar. If they are moving to Avro, uh, are they talking about the schema getting changed very frequently? Is that the reason, dear? Uh, no, I, I don't know the reasons. Okay, so, that's so okay. There is a thing, right? To EDS team, we will be providing our clip and uh, offer details. So, uh, which are you guys will be providing offer details in future. We will be providing the clip details, right? Clip and my list. So, we, if we change our version of the object, uh, that's why they want to keep the versioning because they are the consumers. Yeah. So we have to start. Uh, we were playing one story, so we'll start using Evro now. It looks great for you guys. It was a royal bouncer for me. No worries. But then that's how you are actually talking about the implementation level. So fully appreciate that, uh, Paris. But then since I was not knowing much about it, it got a little bit above my head. But that's okay. So, so, it was just to give a context to others, right? Why, why they were not using before and why why the EDIS team needs to use EDIS, uh, the Evro now, the versioning. Yeah. No, see, Avro is typically used when the schema frequently keeps on changing. So yeah, it, it may be right because they are consolidated data gathering, right? So okay, they, okay. they were enterprise data integration service tool. So okay, all the enterprise okay. data will go to them. That's EDIS. And okay. if if they if they do not understand what version is coming, because the APIs will keep changing, right? Right. And the data okay. will keep producing to the API. Okay. So okay. they have to they have to be aware about what version of data they are consuming. Okay, okay, makes sense. Now it makes sense here. So that is so just sense. one real quick question. Uh, so the reason why the consumer isn't bringing in the new attributes is because it's not connected to the registry, because the new producer is putting those new changes into the registry. Correct? No, that's correct. But then the code is not breaking. The what I'm doing is that from the new record, I'm taking the new details what I'm having because I'm still using the registry. I'm getting the necessary uh, schema details from the registry. Even from the new record, I will only pick up the information what I want because that is what was there in the consumer. Consumer initially was retrieving only some inf some information, and he'll continue to do that even though the producer is keeping on changing the record spot. So that's what is the beauty over here. Okay. Uh, so, so, so just to summarize, Scott, uh, uh, first the producer in Agro producer one send in some details. The schema was over there. The client went over there and he read that detail. Now the producer said, hey, I want to change the API. 
So just because you change the code in a normal uh, programming kind of a scenario, whenever I change the code, uh, uh, even the consumer has to change the code. Even though he's not interested in the new record, he will still have to change the code. But uh, since we are using a schema registry, he is not interested in the new code, but he wants to pick up the new records from what the, the new code of the producer. That is what is uh, made possible with the help of schema changes. Uh, Scott, make sense? Hey, hey Venkat, I think uh, uh, even today EDA or the, the team still change the schema, but it, since the XSD which they are using is uh, such that it can allow uh, additional uh, objects without breaking, so that's why uh, we are not impacted even with the current XML way of uh, publishing from uh, EDAs. So in, in other words, uh, the same similar uh, capability is there in the XML world. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't break things in the JSON either, right? If you add new attributes to a JSON and my Java reads it in, it's just going to ignore the new ones. Yes. So I think the main benefit here is if they add new additional fields, that consumer can read that schema in the registry and they can populate the new fields. I think that's the main benefit. Yeah, you, you have to regenerate your code. Uh, Normally, yeah. to get the new fields. But in this case, you don't have to, to get the new fields. But the old ones, it's going to ignore. It's going to ignore the new ones anyways. So, what would happen, uh, Bhaskar and Scott, in case if I change the existing fields? I'm not adding any new fields. I'm changing the structure of the existing fields. What would happen then? That will break, actually. That would break, yeah. Okay, that would there break. is... Whereas in this case, that should not break also, because with the schema registry coming in, I think it should still pick up the uh, new values. Although the right. producer has changed, uh, because of the schema being there, I should still be able to pick it up over here. That's exactly. It's just your this. example that you gave us doesn't really highlight that, right? It just shows you adding new fields. But if you changed mm -hmm. the actual data types of the right. existing fields, that would have made more sense, right? True, 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 true. Yeah, because I didn't think from that perspective, and since uh, what Vasca said in the existing thing, uh, even with the changing the thing, the consumer doesn't have to change. When I created this example long back, uh, I was under the assumption that when we go ahead and make a change in the code, even consumer, even though there was no changes, just some new fields were added at the end of the existing uh, schema using JSON, that would also break. In fact, it broke for me in the examples that I did. I need to go back and check why it broke. But uh, Bhaskar just mentioned that, hey, that uh, uh, it need not break. So that's the reason I continued with this example. But what you're saying is good. Next time, what I'll try to do is add a little bit changes into the code and shows that this will still work. Uh, right. Yeah, OK. That's good. Yeah, great. Sure, Bhaskar. Thanks, Bhaskar. So let's quickly go ahead and try this. It's about uh, uh, 10, 21 year time. So we'll give you about 15 minutes to see uh, how this is running. And then actually go ahead and uh, uh, demo that code for you guys. And uh, I think we should hit our break time also. So let's see. Let's see for about 10, 15 minutes to see how far it is running for you. Then take up a quick break and then continue. Thank you, friends. So, uh, Venkat, this code is not present in the virtual box, right? We have to download it from the shared drive and... That's right. You'll have to download it from your day three folder. You're right, Fred. So if you go down to the link I have given, day three, so it is there over there. All the three files are there in day three. Okay. That's surprising. Paras was saying that Agro producer is getting the data but the consumer is not printing. Okay. So let me stop sharing. And if you don't mind, if you can just share your screen, dear, so that we can see what is happening. Thank you. Okay, so this is all done. And so I know the reason part, so I ran into the same thing. Uh, basically what happened, like I started my consumer, I forgot to start the schema registry. So then I started a schema registry and then I did the producer. It didn't work. So I restarted consumer after the schema registry was up. That oh. made it work. Okay, okay, maybe that's the case. Okay, just try doing that once, uh, Paras. So thanks for that because uh, uh, the, 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 the use case, the sequence, what he did was a little bit different, you know? So that was it. So thanks, buddy. That really helped because otherwise we have to look at the code and see what was happening. So start with the schema registry and then start with the uh, consumers again. It should work, my dear. 
that's right. That's okay, I think it's, well, it's an error. I don't know what happened. The beekeeper is running, the Kafka server should be running, and the uh, schema registry also should be running. So, Jupiter is running now. Okay. Can you just confirm in all the three prompts that it is running? So, we we'll know for sure that it's already done. No, something is wrong here. Okay. Just do a JPS and uh, be sure that, uh, yeah, nothing is running. So start with the zookeeper. Okay, perfect. So wait for a couple of seconds. Let, yeah, it's already started. Start with the uh, yeah server. That's right. Clear. Perfect. Yeah, etc. Yeah, server dot properties. That's correct. Let's wait. Yeah, that looks to be okay. Now start the schema registry. That's okay. Reduce the impact to console. That's good. Now start your consumer. Okay. Okay. Start your producer. Get SBT. Okay. Clear SBT one. Then we can start with your producer one also. We'll just wait. Okay, what is this? Multiple process detected. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Now try it in the consumer. Yeah, it came. Now try the second producer with the consumer still running. Yep, good. Perfect. No, no need to run this. You already done it. No, up, 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 up. So we'll have to uh, compile the classes and see that. No worries, take your time. You can, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's what you have to do. So I'll just stop the sharing. So carry on, no worries. I'll just go back to my screen. So just wanted to check with you, Gaurav. Were you able to finish with it? Yeah, I was able to finish with it. I got the second, uh, the, uh, the version two also works. That's yeah, good. That's good. Also. That's good. So Paras would be able to do that. I'll just quickly wait for about another five minutes for others to see that, and then we will take a break at around eleven, five, eleven, ten, depending upon where you are. And uh, for fifteen minutes, once we come back, I will demo it on my screen and show how the whole thing is running here. That's what the plan is. Once it's done, Paras, just give me a confirmation so that I know that it's done. Others, please try it out here. Thank you. Just meeting myself. So uh, one quick question. So the consumer doesn't error errors out like if the schema registry is down or uh, something is not available. 
No, uh, uh, you see the consumer would work only when, in case of the schema registry is an optional component, right? So when the schema registry was down, uh, the consumer won't error out because he simply wouldn't get the schema and it didn't match. That's why it did not print anything, Kara. It wouldn't error out. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, heard something in the chat. Okay, fantastic. Paras is also able to see that. That's good. So with just a quick confirmation, Vinay, uh, what about you, Vinay? Were you able to read the first part? How was it? Yep, the so first part is done. Yep. Okay. So I, I have a question on that one, actually. So can, you, can I see that um, build.spt file? Actually, yeah. how, I, I'm new to the scholar. So how it is working? Um, the build that once again, this is the ABSC file. So let me open up the SPT file. Okay, yeah. there we go. Okay, so when you look at this file, this is the way how you specify the name of the application, which Scala version to run, and these okay. are all the dependencies what you're having and what version. Very similar okay. to Maven, okay. but the only thing is that we specify what things we want and see it. So in the second okay. example, it's a little bit more lengthier. So I'll show okay. that to you also. Once again, okay. let me go back to this. So when you run uh, run SPT, mm -hmm. so it, it it's executing the producer or how it is working? This what is the link between the producer and this? Uh, hey, 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 hey. The, the crux in Scala mm -hmm. is that you will have one Java code in the package, and when you say yeah. SPT compile, it will simply run the Java code. That's the idea, friend. Right? Okay. So you will typically have one Java code in a project. You're not going to have multiple codes. And of course, there's a way how you can run the codes. But then the de facto behavior is when you say SPT compile and run, I'm simply compiling the Java code and I'm simply running it. Okay. The SPT will be uh, used for the uh, metadata description to see what all things you have to download and all that. The same way okay. as your form.xml file is used, right? So that's the way how okay. it works here. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. okay, fantastic. So, guys, what we can do is, I think uh, others should also be able to see it. So, let's take up a quick break right now. And uh, once we come back, I'll show the whole thing on my screen so that you can see how the working will be. So, we have started with our exercise 12. This is going to be working with uh, Avro producer. This once again, producer and Avro consumer and adding a new producer and ensuring that the data will pass to the uh, consumer. That's the whole idea. Okay. So people have actually tried it out. Okay. So what I will do is we'll take up a quick break and post lunch, we will come back and then do this. Okay. I mean, at the post tea break, not lunch, post tea break. So let's take up our uh, tea break uh, till, let me look at the time zone. It's about 35. So till about uh, uh, 10 50, we will take up a break, guys, and we will start off at around uh, 10 50 your time. So tea break till. 10 50 your time. Okay, thank you guys, and see you back in about 15 minutes. Just meeting myself. If there's anything, feel free to put it in the chat and we can discuss this with us. Thank you. Okay, hey guys, uh, back again. So let's go ahead and start with the hands on part of it to see how it was running. So uh, we saw that Gaurav and Paras uh, were able to do that. So just wanted to check Vijay, were you able to finish up with the complete example, Vijay? Yeah. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. And uh, others, I presume you would be doing that because uh, if you do that, it will be helpful to your friends. Okay, great. So now let's go ahead and do the complete uh, example on my machine so that you can see also how the things would work. So to start with, I have already got the Zookeeper running for uh, Confluence. I have got the Kafka server running for Confluence and uh, that's all. So I'm going to start with the schema registry here. Just once again.
back again folks so let me start with the schema registry so let me go here cd lab software confluent and uh, that's it so let me see how i can start my schema registry let me go up and uh, start with the schema registry there we go so <clears throat> this is that command i want to ensure that it is running in one line so that i wouldn't have an issue close the other windows that is not necessary for this example there we go and that's okay that's good it's running in one line so let me copy this and run my schema registry over here that's okay so see the schema registry would be started and that, that's good so all the three uh, components that is required for running this uh, average example is ready now uh, i will check with the jps if uh, things are all good yep the schema registry is already started so if i do a jps i would see that uh, the schema registry main is also running so the core peer main that is a zookeeper and the supported kafka is also running so clear all good let me go down to the next step in the example so that is what is the serialization part so i am going to copy all the three codes to my uh, program files so let me go down to the location where i have got that that would be your kafka uh, just once again <clears throat> let me click on the names and so that you learn kafka day three so all these three files i am bringing it to my programs directory okay so that uh, i can easily run from there it's just copying okay so the files are over there so first let me go down to the producer and i have got let me remove the desktop that i have got everything the consumer and uh, the oops sorry close this i did the edit button that's why and uh, let me go down to the con uh, producer one and delete and walk it there. okay that's good so all the files are okay so now i will have to go to the next step <laughs> we are going to go ahead with the abro producer one example so let me go back to the prompt and uh, cd enter lab programs abro producer and ls minus l i have got my things over here so let me copy this java minus jar command and then convert the avsc file into a java file right click press enter and you see that it's done let me do a ls minus l to confirm it's done that's good let me do a cat on the click record dot java so you see here how the uh, java file is created with the necessary attributes and all that a lot of code will be there so that is what it's uh, doing okay so for the agro part of it all those things are done so just wanted to show that to you let me do it clear the next step that i have to do is um, i have to do the same thing for the consumer also so let me go down to the consumer afro consumer okay and run the same code for the consumer also java minus jar okay and let me do ls minus l so i have got the java file also created so that's good so I've got both the Java files created. Now let me run the code with SVT compile and SVT run. So let me go here, open up another one more command prompt, duplicate session where my consumer will be running. A username is not food, password is adult123, lab, programs, agro, consumer. Let me go down to the pretty user cd agro producer and let me say sbt compile so this will compile the code and uh, it will go ahead let's wait for a couple of seconds 
I can start it on the second window, but it won't start uh, immediately because it's uh, like a blocking call as with the compile. I think it's good to run as a blocking call. I just want to be sure about that. Just once again. So my compiler is starting. And let it continue. It's updating the project, etc. And in the meantime, the second compile is not. Yes, compile will start. I think it's a run that is a blocking call. Okay. So both the compiles are happening. That's good. For your agro producer and for your consumer. Let's wait. So it's done updating for the producer, whereas for the consumer also they done updating. Yeah, it's loading the setting right now. Let it finish. I just wait till the time the compile completes. Let me go down to the consumer. Yeah, see, that's what it said. Waiting for lock to be available. Because when you're updating it, it will wait for a lock. It started with the things, but it will wait for the lock. So now the first guy has to finish. And then the second guy can start. Both do not run at the same time. So the producer will be done first. Let's just wait. Once it's done, I can go ahead and say SPT run, see how it happens. Then start with the second guy producer. Just wait for some time here. Right here. Good, it's downloading the necessary files. It should be finished soon. Yep, it has done the compiling. Yep, and now the second one will start with it. That has done the compiling. So both the programs are compiled. So now let me do it clear. I will do SPT run on the producer. And I'll start with the consumer also and say SPT run. I should have started with the consumer first. That's okay because uh, then I will see the message, right? So that's important. That's a load the project definitions and then it will run. Just meeting you, Brandon. So, yep, yeah, so it is running the producer. Yeah, it is complete. Go ahead with the consumer. <coughs> Okay, nothing happened. So let me run the producer once again. There we go. I should have run the producer, a consumer first and then the producer. So do an SPT run so that you will see the details coming in the consumer. Let's just wait. The producer is running and this will be for the first schema that we have. And then we will go ahead and run our uh, agro producer too. We need to compile so that the ABC file will be converted to a Java code and then go ahead. There we go. 
And now I should see here, see here, I'm getting the session ID, the channel and the referrer. Uh, that was in null because we didn't have a referrer in the code. Now let's go back to the other program and start with my Avro producer one. So Avro, oh, sorry, CD dot dot, CD Avro producer one and uh, ls minus l i need to convert this into the uh, this one what you call java code so let me go back to the cheat sheet and let me execute that part there we go this is uh, 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 click record two so let me just paste it over here for the time being and I will say click record two dot ABSC. So control C. Let me go back to the producer one. And if I do a ls minus L, I should see the dot Java file. That's good. So still click record dot Java. And then I will do SBT compile for this guy so that uh, I can directly do the run. I'm compiling my producer one. Producer two is still active. There you go. He got the first message. And now let me go back to the code and uh, compile it and run it. And that will be shown on the second video. So that's the purpose of a schema interchange, what we did, just to give you an idea about how things are and what are the steps that we need to do. So you can you should look at it from your uh, or the actual project to see where we are going to do and how we are going to do. Of course, I can show that with a, a change in the schema also, but I just added two new elements and uh, shown that. So the compiling for the second one is happening. There we go. So when the consumer need not be aware about the schema version, right? That's correct, because the consumer will be getting that from the schema registry. Okay. In, 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 Implicitly, internally, we are internally. Not writing no. anywhere in the code. No, okay. no you, you don't have to do that. That's, that's the way. Sure. Now, let me do SPT run. The compilation has happened. So I will say SPT run. And it should execute this, and I should see the output uh, on the consumer console. That's the whole idea. A couple of seconds. So with this, what we have done is we have finished off with uh, the uh, basic examples of Kafka that was uh, to be done. And uh, now we will be going down to the top. Yeah, good. It is running the click producer two that is finished. And now if I see, show the second consumer, you will see that it is because the, it was the same data. Of course, you can change the data, the session ID and all that. You know that it has changed. So for the first one, it was null. And for the second one, it was not. So you can go back and see how that would happen. So I didn't do any change at all in my consumer. And I saw this also. So uh, like what we had mentioned, since it was already possible that the uh, schema changes can happen, I will try to do a little bit change in the code for the next exercise. Uh, when I do it with the next client, I will well do that so that it will become more clear. So that was a, a value add that I got from this course from your side, telling me that if I can change it, that will make it more relevant and see how it can be done. Fantastic code. So let me close this, control C, let me go back to the, the Avro producer also do, it's already closed. Now I would want to close my other windows. Okay, so the version four dot, that's all that we are going to do right now. So I will do a control C on my schema registry. I'll do a control C on my uh, Kafka server. And finally, I'll do a control C on my Zookeeper. So that when I do a JPS, I see that nothing is running here, okay? So if you look at it, uh, in about the two hours of today, we had finished off with the uh, complete Kafka yesterday. What all are the ways, how we I do it with the Confluent Kafka. Now, what you need to do specifically is to increase the memory, guys. So the things that we're going to do right now would be a lot of configuration changes, okay? So we will talk about Kafka Connect. 
we will talk about k is equal we will set up our land do l a n d o o p that environment and there's a lot of configuration work that we need to do the reason why we are doing it is so that everybody would have done this configuration changes on a system and he knows how the things would be working i fully agree it is going to be the devops team who is going to set it up for you and you would just need to read the messages but what would happen is that there is a lot of gaps in between and you wouldn't know how to set up the whole thing in your own environment so that is what the whole idea is to set it up in your environment okay so let's uh, move on so now uh, uh, you will have to close the image and change the memory to about 7 gb okay so that it will run a little bit faster because you need to download some files you need to do a lot of configuration kind of a work that's what the uh, devops team would ideally be doing but then it is important because this is rel related to your line of product you would know what is actually happening without being in a black hole so that is what was the objective of your team and they said that we need to cover this topics and see how that can be done okay so we have done that so let me go back to the doc to uh, start with our things. So we will be talking about Kafka Connect. Set it up basically in our system and ensure that your memory is changed to 7 GB before even we start the installation. Okay. And then we will talk about what is KSQL and then a small example of K streams. Okay. So that's what the idea is. Now, if you look at the history of Kafka, uh, Kafka got started with Confluent primarily with the objective of replicating the way how the streaming data can be done and uh, that is what was the most popular reason why Kafka uh, came out. I told you in, in the earlier session, in the earlier two days also, there has been a major change from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. So in 0 0.9, they removed uh, the dependency on the Zookeeper a lot. And uh, with the Bootstrap server, they put it back into Kafka because there was a lot of issues. And it was in about uh, two, four years back, Kafka Connect API started coming out. Then in 2016, in 0.10, your Kafka stream started coming out. And then in the next version in 2017, about uh, two and a half years back, uh, the Connect API was improved. And a lot of people are doing this extensively in the market right now, friends. So if you look at the Confluent API, there are three new things that is coming up. So just wanted to show this to you. So, uh, just one second, this one. So when you start with your Confluent, that is 5.3.1, I think so. Just give me one second. Uh, let me go down to software. Yeah, 5.3.1. You have got your Zookeeper, Kafka, and Schema Registry. That's a default. The first two are the defaults. Schema Registry is a new baby. Uh, Kafka REST is there. Then you have got Connect, your KSQL, and your Control Server. Okay? So a lot of new things is what is coming up in your Confluent, and it is keeping on increasing day by day. Also, as a personal suggestion is, if you go down to your YouTube, there's a lot of events that is being held for Kafka, and the YouTube uh, shows all the events of Confluent over there. A very strong suggestion would be to look at those events and see what all are the new things what they're bringing up. Okay, so strong suggestion. That is an area where you can start learning a lot right now. So now what we will be talking about is let's talk about the new components that we have uh, in your uh, Kafka. So the first thing that you will have is something called as the Connect API. So let's talk a little bit about the Connect API. <clears throat> so we saw the history of Kafka. So primarily, uh, there are four common Kafka use cases. You take the source of data and put it into Kafka. That is why you are producer API. That is where the default uh, Kafka Connect source will be. It can talk to a, a variety of sources. Then you can move it from Kafka and then push it into do some further transformation of the data and put it into Kafka. That is where Kafka streams will come, where both the producer and the consumer API are in touch. And finally, you can take it from Kafka and then put it to a final source. That is what is called as a sync. OK, 
okay so these things are primarily coming in from uh, the other components that we have in the market already okay so if you look at uh, the uh, the apis what is already there in the market for real time processing so if you look at real time processing yes we are using kafka as a way how we can process the data but then the other options for real time processing is other options that we have in the market is a product called as apache storm so uh, i don't know whether you guys are using that and then you have got something called as apache flink so flink is basically a 4G fourth generation language uh, uh, that we have, and this is what is very popular. So Apache Storm and Apache Flink is what is used by JP, okay, and uh, the other banks. So just checking up with you, uh, Paras or Gaurav or Baskar or anybody who's there, are you using Apache Storm or Apache Flink, guys? I'm I'm not aware of that, but uh, yeah, I not about other teams, yeah not with our application team uh, maybe integration team but we are not sure okay okay that's okay because that is what is really used in the market friends so if you talk, talk about your storm and your fling that those are the things that you can really use so this is the way how the standard kafka use cases are done now why do i need the kafka connect because programmers would want to take the data from your databases, from your JDBC, from your NoSQLs, that is what is going to be your Couchbase and the Golden Gate, SAP HANA, your blockchains, your Cassandra, DynamoDB, in the form of FTP, IoT, your MongoDB, your MQTT, RethinkDB, Salesforce, from a variety of sources, programmers want to import data from, and they want to store the data into the sinks. Let it be S3, let it be Elasticsearch, HDFS, JDBC, DocumentDB, or it could be anything. And uh, it was attached to achieve tough. There's a small typo here, at U U G H. It is tough uh, to uh, achieve fault tolerance. And uh, the beauty of Kafka Connect is it is the first source that gives you exactly one kind of a scenario. Okay, so exactly once distribution and ordering to be done. Friend. Okay, so just wanted to check with you. If you're not aware, I can just give you the very basics of those things. So when we talk about no sequels, okay. So just checking up with you guys. Are you using some no sequels right now, or that is again not being used much? Anybody, friend? We we are using. That's good. Custom That's good. Video. Okay, okay. So when we talk about NoSQLs, there are four types of NoSQLs that you have to look at. The first type of NoSQL is going to be your columnar databases. And this is where you use your edge base. And some teams I was told is using edge base. And you can use something called as Cassandra. That is a columnar database. Then you will have something called as a key value pair database. And that is where you will be using something called as Redis. So Redis is something that has been used extensively by JP right now. Okay. So Redis and React are the two popular key value stores that has been used. The third one is what is going to be called as document type of databases. And the most popular one, uh, which I know you guys are using it, is called as MongoDB. Because uh, you wanted in the last class a very detailed example of how you can read from Spark and put it into MongoDB. I've shown them a demo uh, of how we can actually do that. We set up MongoDB and we said that uh, we want to persist the data from our Spark kind of, from our local system via Spark. I want to ingest that into Mongo. So that has been used a lot, I know. And then we have got something called as graph databases. So graph databases is not used much by you folks right now, but that is also coming up in a big way. And uh, the biggest one is called as Neo4j. And then you're looking at Titan, which is a Java-based kind of way, no SQL. 
So these are the four NoSQLs, what is there. And uh, from what I know, uh, folks, is uh, Mongo is being used. So just wanted to check, are you using Cassandra also, uh, Buster? Any update on that? Or anybody friends? Yes, our team uses Cassandra extensively. Hey, that's great. Good, good for us. So are you using any of the other types also for us? That is a graph, a columnar. Yeah. So we using Redis and Cassandra. Fantastic. Redis and Cassandra. That's right. So because you are not focused on the uh, Hadoop part of it for a long time, uh, for some reason, uh, you guys didn't look at it for a long time. For that reason, edge base was not there and you're looking at Cassandra because edge base from the banking environment, they are moving away from the traditional ETL kind of a layer into edge base and they're using extensively edge base. So they're using, and, and what about key values? Ever heard about something called as Redis, uh, uh, Paris? Yes, I told you, right? We're using Redis. Ah, okay, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, got it, yeah, in memory. I thought you said Cassandra and Mongo, I missed Redis. Cassandra okay. and Redis. That's good, that's good. Okay, so you're not using Mongo. That is something weird in your uh, system because some people are really using Mongo and that's what the roadmap is to start with it. So uh, I definitely remember giving yeah. the example how to do it. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, there, there are a few teams which are using Mongo. Okay, but what about graph databases? Have you ever looked at graph databases and seen that for us? Uh, no, we don't have a use case right now for this. So we're not using it. Okay, okay, that's perfect. But then graph is a wonderful way with Neo4j, uh, the way how uh, multiple people, if they're connected to each other and how to find it out, LinkedIn uses graph a lot. So that is what, uh, how the different things would be, okay? So I think the suggestion team is using graph. Okay, okay, okay. One so, of the team is nothing to do with our side, but I had seen a demo or something. That's right. Yeah, because they wanted to integrate multiple different components and see if there would be a relationship between people and they can join together. So that would make sense. So these are the different no sequels what we have and see how they can work with us. So that is what is the beauty of Kafka Connect. You can take it from any one of the no sequels and put it into the other no sequels and achieve the fault tolerance and all of those things. So this is uh, the, just to understand the uh, use case. So you, you are saying that Kafka Connect can directly connect to your database, read from a table, post yeah. it into your Kafka, and have it pushed into your another uh, database. Is, is that what the use case is? Oh, no, not another database. It could be a sync. So just one okay. second. So, so look at this. So you will have multiple sources. You will have your Kafka Connect architecture, which is in the form of a worker node. You will connect it, push it into Kafka, wherein you can do the processing in uh, Kafka itself, or you can use a streams uh, API and then connect it to the uh, sources. They can put it, uh, do the processing, push it back into the broker, and again via the worker, you can put it into different things. So the Kafka Connect is an ability by which I will be able to connect to multiple things and then start doing it. So the basic crux of the thing is that uh, move away from the normal database kind of a perspective and move into NoSQL, which you guys are already doing. And I might not want to do a lot of things in NoSQL. I want to do it in Kafka in real time. All this processing don't really need to put into a database. And that's where the uh, connect and the ST API would be done. So if you look over here, the first, the middle two layers is what is the connect API. And the last layer is where the stream API would be there. That's what Kafka really does it in a better way. So the idea is to do some further processing and then putting it into a way how I can definitely put it into a, a sync also. Or the beauty is I can go ahead and start working with my S3 as a platform and then work with that uh, faster. That's the whole idea for could you give like a, some real like real life example? Um, Very much. Very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's talk about a JP use case. So what they do over there is uh, they have got streaming data that is coming in from the upstreams. Okay. They use the Kafka Connect uh, uh, API wherein uh, they will get those data from the various sources. Uh, the data can be coming in from multiple sources. Uh, uh, do some processing of the data. Put it into a Kafka cluster. 
Okay, and Kafka cluster is a way how we can store it for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and 120 days. Okay, and in the Kafka cluster also, I want to process that data within about five minutes of time. So that's where streams comes in. They process the data and they keep it over there. Then multiple people will start looking at those things. If you want to persist it in some other location, again, via the connect uh, cluster, they can push it into a sink and they're storing it into, primarily they have got a very, very huge account with uh, Amazon. So they are working with your Amazon S3 and then putting the data over there. So taking the data and then doing the processing in Kafka itself. Traditionally, this is what was happening traditionally. So you have got your source of data you will uh, pick that data and then put it into your HDFS. And in your HDFS, you will process the data. And that is where you say HDFS or Spark. Okay, you will process the data and then you will uh, <coughs> give it to some sync that is what is a data store. Okay, it's not necessarily a database. It could be a NoSQL data store or S3 wherein you will process the data. So instead of doing it like this, what Kafka does right now is you get the data from a source. I don't want you to put it into HDFS because Kafka itself can retain the data. So earlier, what was happening is that there was no in-memory processing. There was nothing that was happening. In-memory processing came only in 2014 with your Apache Spark. And talking about the earlier period. So you have to store it to HDFS. Now, I don't have to do that. I can go ahead and use uh, uh, Kafka Connect store it into Kafka for some uh, period of time, okay? And then if needed, you can put it into a sync and you can start processing it. So this is the way how the banks are using Kafka Connect to see how we can go ahead with it. And Kafka is used as a place where I can persist the data for some period of time. It's not like a messaging queue. It's similar to a messaging queue, but messaging queue, once the consumers read the message, the data goes away, right? Whereas in Kafka, the data is still persistent uh, over their bus time. So that's the whole idea, friend. Venkat, one, one quick question, Venkat. Yeah, tell me, Vinay. Uh, so there are two components that you explained here, right? Kafka Connect and Kafka, isn't it? Right. Right. So right now, even with the connect, we know that there are some settings saying that the messages are going to result, uh, be stored in the Kafka topic for a period of default seven days as a That's storage, correct. right? That's correct. So is Kafka connect as well a kind of data store which is file system or is it has a data storage behind the scenes? No, Kafka Connect is just a, a kind of a source from where you connect the data and then it won't store the data. You will have to store the data in Kafka only, my dear. It is a way how, let me go back to the diagram. See over here, it's a way how you can take the data from a source push it into your uh, cluster and you can do this in a much more better way and then do that. And again, take the data from Kafka and then put it into a sync. If you want to do some uh, a stream based processing, you can do it at the other layer of Kafka, do the processing, keep it because we know that we are going to keep the data in Kafka for some period of time, right? The default is seven days, but in the real world, it will be there for more number of days also. So that's the whole thing. So if you want to connect to the sources, one way is what you know, you're directly reading into Kafka. So instead of doing it like this, you can put it into your Kafka connect architecture and then see that. So see over here, you will have multiple ready-made connectors. Okay. The beauty is that you have got ready-made connector, which is already available. So I really don't have to have a way how I need to load it into Kafka here. The connector takes care of all of that, uh, friend. I mean, uh, we are going to avoid the boilerplate code is what you're trying to say, right? If he's That's connected. correct. That's correct. The connectors okay. make a, will do a wonderful job in trying to get the source, get the data. Once I get the data, push it on into Kafka, let somebody else process the data because all data is immutable, right? So pass on the data to a stream so that they can process it. They do some ETL kind of operations, put it back into the topic in Kafka. The old data can be removed. The new data can be persisted. And then they can also be put it into a sync because some other system might want to read it from a sync and not from a broker. If they can read it from a broker, I don't want this at all to be there. But in some business use case, I have to be there in the database so that it can be there for a longer period of time, more than 120 days, so that it can be there for a, a longer duration frame. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
So the, the point what I was trying to drive is exactly what Vijay also asked is understand the concept and see where it is going to be used. Okay, and hopefully by uh, I think by February or March of next year, uh, once you people start using it later on, uh, we are going to have a deep dive into these things. So they were saying that when when can we do that? I said that we can do it in December also, but then they said that no, December looks to be a little bit early. So somewhere in Jan and Feb of next year, when you actually start using these components, that's the time where we will actually go ahead and only on the Confluent API, that is Kafka Connect, Kafka Streams, and KSQL. We'll talk a lot about it here. I have a question. So, in this design, uh, what is the recommended number of, or like generally, like you know, uh, people like intend to use uh, the number of days to store the data in Kafka cluster? In this particular design, like connect is there. In, in this, it could be depending upon your requirement, but max of six months, you can keep the data. Frankly speaking, there is no limit onto it. You can keep it till one year also. But then if you look at the data, if you look at Hadoop and see those architectures, what was happening earlier, I'm talking about five, six years back, is that you got the data and everybody thought of, okay, let's persist the data. So if you look at this diagram, so from the source, the data came, you have to persist the data somewhere because the data will go away. That is what the fear was. So they kept on storing the data in SDFS. And now if you look at JP, we have got about seven or eight petabytes of data that is there. Yeah, the data is there, but is anybody really using it? Yes, I can use it, but practically is anybody using it? No, because with a huge amount of data, I really don't need to use that data, okay? Because I don't have a use case for it. Then they said that, hey, why should I put everything into SDFS? Can't I put it into Kafka and uh, keep it for a, uh, some period of time and the businesses would they need that? And that's how the time period of 30, 60, 90, and 120 days came. And uh, depending upon the type of data, you categorize into the duration and uh, people were starting to use that. Uh, friend. That's the whole idea, Gaurav. So you're saying like, uh, in other words, uh, Kafka is uh, just being used as a temporary database type of uh, storage, right? It is also being used as a temporary database storage. Primarily, what is Kafka? You get your data. It is an immutable copy of a data, right? Very similar to HDFS also. Even in HDFS, the data is immutable. You cannot change it once it comes. And then even in Kafka, it is immutable, right? That's what we saw the last two days. Of course, there were, we saw multiple ways of processing it. But that's what the fact is. Right, Gaurav? OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so from that perspective is where we use this new APIs and see how do you go ahead and see how they would work, maybe. Okay. Sure. So uh, we said about Kafka Connect. This is what is going to be the Connect architecture. And if you want to go ahead and look at uh, Confluent, all those things are there in Confluent. And uh, see over here. This is what is my. <clears throat> Kafka Connect. So it opened up the Kafka Connect. See what it is. So they have got very, very good documentation and all of these things. Okay. See, Kafka Connect is an open source component of Kafka. It's a framework for connecting Kafka with external systems such as databases, key value stores, search indexes, and file system. Using Kafka Connect, you can use your existing connected implementations for common data sources and syncs to move data in and out of Kafka. See, why would I use Kafka Connect? Because they have got ready-made connectors. That is what uh, uh, our friend just mentioned, just once again, uh, Vijay just mentioned. So that is what is the benefit. They have got ready-made connectors. So a source connector ingests the entire databases and stream tables, updates to Kafka topics. It can also collect metrics from all of your uh, application servers into Kafka topics, making the data available for stream processing with very low latency. The sync connectors, that is the persisted copy, they deliver data from Kafka topics into secondary indexes such as Elasticsearch or BAS systems such as Hadoop for offline analysis. So that is what is the benefit of using the Kafka Connect architecture, guys. Okay, so just giving you an overview about where things will be used and how to use it. Cool. Let's continue. So let's go back over here. We saw this, we saw this. So now, if you look at Kafka Connect, uh, the Kafka Connect cluster has multiple loaded connectors. Each connector is a simple reusable piece of Java code. 
and many connectors exist in the open source world and leverages them in a beautiful way. So the connectors plus your user configurations will be considered as task. A task is linked to a connector configuration. A job configuration may spawn multiple tasks. So if you want to connect to a particular source and see how it is, that would be a task. Tasks are executed by your Kafka Connect workers. So see over here, I said that we will have multiple workers, right? They are the people who execute this uh, task. So a worker is a single Java process and a worker can be a standalone or in a cluster mode kind of an environment. So that is what is the promise that is given by your Kafka Connect. Right? And if you look at the distributed mode of it, the way how it can work is initially, in worker one, we had connector one, and in worker one, yeah, worker four, you had connected two, and in your worker uh, uh, two, you had connector three. Okay, then you had connected two on worker two and connector two on worker three, then you had connector one, two, three, and four on four workers. Suddenly, one of the workers died. So when one of the workers died, like what you saw in the, in the customer example yesterday, it was passed on to the existing workers and the task number over here uh, moved on to this over here. And similarly, the, the task four moved on over here. So that means the workers will be able to start working with this, will be able to get down to different sources and still connect and get the stuff and, and work with it. Right? So that is what is the beauty when we talk about a distributed cluster. Okay, you might be one. Sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I have a question here. Uh, yeah. So, so you're talking about the diagonal that you're showing is a Kafka Connect cluster, right? That's correct. So, uh, sorry, I, I might be going slow. I'm not good catching up because no, no, that's I'm trying okay, to connect. Okay. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. trying to connect this one with the Kafka cluster. Okay, let's suppose okay. I have a Kafka. Mm -hmm. It can be a clone flint version of Kafka or whatever it is. Right. It has multiple brokers which are tied up to one cluster. Okay. True. Very true. And how is that cluster mapped to this connect cluster? Okay. No, the cluster is a different component. So go back over here. So that is what is going to be your broker. So what would happen when you have a broker is you should have a producer, right? What we mm -hmm. saw in the last two days, there will be a producer. So the yeah. producer is going to, the broker will be reading from a producer. So if I remove the connect cluster completely, earlier the sources was uh, being read by the broker and it was directly connected to the sources API. So this was not there at all. We were directly connecting, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. so now the question comes is, why do I need, need this? This is there so that I don't have to have my Kafka clusters talking to the brokers directly. I can That's have correct. topics, I can have topics and all those things over here. I can have some people who will do the metadata part of it. So what we're doing is we are moving from one version, we are moving upward in the hierarchy and trying to see how I reuse my components and do it in a better way. So in the second version of Kafka, what is happening is you have a source, the worker is going to read from the source and he will dump it into the broker. So that the broker is the Kafka cluster is totally disconnected from the sources part of it. He doesn't have to take care of what will happen if a source dies and all of those things. He doesn't have to bother about it. So that's what we are trying to achieve over here, uh, Vijay. Make sense so that means, uh, yeah, uh, in the earlier world, right? What our POC is that we had done in the last two days. Right. We were talking about how to replicate across multiple brokers, how to do multiple partitions, how to spin up multiple brokers to load whatever it is, right? right. That's what right. we talked about. Right. And now we're talking about we don't need to worry about because Connect is going to take care of it underlying and we just need to talk to a connector. And even that, connector, we can mm -hmm. spin up multiple worker nodes is what we were saying, right? Exactly. So, so for me as an end user or a guy who is deploying an application into productions or any perf environment or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. When I try to scale mm -hmm. to a particular volume mm -hmm. in for a running pro application or as to a brand new application, mm -hmm. I should be concerned about how many workers of a Kafka connect should be there as well as underlying Kafka broker should be there. I should be, I should be thinking about both these components, right? That's Not just right. the connect workers. 
that's correct i fully agree but then you will not be worried more about the brokers over here because the broker is not even the broker let's say a topic so i will know that the topic is going to store the data over here it's going to be the connect which is going to be in touch with the source get the data from there and then yes. pass it on to me so i don't have to but so, so what will happen over to the cluster is i don't have to bother about the broker broker uh, api at all i will only be concerned with the topic api the partitioning and those concepts so that i can focus on these areas and uh, uh, so what are we trying to do is we are moving across the responsibilities that was done by one person we are having multiple components coming down and each one of them is uh, doing a more responsibility i mean taking away my responsibility that's the idea what we are trying to have over here friend make sense okay okay yeah Uh, maybe uh, yeah, I'll as well read through just to make much more myself clear. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Got yeah. It. But, but but then that's a crux, friend. So even even when you look at architectures, earlier Hadoop came. Hadoop can do uh, HDFS, that is storage of data. It can also do processing of data. Okay. But then Spark came. So what is Spark? Spark is purely processing of data. It is not storage of data. So HDFS, we are still using Hadoop. <coughs> just one second, yeah. back again so we are still using hadoop for the storage part of it we realize that as time goes as generation goes more components come to it which is going to scale the application somebody is going to do only processing so i will use spark for processing then came something called as kafka so kafka started immediately being compared to a pub sub kind of a thing i have got a tipco which is doing the same thing like kafka does so the first generation first two years started convincing people and telling them and telling them the benefits of having a queue and a, going away from a queue and a topic of a messaging kind of a thing and then moving on to kafka and then kafka started adding more things and these are the new things and i'm talking about 2014 time frame and not talking about right now 2014 onwards this has started coming where you have got a cluster api and you have got all of these things make sense with it the complete story friend sorry, sorry. i'm saying yes on mute okay. yeah. yeah yeah that's great yeah tell me karan so uh, can we say like uh, <clears throat> the kafka connect helps us uh, read uh, like data from the database and we don't need to write our own application which needs to consume or read data from the database and then dump it into kafka cluster so can we say like connect is uh, yes, such a yes. Yes, well, yes, it, uh, yes, that's a beauty. So even while connecting, we were talking about handholding of connecting and doing that. But with the different uh, APIs, what is coming up right now? So go back over here. So there, there is a reusable piece of code that is already coming in in every connector. So if something is all, like we have got JDBC. So a simple example last time from Spark, they want to put it onto MongoDB. So MongoDB, there's a ready-made JDBC connector for a MongoDB, and you can easily put it into it. Life becomes easy with this kind of connectors that comes in, right? With the jar file that is comes in, so I don't have to worry about that. So you're exactly correct when you're thinking it is nothing but the ready-made jar files, so that the connect can talk to the multiple sources. with this jar files i don't have to uh, talk about the kafka way of connecting it via the jar files i can simply connect to them get the data and then push it on to a topic which is there at the kafka cluster level fine go yeah make sense thanks okay yeah so 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 all that we are talking about today is a new thing which is already there my dear friends okay so we are going to see how to utilize those things and keep it ready so again one more thing if you are thinking purely from your work environment and saying that hey i am only going to do this one part of it that might be a small challenge my dear because somebody has to see the big picture right so what we are trying to do over here is see the big picture and see how the bits and pieces you might not be doing something you are specifically there for doing one part of your job you are a simple cog in the whole wheel but then it's a very good idea to see the complete wheel so that you will know that how am i getting data and getting the picture right so that is what we are trying to do friends cool so let's move on so this was the connect architecture and uh, this is what we said uh, when we talk about a distributed environment how things would be there 
Now let's go ahead and try to see uh, how to get these things running on our systems. Just one more second. That's right. That, the next is the k sql part of it. So let's not talk about that. So let me minimize this. And you saw that this is what this connect looks to be all good, but I have to set it up on my system, right? And that is what we are going to do right now. Let's go back to the example. So let's start with our exercise number three. Okay. So now you're going to set up Docker in your system. Okay. So you are an uh, application developer. So you might uh, be wondering how do I to look at Docker? But then if you're an architect, you will have to know about what are the different pieces. Yes, it's done by somebody else, but then how it is actually done. So this is what we will have to do. So the first step that we will do is do your pseudo app get. I'm trying to make the document as simple as possible with all the information given so that you can go ahead and run this. Okay. So first step, I will do a pseudo app get update. In case if you're talking about yum, that is uh, your CentOS, you can do the same thing over there. Okay, so we are going to set up a Docker image so that we can start with the Landup image, which is now lens.io. Okay, so all these steps are given to you over here. Okay, so with your uh, Ubuntu installations, so control C, let me go back to the document. This is just so that you can go back to the document and cross check and they give you much more detailed steps how to do this. So see over here, to start with the Docker engine, there are two things that you have to do. You have to get into the Docker engine and plus you have to download one more component. Let me scroll down. That is going to be called as Docker Compose. Okay, so you are supposed to install the plain Docker and the Docker Compose. This is about the plain installation. So everything is over here. So you will be working with your version of this thing, uh, what you call Docker. We are using 14.4. Okay, and there are detailed instructions how to do this. So see here, install using a repository. First is uh, do your app get update so that all the uh, uh, stuffs in your system gets updated. Just one second here, this one, okay. Second one is to do a app get install and run these things, okay? So that you will be able to do that. So let me just go back to my code, just one second. Yeah, there we go. So this is what is the, so I've given you the steps what you have to run. So this is what are the step for that. Then you will add your official uh, GPS uh, key uh, along with this. So sudo app get, you will add that. Okay. After that, you will add your repository. Okay. So that you are done. So the same things I'm doing it in the document. So this is step number two, step number three, step number four. After adding all this, you will do a sudo app get update then do this whole thing in one go that is your install your apt transport http certificates do all of those things guys <clears throat> then you can simply check this uh, app the cache search docker ce after this finishes we should see at the last line that the docker open source uh, application container is ready then we are uh, uh, with our current version. See the challenge what we are having is, uh, if you look at it, uh, look at the Docker and all those things and Ubuntu, Ubuntu 19 uh, is already out. We are still looking with 14.4, okay? So 18.4 uh, uh, is what is the most latest version which is updated. So that is what I have decided also because when we go down to this new topics, because with JP and all those things, we were still concerned with the old topics, so that was not there. So when we go down to the new thing, we should try to have that updated and keep it ready. So in the next version, I will have all of these things ready for the clients and I will give them a client version. I had given you a server console, my dear. So that's the reason why you don't have a browser and all that. And in some cases, it's okay because in the case of JP, this is what is given to the uh, people. So that's the reason they found it appropriate. But then for other set of people, they'll be thinking, hey, why don't I have an Eclipse? Like the other day, I was facing trouble with uh, Scott, right? Because you are making changes in your own system. Ideally, I should have everything in the image so that you don't have to, uh, the system is only for playing the image. So I'm going to reach that kind of approval and that's what you should also start thinking. You should do everything in the image and nothing to be done on your local system. 
Okay, so that is what we are trying to do, and that's what I will also have by keeping the image and keeping Eclipse also installed over there, so that we don't get into a problem like what Scott faced two days back. Okay, so after doing that, I will simply do a sudo docker run hello world. I will check my Docker version. So after Docker is done, we will start with our Compose. And uh, there is a complete document for the installation of Compose also. And this I am going to do a sudo curl. I'll get all those things. I will do the Docker Compose, get that version. So if you till step number 13, I have done the basic Docker and the Docker Compose. <clears throat> after that, I will have to get your fast uh, dev environment. Okay, so this is what is a Lambda page, uh, sorry, Lambda page that is there. I will uh, do a sudo on my machine, and then this is from where I can get the complete GitHub. Okay, I will execute the command and see here 811 MB has to be downloaded onto your system and it will be done. And then we can simply open up the browser and look at page 3030. And this is how that page will come. This is what is your Kafka development environment, where you have your schema registry, your Kafka topics, your Kafka Connect UI, some lenses they have kept, and you have got it ready for it. So this is what we are going to do right now. This will easily take about half an hour of your time, and then go ahead and do this. Do it systematically. I have already done all of these things, friends. And uh, once you're ready, I will simply start with my this particular step. Okay, when I do this, my server will start and everything will come. So I'll just show it to you, friends. Just give me a minute. Control C. Go back over here. I've closed everything. I think I can close my prompts also. I no longer want this additional prompts because uh, everything is going to be uh, done on the system itself. So. Let me simply delete all these prompts. I can, of course, open up when I want. Yeah, this is the only one prompt. Clear. CD enter. And in my home not root, I'm going to run this. See here. When I start with this, see here, it has already started. So beautiful. So see what I started. It has started with the zookeeper. It has started with the Kafka server. It has started with the schema registry. OK, all those things have started. And it has started with the UI also. So I can just go down to uh, your 3030 in a page and see how it opens. So let me do that here. Let me go back. What is my IF config? My IP is 23.136. So I will go here, 192, 168, 23. Dot, one second here. I think it is, that's only forgot. 23.136, 23.136. 136. You're picking the Docker IP or you picking the ETH0 IP? Which IP? I, no, no, I'm, I'm simply picking up my image IP. Yeah, show show me again. Um, which yep. there are yep. multiple. Oh, no, no, on the image. On the image. This is the on image. The VM, on the VMware player. VMware workstation. Click on that one. Okay, okay. So there are multiple IPs, right? No, so, no, this, this was your this Docker, Docker IP. IP. Yeah, and, and this is what I'm is, picking up. Oh, so you're picking ETHI. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, just for my understanding, Paris, by the confusion, my dear, what were you thinking, dear? Because it helps me oh, trying to see how, what, or how people look at it. Yeah, Frank? Yeah, Docker VM is also giving its IP, right? If hey, that's correct. No, no, no. I'm looking at the image IP. I'm not looking at the Docker IP at all because I'm not. See, why am I doing this? Because I don't have a browser, right? That's why I had to do this. So, okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. So now I think I technically say, the question is just to add like a um, right? perspective. Okay. So your web server, which included all the components, is being running inside the Docker, right? If take the pin to say your web server as well is running inside the Docker. That's correct. It? Yeah, that's right. correct. So so it is so running. Ideal, yeah, mm -hmm. ideally, the host should, if you are inside the Docker, it should be local host core on 3030 or whatever port that web server is pointing to. Exactly. But mm -hmm. that has been externalized as the same port outside world. So mm -hmm. that is the reason you're connecting to that 192, which is your, uh, which is your remote box, or the virtual exactly. box. Exactly. Pointing exactly. to that port. 
Yeah, exactly. So what I realized also is that uh, with, 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 the, with the existing clients, what I'm doing, they're happy with this. But then when I go to an external client, uh, they would think that, hey, why am I? Why should I do this? I should have a browser within my image itself, right? So that's my point of saying uh, this was a server image. I should have a client image so that I can have in the image itself a browser so that I can do all of that. So that would make our things very easy. So this is the image that I'm connecting to. Just once again, uh, let me go back to my prompt. Yeah, that's correct. No, no, so, it's 136, not 146. Ah, okay. Thank you, friend. I don't know how you found out, but then it's good. Oh, yeah, 136. That's right. That's right. Thank you, dear. Yeah. So one, oh, hold on. It's 136. That's good. Thanks. Thanks for being sharp. And there you go. See, this is what is a lenses IO, wherein you will have your schema. So whatever I said, everything is over here. Right? So people really start using this and see these are the default port numbers. Via JMX, I can look at this port numbers and see. So we, yes, we use Kafka in a traditional environment wherein you have the messaging, whatever we discussed. Then via Confluent, we saw that whatever we did yesterday, everything can run on Confluent. Plus the Avro serializer can be done on Confluent because you know that you need a schema registry. Then, sorry, not this, this one, I've got one. This one. And then for the new things, what is happening, people are going to into this Kafka Connect and seeing how this deployment should happen. Okay. So this is what I said, Landoop is now lenses.io. And that is what it is uh, shown to you. So this is something that is open source to you. So now I, what I want is, I want you to actually go ahead and have this thing installed. If, uh, if there is an issue, ideally there shouldn't be. We should see how things work. So we will go on till about 20, that is 12, 20, and see how these whole things are done so that at least those uh, things will be clear. Friends. So let's continue. Let's go back. Venkat, I have a question here. Can I share yeah, this to you? Yeah, once again, yeah. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, share your screen now. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, now I'm seeing your screen. So, it's the same image, right? How come my topics are different versus yours, the number of topics that you see in your browser versus mine? No, that would be standard image, what I would have. So, over yeah, a period of time, that's all. So but we, I just okay, okay. Maybe someone might have updated it because I just downloaded it. You would have downloaded it way long back. Okay. That that's right. Yeah. And uh, the other thing was, this has embedded inside with the uh, Zookeeper, which is brand newly created right now inside the Docker, right? That's and right. And that means any of our topics are not coming here. That's correct. None of our topics would be over there. And this is where you can see the REST API and see all of those things happening over there. That's fantastic. That's great, friend. So this is what we need to do. So uh, you did this example right now, or it was before only, dear? I mean, when I was when you're talking, uh, I was doing it. Hey, fantastic. That's good. So as simple as that, friend. So this is the way how we can go ahead and see how things can happen. And you can see the uh, coyote, what all are the different areas and how we can work. A lot of new things can be done, the various brokers, See, these are all the topics that is there. So a lot of things is already inbuilt into the system and we let us see how that would work here. So in a real world environment, this is the way how things would happen here. So this web server, whatever is connecting to all these components is basically kind of admin console for us, right? That's Maybe correct. That's correct. Yeah, and in, in JP, they are not even giving this look and feel of this component to the developers because they will have to connect it via the REST API and then go ahead and do this. That's a whole idea. Okay. Okay. Thanks. okay. Fantastic. See, this is what I want, friends. So he's already got that thing downloaded. So just go ahead and see that the whole thing can be done. And I'm sure it can be done. It's not very complex, guys. So go ahead and finish off talk till step number 15, friend. So we are starting with our exercise. Let's go ahead and try to finish it off. Okay. Thank you so much, friends. I'm over here, but I'll put myself on mute. Please go ahead and try it, guys. Thank you. Guys, instead of just sitting idle, you go to sleep, you know, it's it's night time, my time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop sharing and continue uh, working on something else. Okay, so uh, just because I'm stopping sharing, that doesn't mean that I've moved away from here. The phone is still uh, plugged into my ears, guys. So just stopping the sharing, friend.
continue with that any questions please let me know friends so yes, there is a question is go ahead Uh, so, sorry, my question should be quick. So, uh, like in this, uh, the one which we were setting, exercise thirteen, uh, is uh, uh, like we are getting a brand new uh, Kafka broker, Zookeeper, everything in it, right? That's that's what correct. we are looking at. That's correct. It's a completely new image. What you will have with everything already pre-installed and kept it ready for you. That is called as Lenses. Got I O my dear. That's right. Okay, and let's say like if you want to plug lenses dot uh, io separately uh, into our existing Kafka, at what point we will have to uh, set this up, or is there any way we can do that as well? Not in uh, this class, but maybe. Uh, no, no, no. In case if you want to do it, so this is an open source, so you can go ahead and in in this lenses dot io because they have got an UI, they can see all of those things. You can work with this, and you can have a multi-node cluster. This is the same environment that we are using along with the Confluent IO. Uh, they have uh, tweaked it a little bit, the uh, image setting part of it. This is what is used in JP right now, my dear. I mean, just adding okay. to this, an additional question on top of what Gaurav said, right? Sure. Now it is connecting to a Zookeeper, which is running on inside the Docker. Okay, this That's web server. Right. That's Now right. Now let's assume I want the same web server look and feel as uh, so web admin console connecting mm -hmm. to Zookeeper, which is running in some dev environment. Okay. It, the host is uh, the port could be same. Host changes. Okay. So I think we need to tweak out the configurations in exactly, this file. Exactly. 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 Right? You will have to tweak the configurations of this file, and then instead of pointing to local host, you will have to point to that IP. That's all, my dear. Yeah, but is, can can we do this in the UI? In this UI that they expose now, uh, it should be behind the scenes. No, 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 it will be behind the scenes. The UI is basically for the admin part of it, right? It does. It's not for creating other cluster. This UI is a machine that is a standalone machine where they have got everything ready so that you can work with those things. So that's what they have got. The once you set up your Docker and once you do this, all this basic stuff will be ready for you. That's all. But then, if you want to do something, you'll have to do it at the back. See, the purpose of doing this was twofold: one, to show you how Docker has been set up, okay, and how Docker works on an image. Now, instead of this image, if you want your own image to be there or your own multi-node cluster to be there, Docker can run that also, my dear. That's the whole idea, uh, Vijay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. And I, I, I'm just planning to drop one, but when is it, are you going to continue or is after lunch break itself? Ah, uh, no, no, nothing till lunch break. So what you can do is that since you have already done this, you can go ahead and take a break, guys. No worries on it. And uh, my plan is that we will go on till about one uh, twenty our uh, sorry twelve twenty our time, and then we will take up our lunch break and see where people have reached and how I can help them out. So twelve twenty is when I'm definitely going to stop. One twenty, we will be starting again. Ah, uh, Vijay, we can come back okay. by that time, my dear. Okay, thanks. Bye. Sure, you're yeah, welcome. Okay, so like I said, I'm just stopping the share. Yeah, tell me, dear. One more question. Can I click, uh, like, on your screen uh, when you go to that brokers lenses, uh, like number one? Uh, If you go to a browser and click this guy, okay. So, what exactly is the purpose of uh, that particular? So, if you click okay. enter, it is right now asking to install something in addition to. So, what exactly this guy helps us do beyond what is visible on that UI? Okay, okay, okay. So, so this is a open source kind of an environment. Once I, so the ideal uh, purpose of this thing is once you have this lenses and all those things, it, it is basically for management and monitoring of those things. So they have given some UI by which you can start with these things, but then you can go ahead and look at the lenses and register with them. So it's it's an open source environment wherein you can have further requests and all those things can be added. So that's the idea. So once you click on this, it will take you to a link. Have that link and have that uh, thing created so that uh, it will send you information about the new versions and all of those things. It's a kind of a community kind of an environment, Gaurav. Make sense? Okay. And we. Uh, where do you recommend uh, this lenses to be installed? Like uh, in a separate, like let's say we have uh, like uh, some x number of nodes for the brokers and x number of nodes for the zookeepers. So, uh, do you recommend like uh, let's say in a production environment or maybe uh, in a you know dev environment? Like where do you recommend this to be sitting outside of these brokers, uh, Kafka completely, or within one of the 
no, 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 it will be outside the Kafka broker because it's a management tool, right? Once it is outside the broker, it can talk to your internal uh, components of your Kafka, that is the different brokers and all that, and then the work would happen. So this is a more a kind of an admin kind of place of a uh, utility that you're using. So it'll always be outside your existing Kafka thing, guys. That's the whole idea. Okay. And uh, can we say like, uh, is this something similar to uh, what Kafka, what Confluent gives us the control center? Is it something similar to that or uh, it's complementing that or what's the exact goal of this versus that control oh, center? Oh, no, the control center is a commercial thing, right? So whenever we talk about Confluent as a commercial thing, this is what is an open source thing. So although you're being given a community version that will be there for some period of time, they have expert, they have stopped a lot of this UIs from being shown to you because that is only there in the commercial version. And you have got only a trial of 30 days for the commercial version. After that, it doesn't run and all that. So uh, this is just an open source version, a open source web server, which shows you a lot of uh, open source kind of things, you know, whereas oh, that is much more advanced wherein they have put in a lot of work. So, so when something like this is available and somebody's like uh, Confluent says, hey, you have to pay me money for doing that. They have to definitely do something additional, right? So that is what is their additional work as compared to this idea. Make sense? Okay. So what, uh, like in your uh, like experience, what do you think like uh, this tool is uh, good enough? Linsys is good enough or uh, in comparison to the control center? Like, I mean, just trying to understand your experience based on what you have seen control oh. center versus this guy. No, from my experience, Control Center is much more uh, exhaustive. So a lot of, because Control Center is what people are used to seeing, right? So when, when we talk about the people, they wanted things to be shown, they wanted something to be there. So that is one of the beauty of uh, Confluent. If something goes wrong, you call up Confluent, say, I want this functionality. They will actually create that some functionality and give it to you, and then they will put it in the product also, saying that in the next release, it is there. So over a period of time, so many years, about three, four years of working with the various uh, uh, organizations online, they have got a fairly good idea about what is the kind of a UI or a roadmap what everybody wants. And that is why it is very popular. Right? So control center is at any point of time, the commercial version is very good. And I think that's what you are using also. This becomes very good when you're doing a dev kind of a thing wherein everything is ready with me. I don't have to worry about it. Everything gets started. That's fantastic. But that, uh, when you actually go ahead and see, control center is very, very effective, my dear. Okay. Uh, can you show anything which is interesting in this particular UI, uh, like from a developer perspective or even from a uh, like person at, managing look, the Kafka so. look at the topics perspective and see if any enter and one more thing Buster, it's not an error it is just saying a warning that the public is not available continue with that the Buster. there is no error on that here everything is okay so it will just give it give us the last thing saying that the gpg thing would come saying that i could not uh, public key is not available continue with it i don't think so there's an error on this Buster. okay yeah uh, continuing with you. So if I look at the topics, I can look at drill down on those particular topics and I can see multiple things what is going to happen. So if you look at this, <clears throat> I'm looking at coyote test JSON. What all are the configuration files? This is getting loaded over here. See, so you can see how many partitions it has. So if I click on this, I can see the partitions, replicas, blockers, see the configuration. See. So this becomes very, very useful to see what all are the default configurations that has been sent for the different topics, what you're having. And it becomes fantastic by, by looking at the data. Of course, I don't have any data right now, but if you have a data, you'll be able to see the data also over here. That's the beauty of it here. Okay, got it. So yesterday, uh, like there was a question, like uh, what are different tools uh, using which we can connect to Kafka to just to see, uh, you know, what's going on within Kafka sometimes. So this could be one of the tools. Is there any other tool which you're going to tell us uh, like today or? Oh, uh, no, not no, like... no, this is one tool. And the second tool will be the control center wherein you can have the UI and all that. So these are the two tools that is primarily, uh, which will tell, will give you a graphical user interface to see what things are going to be. This will be the primary tools, my dear. 
Got it. Okay. And uh, what about uh, uh, like? Have you heard uh, about Kafka tools? Uh, there is. Uh, I mean, if you just Google, yes. like you'll see. Yes. Yes. I know. There is. It's all, I have already got that downloaded also. So you are very true. Especially when you talk about the UI, I said that we will have a look at that. So let me just go down and go here. So Kafka tool. There we go. So you can, yeah, there it is. See, I've actually uh, kept that for download also. So this is also one of the free tools where you can get a, a UI. So we work with this long back, you know, so it is it, definitely it's not there uh, in the banks right now. But then this is also only a personal learning part of it. This becomes pretty good. Just set this up, well, download this and set it up and you can get the basic requirement with the UI thing, what you're seeing. You can see here also, my dear, Perfectly valid thing, Agora. Okay, got it. But lenses is like a bit more advanced and control center is very much, the best very much, very much, very much. Lenses is much more advanced than this. And control center is ultimate, which is there at the top, uh, which is giving you a very fantastic UI on all of those things. And the way how you're seeing UI right now in the uh, this one, uh, what you call uh, Lando, you will be, sorry, I, I don't remember the new name, frankly. We always call it as Lando only. They just change the name. So in Lando, you will be able to see the various configurations and parties and the data over here so from the data perspective it will be the same thing but then if you want to drill down into something your uh, actual uh, uh, confluent gives you a lot of UIs for that my dear. okay okay yeah. and uh, okay. since you are of this uh, like tool like uh, is there any authorization or like authentication can be built into this uh, or this is supposed to be an open tool no, no, this is an open source. This is an open source. But if you want to build no, some sorry. kind of Kerberos authentication, you can do that also. You can build it on top of this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can very well do that. So that is what has been done by JP, right? I said that they're using this component. So they have done their standard authentication, authorization, the Kerberos setup. They have got all those things ready. So they just built up the additional layer on top of this and uh, integrated with this so that this can work. So being an open source, they give you the complete code and everything to you, right? So you can change this and develop something more on top of this. No worries on it. Let's just want to check with the others. Uh, of course, one guy had finished it and I think God of you also done. Uh, about the others, uh, is it going on good or where are we reached, my dear? Uh, Scott and uh, Susan, if you're working on it. Uh, Paris, were you able to finish it? Yeah, yeah, it's running. Fantastic. Okay, okay. I think Bhaskar, you're working on it right now, right here. Maybe you just stepped out. That's okay. So uh, once you're finished, you can take up your break rest. I'll be here for another five more minutes. And at 12.20, uh, we will take up our break and we will start again at 1.20. So that should be uh, the roadmap how we will continue. So let me just mention this here. Hey, hi folks, uh, welcome back. So before our lunch, we were uh, working with our exercise 13 and a couple of folks have already done that. Others, please try to ensure that you finish it up. Bhaskar, Paris and uh, Gaurav had uh, finished that. So Scott, uh, any update on where we are on our exercise? Were you able to do it here? Maybe he's not. Yeah, I was able to do it. Yeah, I'm just untarring the tar file right now. Okay, perfect. Fine. No worries at all. Uh, Susan, you're available, dear. Were you able to go ahead with the exercises? Maybe she's not there. Wouldn't know. And what about you, uh, Vinay? Were you able to do the exercise? Okay, no response from him also, but I know for sure that Paris, Gaurav, uh, Vijay and uh, Bhaskar had finished it. That's perfectly okay. So let's continue from where we left off. So just to give you a quick summary of what all things we had uh, uh, done today. So we started off with our, let me go back to the document that will make it uh, clear. So we had gone to the, uh, this is the beginning. So we started with our exercise 11 
wherein we played with our confluent uh, uh, package 4.11 and we created a simple SPT file producer and the default consumer. So that ran fan, that ran fine. So we had to use our uh, Zookeeper and the Kafka server. Then went to the agro example wherein we saw the benefits of uh, the schema registry. Started with our schema registry, saw the JPS, how the daemon also starts, and then did a example with my agro producer one, agro producer two, and agro consumer one. So that was a detailed example. All of you had done that. That's good. And then we start, set up Docker in our image and started with the Landoop image, which is now called as lenses.io. So detailed steps have been given to you. So you had followed the steps and uh, had seen myself how you have uh, opened up the API and you have seen those things. So that's great, guys. So this is the API that you had opened. So now what we're going to do right now is we are going to try with the latest of our uh, confluent systems that is going to be 5.3.1. So we will uh, download it from this particular link. Okay, we will choose the uh, uh, community edition and we will have it downloaded. Uh, please ensure that you choose the compression as an R file. So it will download the R file for you. So let me go back to my system and show that in the package it will be there. So let me go to my home. Inside my home, not food, in my downloads. See, this is the tar file that uh, we will have to download. A little bit of a big file, but then we will have that downloaded. So move the tar file to your downloads directory and then untar it. I've given you the steps, the way how we'll untar the file. Then you will make some changes in your bash RC, okay? And then execute the bash RC. And if you look at this link, they will give you very detailed instructions as to how do you install this. So the idea over here was to go ahead with the installation and see how that would happen first, okay? So let me go back to my system, control V. I'm just opening up the Confluent documentation for installation. See here, how to do the manual install using this. And a very strong suggestion would be, uh, uh, Bhaskar was asking about a couple of things before the break. So that's why I have given two links over there so that you can have a look at that. Sorry, it's here. Let me scroll down. And uh, he, he was asking about the com control center and whether he can work with uh, the control center and the uh, <clears throat> the UI screens, what we can see. <coughs> Just once again. Back again. So uh, this is the link uh, when he comes back, he can have a look at it. This will give you the detailed way how we can do that. And this will come only when you go to the Confluent package, you would see that there is, sorry, uh, Bhaskar, you're there. Somebody had unmuted the phone, that's okay, dear. So uh, if you go down to this, you can see the detailed UI because he was uh, uh, wanting to have a look at the UI. And this is what is the documentation link for the Confluent thing. So all the new products, whatever we are showing, uh, those things are over there. So the idea here is so that these things will be given to you. Yes, you're not using it right now, but then please play around with it so that you will be in a position to see that. So that's the whole idea of uh, this documentation list here. Let me go back to our cheat sheet. Okay, so once you set it up, uh, the details are over there, guys. So uh, the what all would be installed would be, of course, your Kafka and the Zookeeper, the schema registry, the connector, the KSQL server, and the control center is what would be installed once you go to the Confluent and download those things, guys. So that's what we are going to do right now. So please go ahead and download the Confluent 5.3.1 system. This is the latest one. It's a little bit different from what you are using, but then that's good. At least you'll be able to know that, okay, what all are the capabilities? How do we have those things done? 
So let's go ahead and uh, have that downloaded. And uh, uh, once everything is ready, just let me know. And then we will go ahead with our uh, case equal to see what is case equal, how things can be done. The earlier example really takes some time, but then people have done it very smoothly. That's very nice. So the 15 steps that we have given before the break. So typically that would uh, go on uh, quite a bit because uh, things have to be done properly, but then it happened wonderful for our four colleagues who have done that. So that's why we are well ahead of the things what we are seeing. So after this, we will go ahead to our basics of KSQL and uh, keep the environment ready and see how we can start with Confluent guys. Okay. So that is the roadmap that we have for <clears throat> the session as to what all things we are going to go uh, make you do and be comfortable with it. So please ensure that you have done the earlier step, all the other four colleagues. Four people have done it, other four colleagues also if you do it, it will be wonderful to you. So everybody, uh, you can start with our exercise 14 and then continue on with it. Thank you. Just putting myself on mute. And basket. So I didn't get so I didn't quite yeah, get yeah, the, yeah. Basket, yeah. Go okay, ahead. Just once again, Baskar. Yeah. Yes, Scott. Tell me. So the website didn't actually come up. The thirty thirty port. Okay. So so maybe the IP would have been wrong. Can I just make you as a presenter for a minute, Scott? Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Okay. So I just stop sharing. Can you just show me a screen, dear? And after that, I'll come back to you, Baskar. Two minutes. Yeah, I was. Facing the similar issue, um, I saw that my uh, the schema registry was still on, so quote was a conflict. Okay, okay. So Back can to I just that zookeeper and everything else is turned off. Okay, yeah, that's right. So please go back to the earlier thing and ensure that you have turned on those demons, uh, Scott. Scroll up, yeah, make sure it's down in the party window. Yeah, for you it is running. So can we stop those? Okay, this is closed. Yeah, this is still running. Can you do a control C? Yep. Perfect. Let's close the others also, friend. And Paris, thank you so much because uh, I didn't face this issue, but it was good to know why that would happen because the other service was running. That's fine. Thank you. Looks like you have filled everything. Uh, look at the first one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, everything is done. So now let's go back to the UI and just refresh it. Okay, can you go back to the command prompt where it was running? Yeah, you'll have to restart the Docker. Okay, let's go back to the Docker and we can do Control C so that it can. Okay, there is a command where you executed the code friend. If you look at my document, there will be a step. Yeah, over there, come down, come down. Yeah, the Docker run command. We need to run the Docker one uh, run command. The whole thing, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, hang on a second, I got it. Okay, great. That's the one we're talking about? No, because this is going to download that stuff, right? Uh, no, no, one second. Where is that? Uh, Paris had given something in the uh, chat window. If you look at your chat window. The chat window. Okay. Oh, here we go. Just change the IP to your machine. That's all. Got it. The IP of your VM. Yeah. Okay.
uh, right will do do a right click in programs uh yeah that should because we are given the path right so yeah uh fine. anywhere anywhere is fine okay Yep, it started now. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can just go up and scroll that IP and then put it on the browser. That should work. Yeah, it's the same one I just typed in, all right? That's yeah, right. your PM IP column 3030. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I got that here. Yeah, the same one. There's, yeah, there we go. It's coming now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So let me just stop the sharing. Stop. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you will have to stop it. It's not stopping the sharing, uh, Scott. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Baskar, over to you. So what, uh, you had asked me some uh, questions when we had gone for the break, right? So this this is what the answer would be, because when you look at the control center to see what kind of capabilities you can do in the control center, very similar to what we had in the land loop image, but then okay. this will give you a good detail. So see over here, just once again. This will give you the capabilities of the control center. How do you go ahead with it? And see, this is the message display app. And there are various apps how you can play, uh, make that work, you know. So that is one thing. Plus, if you want to get the latest documentation for what we are doing, if you go down to that site and see that, that should give you all the information. So strong suggestion is to look at this particular link. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. So if you see over here, all the different components, what we have, you can see those things over here, Vasquez. So that's the whole idea, friend. Okay. 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 Sure, sure. Thank you. And so, uh, look at look at those things, Vasquez. If you have anything, please be in touch. And uh, uh, I, uh, once next week, once the people come back, I will be getting the uh, screens at uh, JP also. Uh, I can just take the screenshots and uh, massage whatever the sensitive data, and then I can send that to you. That should not be a challenge to you. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. One more question. While downloading, it's saying that what type of download meaning is it a, a Docker or? Um, no, no, no. Uh, it'll be a RAR file. It'll be a RAR file. So you will have to download the plain RAR file. So see, I have mentioned that over here. Uh, once again, not this. This. Okay. So you will actually be downloading this uh, a tar.gz, not RAR, tar.gz file here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure, sure. So that's great. So let me just mute you. That's perfect. So others, uh, please go ahead and uh, uh, have the Confluent, the latest uh, tar file being downloaded. Put it into your bash RC and uh, the link that I have shared with you, which will give you more uh, details on the Confluent. And the earlier I had given that link, that will give you uh, some more details on the installation, etc. Okay, so please follow till step number six and have that done. Once it's done, then we can move on. Thanks. Thank you. So please go ahead and set up your Confluent uh, 5.3.1 uh, in your systems. Thank you. Just meeting myself, but I'm available over here. Venkat, do you want us to run yeah. the those tabs from configure Confluent platform from Confluent uh, installation? No, uh, see, uh, uh, when I gave you the image, the uh -huh. old 4.4 was there. You have yeah. to download a new tar file and keep Run. the 
actually because you'll be working on this star file, my dear. Correct. We download it and put it into Bash RC. That's right. That's it. Or do we need to change these properties for Zookeeper properties and all? No, nothing as of now. Once you okay. go ahead, yeah, that's all, dear. The other rest okay. of the things you'll be doing it over here. Step number fifteen. We will see how to move it to a folder, and we will see that. That will be later on. But uh, since okay. if you have already done that, if you want to do this, you can carry on. No worries. But then uh, technically, do it till only till step number exercise fourteen for us. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'll just wait for some more time uh, to see if people are finished. Yeah, While downloading, I have a question on the REST uh, proxy. Okay. So for we are currently using a REST proxy because uh, for, for one of the topics where okay. we have to expose uh, Kafka to a third party vendor who is installed their application in Google Cloud. So okay. they don't want to uh, publish to, they don't want to touch our Kafka or do any, meaning I use any uh, uh, async mechanism. So we exposed the REST proxy for that topic Okay. to, to get their message. Mm. Is there any other uh, intelligent or clever way to uh, for them to access the messages in the Kafka via REST proxy? Uh, you could have kept a specific application and you could have deployed it on a specific application also. Cloud, of course, is one of the environments. Uh, if it's uh, if he doesn't want to get into a system, so that is a loosely coupled way. You could have also created a Java application and made it public and uh, at a particular URL, and all the details uh, can be shown at the URL again via the REST proxy only. That would have been far more safer because you would have have had a control on that application, right? So that's what I would think right now when you ask me this, dear. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, security-wise, our DevOps team took care of it. I, I'm uh, mainly s trying to see that for publishing message to uh, the Kafka, yeah, we exposed the REST proxy. Is the same way? Uh, is there a way to use a REST proxy to uh, read the messages or consume the messages from the Kafka? Meaning, yeah, does it, Kafka provides a, 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 like a, a wrapper? Proxy or something like that. It does that. It does that. So uh, using the REST proxy, you can both publish and you can consume also. So okay. what what happens is that when when the systems are going to be decoupled, like for example, we have got uh, multiple uh, banks, and uh, yes, uh, they are all falling under the same set. But then I don't want to be in touch with the bank, so I would uh, use the REST proxy to see how confirmations come from different banks. So that's the way how uh, JP is done it uh, right now. So both can be done by our REST proxy, uh, Bhaskar. Okay, so no, uh, the publishing is in a way straightforward, right? Meaning I can publish whenever I want. That's correct. But uh, if the, there is a message in the Kafka, so I have to poll this regularly to get whatever is there. Is that how it is? No, no. Oh, with the REST proxy, what you can do is that is a periodic time, it will automatically get updated. So it is not going to be real time. They are okay with no, no, no. minutes delay. So the implementation is like, a, let's say the vendor has to um, make a call to this REST proxy every one minute to get that's the correct. messages whatever, whatever was there. Is, that's that's how we, okay. That's how it is. That's how it is. That because it's it's not going to be completely synchronous because it's it's a third party environment. So he will have to poll to see whether something has come or not. Right. Okay. So it's like a one uh, at one time one moment there may be like hundred messages. At one moment there may be two thousand messages. Uh, so they have to plan to handle those things. Meaning, I, I don't well, know if the page, pagination or other things are handled in the trust proxy. Uh, no, no, uh, because you know, it's not pagination because it's not a view part of it, right? So their application is going to uh, see to it. So you are, you are just publishing it over there so that the application can read it from there. So it can be in any way. So it should not be a challenge. No, no, see, so your REST proxy, you, even it's a REST proxy like, there's a limit to a message, a uh, number of messages, messages they can get it, meaning realistically, right? So that's... No, 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 not necessarily, and if you're configured it in a proper way, it can go down to any number of messages. Why are you saying, Bhaskar, that it will be restricted to some messages? No, no, I'm not saying that restricted. Let's say as a REST proxy, they are making a REST call to get um, messages which are there, uh, which they haven't read. Okay. Right? okay. There may be... Uh, 10 messages which they didn't read or 100 messages or 10,000 messages, right? 
that's correct that's correct depending upon the uh, uh, what you call duration after which they are coming in and hitting us that's yes. correct so uh, in other words uh, they have to make uh, multiple calls to get the 10000 messages rather than uh, one single only... call that's correct that's correct so yeah that, have... so the proxy provides the uh, pagination kind of thing saying that okay there are more messages or or there is just a blindly they have to keep getting it and see till it they hit the end of the no message uh, there to uh, that's correct they should have written okay. application so so uh, the, the the way how we are also reading it from another proxy is we just see if there is any message coming so we will keep on polling it till the time see once i poll it for the first time uh, i will keep on polling till the time i read the whole messages so everything is done programmatically so that uh, you, uh, there wouldn't be human involvement in that uh, that's what i was okay. saying so okay so it's like a, yeah the meaning they just keep getting it till it ends that's correct that's correct okay. and then the next duration uh, time they will again poll and and in the first time i don't read everything i'll keep on reading it till the time it reaches end of the file and then i'm done so it's, it's constantly that's the way how it happens okay yeah. okay Perfect. yeah i think so they are very reluctant to uh, access kafka uh, so the we are forced to do a, a rest proxy way so yeah now they are uh, publishing messages uh, but uh, to consume messages from our kafka to their system that's where uh, we are trying to push them to do that so okay okay so so what, what it might not happen in a realistic way because uh, yes uh, in your uh, line of business it uh, i mean it's not a banking domain so it, it might be okay but in the banking domain they are very very all the banks are very hesitant to talk about some other systems and trying to access data so we use rest proxy very commonly okay okay Got it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kate. Okay, a uh, couple of questions and thanks, Paras, for answering that. So, uh, what was he saying? Okay, the bash actually will be there in the home, not root. You have seen that. Okay, he's saying edit the bash RC. Uh, export changes is right. Change. Okay. Yeah, put those two statements in the bash RC. Okay, okay, that's right. Okay, great, great. Thanks, Paris. Appreciate that. So, what they have done is that they have uh, uh, made these changes and they had exposed this so that we can see the details uh, over there. That's great. So now, once we have uh, just one second, a little bit of the background noise. I'll just mute to you, Buster. Uh, anytime you want, you can unmute yourself. No worries. Thank you. So uh, yeah, so once once those things are done, uh, that would mean that the basic setup of your uh, confluent is done, and we can start with it. But then the biggest advantage of this thing is I'm having an environment wherein you can play around with the different controls, what is available, friend. And again, looking at the default link that is a docs .confluent .current, you can get the documentation for that also. Cool. So after the uh, connect part of it, the next thing that we will be talking about is KSQL. Okay, so the next uh, aspect of Kafka would be the uh, KSQL part of it. So let's talk about KSQL and how would that work, my dear. So let me go back to my presentation. So we had spoken about the Kafka Connect architecture earlier. So the way how KSQL works is when you have got a source, you will have a de facto connector who will be reading from the source and dumping into Kafka. And then if I want to save that to somewhere else, so I can again have a uh, sync and that will put that into the actual storage where it has to be done. There is also a way how we can write your SQL way of uh, uh, generating Kafka streams and connecting and then processing it. So that is what is called as KSQL. And that has come up in a very recent version of it. So it's been there sometime. Uh, people are still looking at it to see how good it is. So until now, I have not got a clearance either from, I don't have an existing customer who's using KSQL. They have done a couple of POCs. It's, it looks to be very good, but then we still haven't seen anybody actually using it, at least uh, from my perspective, guys. But then you have to know that uh, this kind of a component is present. So uh, if you look at KSQL from Confluent, the source project is there in the Confluent KSQL. 
So it is writing your Kafka streams, Java application would get many a times complex. So uh, uh, from the actual popularity perspective, you might just want to write a SQL and see how that would work. So this is a, a simple example that is there. So create stream uh, VIP actions as we will do a simple SQL statement and uh, it would give us a result. So this is the way how the KSQL is, uh, uh, what you call tentatively, this is the way how it would execute my here. okay? So uh, when I uh, was uh, preparing the materials for this, I saw that a lot of people have actually used KSQL and uh, created products out of this, you know? So this is the links. So let me go back to the first one and actually show how things are, they've used KSQL. In fact, uh, even my eyes were really opened when I had seen how people are using it. I just prepared this uh, a set of documentations uh, a week back. So KSQL looks like it is getting very, very popular. People have been doing it for a long time, but then in the banking domain and all that, it's becoming not very popular. So this is how uh, uh, it's taking KSQL for a spin using my real-time device. So uh, this particular gentleman, uh, Ritman, is uh, evaluating KSQL on his to-do list since it was released in August, I presume August of 2017. So it's about almost about two years uh, it's been there, but then uh, the, uh, the people are still not using it. That's something that I want to see as to why, what is happening. Okay, so he's created a device by which he will be getting the data in real time using KSQL and visualize it in Grafana. Okay, so he's created an end-to-end -end kind of a pipeline and see how things happen. See the real time devices via Kafka, he processes that using KSQL, Using Connect, he put it into his Influx DB, uh, database and then view it in Grafana. Okay, so it, I was personally impressed when I saw this kind of uh, things that is being done. So this was the first thing that you should look at. The next thing is uh, by Simon. So he is based out of Australia. So uh, we had a chance to work on a similar project uh, uh, <coughs> some time back. I think it was somewhere in Feb or uh, March of this year. So he has used a Raspberry Pi and a software defined radio to find the plane that breaks up his cat. So this was done last year only. So uh, a, a particular use cases, the plane goes, his Raspberry Pi gets that message that will wire rest, it will go down into Kafka, again into Kibana, and then he would uh, do some analysis, so break up his cat and do some analysis on it. So, that's the whole idea about how he had done this. The reason why I'm showing this thing is because this becomes a very, very popular way. Yes, there are some very uh, fantastic innovations in this area, but then at the uh, implementation level, uh, really don't know why it has really not picked up because what we do is that when, some, when somebody is asking for something and when there is a demand, what is there, that's a time when we look at it and uh, start working with it. Okay, so that's why KSQL, frankly speaking, has got not that much of a, amount of a demand right now. So introducing that to you so that you would know what things are. And the third one is also by the same gentleman. Let me go down to this blog and try to show uh, what's happening over there. So let the page come. Okay. So he's creating a, a bug me when I left the heater on. So the use cases, he's using his Google Home and phone to notify me when something goes wrong. So see here how the flow of the things would happen and KSQL uh, helps you with that, okay? So a lot of stream processing data is where we will use KSQL. Uh, uh, some of the POCs that the banks have done is with related to the machine learning uh, kind of an aspect. So whenever there is a uh, some kind of an incident report that gets generated, they do a lot of machine learning and uh, they have done a small POC which will be uh, done in your Kafka SQL. Right? So these are some of the uh, use cases that is pretty popular. Let me move on. <clears throat> so this is the way how it would work. So you would have your own system wherein you will use your KSQL CLI, that is command line interface. And then you, it can move on to your uh, KSQL server. 
and from there it can move on to your k streams and uh, you touch your kafka again the return back comes through k streams and come down to your uh, actual computer where the command line interface is running and how things will happen okay so this is what the overall architecture of how things are so now what we will do is let's try to uh, deploy this and see whether the k sql starts i mean the basic confluent would be ready so that at least you can play around with that so let's go back to our system go down to this so <clears throat> we will set up our environment so uh, <clears throat> There, there is there is a document called as uh, uh, what do you call uh, there's a CLI component for this uh, which is separate from what you have already downloaded you know so what I have done is that there is one way you can get a tar file and then do this but then I did it with a curl command and it was pretty okay you know so no need to download the star file. Okay, you have to first, uh, for setting up a KSQL environment, you will have to ensure that uh, the CLI is available. So you can look at this uh, link where the CLI would be there and see how uh, it can be processed. So let me close the three links and just open up this link and show you how we can do the installation of the uh, CLI part of it. Okay. So again, they have given this curl command. So I have used this curl command to get those things done. So this is what you will have to do. So let's go back. You are, uh, this thing is already set up, your Confluent. <clears throat> then what I do is I move my Confluent uh, folder to my OPT, okay? Uh, that's a subfolder within my Linux, give the details get into OPT and you see that the Confluent is over there. Then I give a link to that particular thing called as Confluent. So that is what is this command doing, giving a alias, a link to it, okay? So you can see all of that. So now, then when I do a simple LS on my OPT Confluent and then the, the, link, the link that I'm giving is called as Confluent. The next time when I do this, it is actually going to this particular folder and displaying all the contents, okay? So this is just to show you uh, from the OPT command, this is the curl API, which will go down and install something for you. And then once you go down to your Confluent bin, because I was having a teething issue when I was running this, that uh, uh, ideally speaking, I don't have to go down to the bin folder and run it, but then I had some teething issues where I, I had to literally go to the bin folder and then execute this. So we will see it in the lab right now to see whether you are also facing the same thing or uh, you are uh, from outside itself, you can do that, right? okay? So once you do this, it will give you the complete thing and tell you how you can manage your Confluent platform and the details will be given, okay? So that is what is the purpose of this exercise. Then beyond this, uh, in my KSQL stuff, uh, uh, you can actually start with your KSQL server and uh, literally go down to the KSQL prompt and then, then you can actually run this, my dear. You can try your actual KSQL queries over there. It is just like a simple console. If you're talking about Hadoop and all that, that is where Hive, that is the SQL way would be done. So any SQL query can be done on the streaming data that is coming in. So that is what is the beauty. So uh, ideally all the SQL guys would be very happy when they look at this saying that, hey, I can work SQL with my streaming data also. So that is what is the plus point of doing all this. So now what you should be doing is uh, I'll go ahead to this particular lab that is exercise 15 and we will not do this because I'm doing it through curl. Follow the steps over here. And when you run this, of course it will run. Try to see if you can run it outside this and see if it runs, guys. For me, it was giving me a teething issue uh, when I saw that yesterday. Uh, I mean, uh, today morning when I saw, when I started this, this was not running. So that's the reason I have to keep it in this particular fashion. Right? It, it will not run, right? Because in our Bash RC, we put the home as the old home, but you move this folder into OPT. Uh, uh, I, I changed that also. And even then I saw that it was giving a uh, teething issue. So you mean to say that if I give this location, it should yeah. run? Yeah, if you set this as the home path in your Bash RC. Okay, let, let me do that because I tried doing that. It was giving me the irritating uh, issue. So that's the reason. So no worries, I'll try to give this as the path. So that's the reason why when it was not running, I said that, okay, let me try this approach. And this approach Confluent was working, but then I have to go down to the individual directory and give a dot slash and make it run. 
So let, let me try this, friend. So that would be wonderful if it runs. So that will fix up the issue. Others, you can actually go ahead. I'm just going to try this, my dear. And thanks for that, Paris. Appreciate that. Sorry, silly uh, on my part. Uh, by changing those things, it was working. So I don't know why. I, I played around with it. Maybe I would have forgotten to change the path after I uh, moved this particular file, you know. Uh, looks to be running. So I just tried Confluent and I ran the bash RC and changed it. That was running. So not very really sure what would have happened. So I think what I can do is even the uh, other things uh, would be running because my case equal, this was not running how to start the case equal start and like how did we start today the schema registry right so that was also not coming up let me try with that also so this is running at least in my path so thanks for that paris silly thing on my part So Venkat. Yeah, tell me Vinay. Uh, so as part of this 14 and 15 steps, right? All this that we did was... One, once again, dear, once again, let me just go, go down there, friend. Uh, yeah, in the 14 step, you have downloaded the Confluent yeah, yeah. Uh, so, latest one. Yeah, in both of them, it says that we downloaded the Confluent latest version, which is .5, and right. installed the CLI, right? Those are That's the two right. things we did. Yeah, in the okay. 15th one, we have installed the CLI also using the curl command, my dear. Yeah, but uh, I mean, do you have any plans to show any references of the streams today? Uh, 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 no, the streams is something that uh, one small example, I have this over here. After this, you will talk about the Kafka stream, which is very similar to what was the, uh, the old API, how you have done, right? So that is the way how the stream should be done. So the plan would be to finish up with this. After once we finish up this thing, go ahead with the streams API. After that, you will have to go ahead and answer the substandard set of uh, uh, questions what we, we have, friend. So once that is also done, that thing uh, we would be done uh, for the whole day, friend. That's the idea, Vinay. OK? OK. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll just mute you, Vijay. Uh, so the plan around, let me go back and start my default servers. What I had started in the earlier version, okay? I want to start that, start that. That's why I went up. Let me go back to the beginning because I want to start my Kafka server. So I will just go to my bin zookeeper and start this. This is going to be fixed. Let me open up the document. Okay. Let me do this. Let 
this stuff here so we could have got the beats and the C. But you need to come on the bit. So I already said bit. Okay, uh, Paris, this is what I was, uh, I think I've done this because uh, this is the weird issue what I was getting. So I think I should remove the OPT and keep it at the common place and see. It was given when I moved it to OPT location, it was giving me this kind of an error print. Sorry, I just show that thing here. So there you is. need to create that folder. You need yeah. to create that folder where lost chapter and give the uh, permissions to not root. Chmod seven five five to warlock Kafka folder. Okay, okay, okay. Then only this will happen. Okay, so no, no, I really don't want to do all that. So I think the best way uh, to uh, do is to keep it at the common location, like what we did in our downloads, and then point it to that. I think that would be the clean way of doing this. Although in the steps I have said that for k equal at least you can go ahead and do that. So just for my understanding. Why do we have to have this var lock Kafka, uh, this folder here? Because in, remember in Zookeeper, we provide in zookeeper.property, we provide the log path. Okay. So the, the default provided is var lock Kafka. Oh, wow. That, okay. okay. That path does not exist unless you want to change that path like we did for exercise. Uh, that's for right. Data. That's right. That's right. Okay. 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 So got it. So they should this configuration should be there in the ksql properties file so let me just go back and see if i can find the properties file go down to share not share no etc etc ah, yeah, yeah. it is no not to keep it the K, K -SQL. Kafka. Uh, no, no you are not in ksql you are doing a kafka zookeeper right so just okay okay it, it will be there in this yeah, yeah. It should be in Kafka, inside Kafka. Okay. Yeah, last so, one. Yes. Yes, you keep on server our properties. Okay. Okay, they have changed this also. Okay. No, it is 10 to keep. Okay, I have to change. No, why is it uh, looking for this thing, Paris? Sorry for taking your time, but then uh, why is it looking for this location? Because I never changed the location. Okay, let me see which file have it. Where log Kafka? We'll have to grab into that source all the configs where we can find okay uh, okay 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 so that's what it's saying you cannot create a directory permission denied okay. but if you create a directory that should be fine just say mkdir minus p and copy this okay no, no okay. you don't need a zookeeper just half okay 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 sudo I think you have okay. to do sudo. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then do uh, chmod, chmod seven five five on that. I think you have to do su uh, sudo chmod. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it won't work. That's why. Here it gave one more error. It is giving me some, I could not find a file. That's what I was wondering. How come it is looking out for some? Either they have. It should have created now. Once you started, it should have created by now. Just check see. in the directory, anything created. First time okay. it will be empty, right? So see yeah, now. Yeah. 
Okay. The directory was wall and log. Hey, you have copied it. You copied it. Just do ls. No, nothing. Yeah. Oh, for you, you didn't give that error that uh, once you gave no, the directory. Not, not reached there yet. Once. Okay, 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 okay. No worries. I think I'm trying to download the no, CLI and I'm getting a permission issue. Not That's sure if okay. I'm, if I'm okay. doing the right thing. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's go back and look at uh, the command. This once again. Okay. This should not give you an issue. This once again. Oh. Let me see what you have uh, given the path. Hold on. No, so I think what I probably did was I just went to the, I didn't execute any of this yet. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so this is not needed. So this is downloading that particular file from a particular location. So no need to download a file because I'm already getting it via call, my dear. So, so this, yeah, the so actual no steps, need for doing this. Okay. The actual step starts uh, in the next line, is that right? That's correct. So now okay. we are moving the file to a location in OPT and then we are doing this here. Okay. That's right. Sure. Uh, sure, Paris. Let me try that. So those yes, not seven five five on that location. Okay. But it's still an exception, it is. Something for the date pattern, etc. It is no the same thing. It says permission denied. I'm not able to put a file of, into that uh, uh, Paris. You know, mine. I started it. It is automatically creating those log files, and I can see it created all those log files, whatever is needed. Okay. Uh, uh, but I'm getting a port conflict address already in use, but JPS is not showing anything. I think it's. Uh, my port conflict is with uh, the Docker that is running. I'll have to shut down that. Okay, okay. That's um, funny. How come it's working for you? Whereas for me, the same thing. It's not able to find yeah. necessary files. Just copy this path and then, or just copy the command I gave, right? Sudo chmod, let's do 777. Just copy that after. In, in I, I did that. I did that. See, uh, the, uh, whatever command that you gave, that I had already done that. After that, also the same error is coming minus here. R, try with minus R, uh, maybe the files okay. you haven't given permission. But you have to make the. Uh, you can run from here okay. itself. You can run that command okay. from here itself. You don't have to go anywhere. Okay, see. Where log Kafka var log Kafka. No, 777, not 755. Okay. 777. All okay. the right That's permission right. also. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that, that was the reason. That was the reason. Makes sense. All right. Started. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, mate. So this really helped help me also silly on my path. But that's okay. So let me. Ah, you have given 777. That's right. Uh, Gaurav, even by de facto, even I gave 755. Because that's what we always give, right? Umar has got all the permissions. Others will have read and execute. They won't have write permissions. So by default, our habit is 755. So that's the challenge. Yeah. Actually, we need to make the owner as a not root. Uh, that's why 755 will work. Otherwise, 777. Okay, that's right. Okay. With the minus R, you mean to say there's no need to give me 777, right? Once I make owner of the root? No, no, actually. In, minus no, R is recursive, uh, but you don't have directories under it. So the okay, minus R okay. is recursive if you have multiple directories inside. That's correct. Okay, okay. It's a recursive part. Okay. Uh, but uh, your question, Gaurav, in case if uh, the, this thing doesn't come, uh, what you call, uh, if the not root is not the owner, uh, how do we do it with the command? Uh, Gaurav, I'm giving you one. Sorry, what was that? I'm giving you the command. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Okay. So after this, you uh, so first run ch one and then run ch mod minus minus r is not needed. After that, you can run ch mod. Okay. So, so the sequence one. should be the way around. The okay. Two commands okay. See, uh, change owner is the first one, and then ch mod with seven five five, right? Yes. Okay. Or the seven 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 is also okay. Great, great. Thank you, Gaurav, and thank you, Paras. Let me say that. I just put this in my cheat sheet. So, what you want us to run within that confluent? Uh... Just the confluent. Uh, Once you give confluent, it will give you the uh, the list of options, right? So it should give you with the output what we are seeing. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm done with that step. That's right. So we'll tell you how you can manage your platform and all that. Of course, you don't have to go down to the bin directory and do that. You can directly run it and it will give you the, the, uh, the option. That's the idea. Yeah, that's working. Thanks. Great. And before this, you yeah, will have to create a directory as well. So you can add mkdir That's right. and the full part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minus p. Yeah, minus p. It's a small p. Oh, yeah. Perfect. The small thing sometimes irritates you a lot, you know, so better to keep a document from that, that will be helpful. So others uh, were you able to finish off with uh, the things guys, where are we with our steps? Uh, Bhaskar, how is it going now? Scott? What about you, Vijay? Were you able to finish up with the hands-on frame? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. And just a quick question out of curiosity. So why were you moving your Confluent to slash OPT? Was there any reason um, apart from uh, it just looks nice uh, for uh, such things to be installed under OPT? No, uh, ideally the purpose was that uh, uh, if there are multiple uh, 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 versions that needs to be done. So this is the pattern that we typically have it in the bank. So if there are multiple softwares that we need, we will put it under OPT and that's the only reason. Otherwise I could have just kept it in my lab software 
uh, sorry, lab, uh, yeah, software, that's right. Lab software confluent. You see, you saw that until now I have never moved anything to EPT. Everything was in lab software confluent. The only purpose is when there are multiple versions that needs to be done. Uh, it's it's a, a this approach that we typically follow in the bank for doing it. But that's the only reason. And frankly speaking, the reason was that the path went wrong, right? So it was not working for me. So I just followed the steps to see, and then luckily it worked for me. So that was the real reason, uh, friend. Got it. Okay, so I mean, just for the sake of you know uh, keeping it simple, you can also uh, what you can do, uh, you can issue a command like this, uh, and uh, let me give you. So we could, we can still do this and just save some hassles or save some steps. If that's correct. Just give us a, soft, a link of it pointing to uh, that document, right? The last thing what you sent me, got up, right? Right, yeah. So yeah. instead of moving the folder to slash opt and then creating the soft link, we can just do this uh, on the, within this lab software itself. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. So this is also uh, one more way. That's good because uh, uh, we ideally move the link also to software and then do that. So that's what we ideally do. But then this can be done also. That's great. Or you download your tar file to that location itself slash opt instead of downloading it to lab, lab that's correct that's correct because the you know uh, the, the downloaded copy would be there in downloads so what i typically do is that it will be there in downloads and i don't have to worry about it uh, only while the installed copy will be moved at, uh, over there you see my link over here all the downloads will be there in my uh, home not through downloads only see not true yeah so we are meant to say the start command Tar command you can change uh, to have it untar directly into the slash. That's program. correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yep, yep, yep. Because frankly speaking, I haven't, I didn't look too much into it because it was giving me this sleeping issue, right? But then that's a good suggestion. I definitely do that. So now that we have this command confluent version showing version, right? Are we going to start the KSH? Uh, uh, yeah, so once again, so this is what you will have to be doing. So I'll just uh, show that. So you will just have to ensure that the Zookeeper and the Kafka servers are running. And then you can just do your uh, KSQL uh, server start and pointing to the properties. Remember earlier we had started our files that way. And then simply type KSQL and you will enter into your uh, KSQL prompt and you can play around with that. So the whole idea is just to show you how you can enter into the path. So okay. yeah, so I'll just put this also in the, you know, for the timing, I'll just keep it like, no, I'll put it in the cheat sheet, uh, what I'm doing so that you'll know that this can be done. So let me go back to my cheat sheet and just show it over here. And what I can do is I can remove the dot slash because I don't have to do this because earlier the problem was that it was uh, uh, there. So ideally, you don't have to go to the folder and do that. So it will directly work. So these two commands will directly work my way. Baskar, I uh, had some question, Baskar. No, no, I don't, I don't. Sorry. That's okay, dear. No worries. So just wait here. So once uh, your uh, Confluent is installed, friends, uh, this is what you will have to do to ensure that you start with your uh, KSQL so that uh, we saw the first part of it, that is the connect, then this is what is the KSQL part of it, and then we have got the last one that is the streams part of it also. So just try this and ensure that you're entering into the prompt. And then you can play around with uh, this. The objective is just to show you that these things are there so that you can work with it. Thank you.
Oh, when did you put them in the cheat sheet? The command to start the case call. Yes, yes, I have done that, friend. See, it's here. You will start your Zookeeper and Kafka server. Uh, I should just mention with the new confluent uh, command with the confluent uh, 5.3.1. In fact, that's what I'm also doing right now, Vine. So I started with these two things. And then I can start with this. I can run it directly from here, from my uh, 5.3.1. I don't have to go down to the pin directory. In fact, I can run it from anywhere because since the path is there, right? Sorry, wait, wait, what is the sheet name? I forgot. I'm looking at the day three document. Where is this Albertson's Kafka uh, document? My friend, this is the cheat sheet that I have created, right? See, tiny URL on the first day. I'll just put this for you. Whatever the, whatever. Oh, the tiny URL. Okay. Exactly. So today, at the end of the day, after the test, uh, we can just take out a printout of this and keep it with you also. So uh, the other document, I'm not putting it there because I've already given it to you, right? That's the reason. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Paras. Sure. Thank you, Suki, for Kafka server. Okay. So this is what you should be achieving, friend. So uh, thanks, uh, Paris. So that helped me in doing this because this is what I wanted to achieve. So that once you're entering into the prompt and you can play around with this. So what I have, I've got all the three components running. That is my Kafka server, my, sorry, my Zookeeper, my server.properties and my ksql server.properties. And then when I go down to ksql, you will get into the ksql. So please ensure that you have done this. So now you can play around with the KSQL and then do that. To be very frank, uh, we haven't uh, worked much on this uh, till now because the KSQL is still uh, don't really know because when I read it, I found it to be very good, but then don't really know why Banks is not looking at it today. Basta, I just wanted to check with you. Uh, how long are you using the Kafka part uh, in your organization right now, friend? Probably less than a month, actually. It's like a couple of weeks. Okay, okay, okay. Then it's okay. Because then that means you wouldn't have explored on the other things, right? So there's no probability of you using uh, the confluent at all. So that's perfectly fine. No way, yeah. We are just, just run like. Sure, sure.
So I think Gaurav and Paras, you would have reached here, right? This particular step. Yes, we yes. are waiting for such prompt. Yes. That, that's great, thank you. So this is uh, the thing that we want to see. So I'll just uh, wait, quickly wait for the others to just reach up, maybe another uh, 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 three, four minutes, but then the steps are here very clear how to start this. See here, friend, you can start in this fashion, okay? And uh, in fact, you don't even have to do this. Just say ACQ. And you can go out of the print directory. I don't need to be there in that directory. That means this dot dot will go. Perfect. Just taking the screenshot and putting it in the document so that you know that uh, this is the way how case equal will look like. And Vinay, uh, almost finished Vinay. Where are you in the steps? Oh, sorry, Vijay. Yeah, I'm done. You're done, that's great. Uh, Scott, can we move on, Scott? Where are you right now, Scott? And Vinay, uh, what about you, friend? Yep, um, almost done, so. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Scott, have you finished this dia? Or where are we? Moving there, that's okay. So great guys. So I'll just wait for another two minutes and then we'll move on, friends. Thank you. In fact, I'll just take a quick bio break and come back. Give it two minutes, guys. Thanks. Okay, guys, uh, back. So let's uh, move on, folks. So we saw how to go ahead with the uh, KSQL part of it. We saw how to go ahead with the connect part of it. 
Now, from the streams perspective, uh, what you will have to do is a set of commands are there in the uh, Kafka streams. So this also, I will be just putting it in the uh, document so that you can see how we can work with this Kafka streams. It's very similar to what we have already done in, my, in our normal streams, okay? The only thing is that uh, uh, a simple word count uh, application to see how we can go ahead and create those things. So this application is already there with the de facto uh, installations. So that was that is what is the whole idea. So let me just copy this whole thing and put it in our uh, location. That is our cheat sheet. I will just mention after the diagram, we will now be working on the streams uh, part of Kafka and see how we can run this whole thing. So I've given you the complete uh, list as to how we can uh, play around with that friends. Okay, so this is something that we will also look at to see how the streams API would function. So once we are done with this, uh, we are done with the different concepts of what we have learned until now, friends. Okay, so what we have learned till now would be till now would be uh, day one and two was primarily on the Kafka part of it. So to understand the Kafka concepts. Then day three was primarily on the uh, Avro part of it. And then uh, about the new things, what we had, that was Kafka Connect, Kafka uh, KSQL, and the streams part of it. Okay. It is <coughs> primarily on the uh, Avro uh, serialization part of it. Then we spoke about Kafka Connect. You set up your land loop, okay, and uh, then we went ahead with our KSQL and streams part of it, okay. So with that, uh, we would be after this. There will be a small test that we will be having, friends. So uh, uh, we we should ideally have it after the break to have the small test to see where we are. But as of now. We will go ahead and try to finish up with this hands-on on the uh, Kafka streams also. Okay, so let's try to finish up this. And as for the roadmap, uh, right now it should be about yeah uh, two thirty-five. So we will take about uh, ten minutes or fifteen minutes to finish up this. Then take up a break and then come back and look at the complete thing to see what questions what you're having and see the format of how things would be done. So that's what would be the plan, depending upon what kind of questions you have and all of those things, if any, then we will see how, how we will go ahead with the things. Okay, so let's try with the streams part of it right now, friends. Thank you. I'm available over here. So just uh, muting myself, folks. Thanks. Hey Venkat, uh, the last I'm trying to yeah do the KSQL starting uh, right the last two comments no no that... do do it like this friend go down to the OPT confluent location and just type KSQL server dot start it will work here. One second. Sure. I don't need to put the properties. No, 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 no. Go to the case equal because it will be over there itself. In the bin, yes. Uh, no, 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 not the bin. Come outside the bin. You can go in the bin also. No issues, but then you have to give a dot slash then because you are there in the current directory, right? Hmm. We already given it in the path. So directly give case equal. And that is the way how I started also on my screen there. So in the confluent, I should just give case SQL. Uh, one start. second, in, one second. I can give the whole command to you right now. Just one second. I'm just scrolling up in my list. And 
it was successfully started on my system. One second. There we go. So no, you have to give bin and this is the part. And I'm putting it in the chat window so that you can have a look at that. There we go. Got it, Bhaskar? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, just run that and you're all set then. Then it will start with the KSQL server. Okay. And uh, after that, you will have to go back to a normal window, just type KSQL, and then you're inside that. Once you're done, Bhaskar, just give me a go ahead, uh, put, a, put something in the chat window so that I know that it is also done. And then you will have to go down to the next one that is uh, that is below the diagram, what I have pasted in my uh, comment chat. We'll, we'll work with the streams part of the Kafka. Fantastic. Paras has already given me the output. That's beautiful, Paras. Thank you. Uh, no, you won't be able to see the messages in uh, KSQL, friend. Because, uh, no. So for, for doing that, uh, in fact, the KSQL part of it not worked a lot in the KSQL. So uh, for, for the integration part of it, once it's done, by default, it won't come. That's for sure. So we will have to just go back and see uh, how do we integrate it. Because the, the uh, challenge is one, uh, all these things are different components uh, and to, to process it, it would be in a different fashion. So with KSQL, frankly speaking, Paris might not know about that. Okay. So okay. have to see how the integration happens here. Okay. But in the other tool, we were able to see the messages on topic, right? So if we are able to connect that tool with this, uh, Zuki no, no. Works, broker. Can no, we see no. that? No, no. See. Uh, okay, we are talking about which tool are you talking about? The Paris? web tool which we did before lunchtime, right? Uh, no, no, that was Lando. So Lando, was not, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not integrated connect, with this. Yeah? So can we connect in, integrate that one, that tool with this Zuki and server and Kafka? Very much. Very much. So then I can see, right? Then I, I'll be able to see. Very much, very much. Then okay. we can see. Only thing is that a little bit of integration work would be over there. And that is exactly what the JP have done. So they have got Lando as, as their environment so that at the development time, people can see how things are running. And when the code moves out, it will go down to your uh, confluent and you'll be able to see all of that. Okay. So that's what they have done here. Okay. Sure, thanks.
So Venkat, if I download lenses and configure, so there is in lenses, there's a configuration, right? Where we can de define the uh, lenses topics, um, bro yes. lenses, Kafka, brokers, host. So if I configure those for this one, right. lenses right. will start showing then. Yes, will then it? it will show. Then it will okay. show, that's for sure. Okay. Because the only thing that was there is a little bit of a configuration work to see how the data movement will happen. Because uh, the topics, if they are properly done in uh, the uh, lenses, you will be able to see it in the UI also. Okay, let me try download that. Okay. Sure, sure. Guys, uh, post lunch, uh, I mean, post our tea break, I just wanted uh, uh, as many people as to be there, friends, so that we can uh, go ahead and do. So my plan is that we will stop at around uh, uh, 2 50 uh, your time. Uh, that means in about another six minutes, we will take up our tea break. Presumably, if you're finished with this, or 55, then come back by around the 3, 10, your time. And then I would need the last uh, uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes wherein we can walk through what we have learned till now with a small set of questions. And uh, I would want answers to be given by people, friend. And you can reply that with a private message to me and put it on the uh, group chat, my dear. Okay, so that I'll know what people are answering, how things are. So that will be a quick kind of a revision on what all things we have done. So we would start off that uh, tentatively by around uh, 325 your time frame. So just wanted you guys to be there at that time. And I'm sure Bhaskar, Gaurav, Paras, uh, and uh, Abhijay should be there. Scott, do you think you'll be available for half an hour from 320 to around uh, 350 your time, Scott? If you're there? Sure. Yeah, I'll be there. Okay. Great, great. Thank you so much, dear. What about you, Vinay? Uh, can you make your time available between 320 to 350, friend? Sure. Great. Thank you so much. And I don't know if Susan is there. Uh, Susan, are you there, Susan? No, I don't think so. She is there. So we will have to skip Susan and uh, Brandon because. Uh, Actually, also Brandon was tied up with many things, so he could not make it. And even Susan is not there. So we will go ahead with the other six of you. So try to quickly uh, summarize what all things we have done. So after the uh, break uh, at around the 3.20 time, for half an hour, we'll go through and then revise the whole things and all that. Thank you so much. And one last thing before we go for the break, uh, that will be there in about another four minutes or a little bit more than that. You'll have to just confirm if you are able to see the results from the streams. Paras has already confirmed it on the chat that he's seeing the output. So please go ahead and see if you can, if you're able to see the results. In the results you're talking about the stream document. Uh, That's correct. That's correct. The stream part of it, friend. This this stuff that we are seeing there. The last one, dear. Is it in the same? Or how come I'm not seeing it? One second. Yeah. Just go down a little bit. That is the streaming part of it, dear. That's the last part that we're seeing here. Thank you, Gaurav. In the tiny URL page, right, Vijay? It is over there. Yeah, I mean, I entered, I was playing around with KSQL, and then you're talking about streams is what, right? That's correct. After the case equal, once you enter the console of the case equal, that's what we have stopped. And after that, the streaming part is there, friend. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I did. Yeah, yeah. Sure. 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 Hey, uh, Venkat, uh, I have a very basic question. Um, Please. Um, I, I missed to call, ask yesterday. So, when we say that scaling uh, Kafka, can I, what do we actually mean by it, and what are the uh, parameters we 
have in our handle to scale. Okay. So when I say scale, Scala, that would mean that... Uh, not, not Scala. I mean, a, a scaling... Uh, sorry, sorry. Graph. That's right. Scale, uh, wrong terminology, Bhaskar. So I meant uh, Kafka only. So when we say scale Kafka, uh, it would mean that the number of messages are going to be more from the uh, consumers. So that would mean that you, are, uh, you will create more topics on the in the Kafka layer, you will mm -hmm. create uh, additional uh, partitions in the layer uh, so that you can have uh, those topics going down into the respective uh, partitions. One second, dear. I just muted my you so that you can hear me clearly, friend. And then uh, uh, you, you would have more number of uh, uh, producers and consumers to see depending upon the use case. So that is what is the scaling part of it when we talk about it. So the, the purpose of this thing was to show you how the things will happen, what all are the steps that we'll have to see. Scaling, I think what you will still have to do is that with respect to the performance, uh, uh, maybe uh, once you get a little bit familiarized with the existing things, uh, get into a, a one day session wherein we talk about only about the way how we can improve the capability of the application. So we provide those things Things as a base kind of a training. So we, we can help you out with it, wherein we don't talk about the basics or something. You would actually be, would have done that. We will just uh, add to it and ask about the other things, uh, how to scale it, my dear. So that's my view, Basket. I'll just unmute you. Okay. Um, so when we add a broker, it is mainly for replication or fault tolerant purposes, right? It is not going to help with the scale, additional broker. No, no. Uh, the reason why we create brokers is because once you saw the Kafka Connect, I would really can leave about the brokers and uh, continue with my topics and uh, partitions and all that. So as things goes ahead and by using more of Confluent, uh, you can use your Kafka, you can use your uh, stuff that we saw earlier, right? So if I just scroll up, that is your, just one second, dear. Yeah? I'll just um, mute you a little bit because uh, I think it's my own echo that is coming there. No worries. Yeah, that's better, dear. So uh, let me go down to this architecture so that you can, this diagram so that you can see it. Uh, let me go back to this one. Yeah, there we go. So uh, when we talk about connect already being uh, put via the worker and uh, all of those things, when more number of uh, sources are coming, that will be taken care of by the connect architecture. And uh, what will be there over here would be primarily topics. And that's the way how we look at it. So by, by putting in the connect uh, cluster, a lot of the mundane work that the Kafka cluster was talking about, the, uh, uh, the multiple brokers and see how that, that goes out of your hand, my dear. That's what I was trying to say, Bhaskar. I'll unmeet you. Make sense? Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, So, but uh, the basic reason for adding a, another broker is mainly for replication, meaning the replication can be only one within a broker, right? There is one broker has only one instance. No, that's right. But then when so, we talk, so that's correct. But then again, we are getting away from the producer and all those things, right? As of now, there's a producer who's talking to it. He's passing on to a broker and then it is getting written to a topic in the cluster, right? When we talk mm -hmm. about the basic Kafka now, but with the new APIs that is coming up with the cluster connect uh, cluster, uh, the connect uh, cluster architecture that we are seeing, uh, those will be taken care of by the individual connectors, which will connect to the different systems, right? So the producer and the consumer will go away. Still, the brokers w uh, would be still there, but then. Uh, uh, that is res with respect to how the data is going to uh, be there in the different partitions, right? So one broker can have uh, multiple topics and how he's going to write into it, right, friend? That's the idea. Yeah, so no, one broker has multiple topics. Each topic can have multiple partitions and uh, right. uh, the consumer groups accesses those partitions. Uh, that's fine. Perfect. So having another, another broker is uh, so that the first broker goes down then there is another backup which has the same data to handle it. Um, that is that replication. Is, that is replication, yeah. right? Yeah. So you know, the adding the another broker does not help you with the scale. No, I, I'm just for for the discussion. I'm just leaving the connector 
part out okay, of it okay. and just looking okay, at okay. the graph kind of right? Okay, so yeah, that's right. That's right. If I if I uh, look at from the scale perspective, that will not be there. So when you're saying that you have got a source which has got a lot of uh, scale of data that is coming in. So ideally, if you want to scale, you will have to have uh, multiple partitions that would be created. And that would mean that it could be there in uh, one broker or uh, multiple brokers. So not yes, necessarily you should have multiple but, brokers, but ideally, multiple, yes. Yeah, the multiple brokers is not helping with the scale. It is helping with the fault tolerance is what, what I'm trying to get at. No, that's correct. So th that's what. So uh, it won't help. Multiple brokers won't help with the scale part of it. So if you are, if you have got huge scale that is coming down, your your partitions, uh, the topics will become full, and you'll have to go ahead with multiple partitions. Uh, yes. Faster. Yes. So so the size of the broker or the capacity of one broker is uh, the one which determines the scale rather than having multiple brokers. Multiple that's brokers correct. is for a failed uh, meaning uh, in the number the main broker uh, falls down then the second broker is there to help at the same state of the data and everything that's the that's reason correct. for the second broker okay that's correct that's correct yeah okay thanks sure sure and and uh, you might also have to look at the uh, the architecture that i have just mentioned because since you guys are using confluent you would be using connect uh, do you have any idea whether a uh, connect and uh, k sql and uh, the streams api are being used right now or are you going to use it any any idea on that i i, I have no idea i don't know to be first. Okay. Uh, is, I, I don't know if others know anything about it Others, if you know anything about this, because what was told to me from uh, the uh, training team was that, yes, we are going to implement that. People will have to know about how things are. So just give them an overview. So that's why, because when they said that they want to go in depth and talk about it, I told them clearly, KSQL is not what I have done. I have done the connect part of it. So I have not done the KSQL part of it. So they said that, okay, just give them the basic introduction so that they will come to know. They will be using it later. And like I told you, March of uh, next year is when they are planning to go ahead with it. Uh, 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 what do you call one more session to specifically on these architectures? That's what they had said. So, Paras, any idea whether you are using Connect or something? Paras, Gaurav, Vinay, Vijay, Vinay. We are not using uh, Connect as of uh, today. Actually, I'm from the DevOps team uh, myself, so <clears throat> I can answer that. Like, we haven't set up anything on the KC, uh, KSQL part or the Connect part yet. So we haven't heard anything specific uh, on this yet. But yeah, I mean, we are going to use KSQL. That's what I have been hearing from Paris team uh, and uh, the uh, schema registry. Okay, the schema registry, yes, for the agro part of it. Uh, what was the second thing what you mentioned, Gaurav? What is the schema registry? What else are you using? Going to use? Uh, KSQL. KSQL. We okay. are not using it, but we, uh, what I've heard is we intend to use it, KSQL. Okay, okay, okay. Nothing about the streams or nothing about the uh, 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 the other one, right? No, uh, I haven't uh, got a word of okay, these things okay. yet. Okay, okay. So I think that's what the picture is, Bhaskar, because if that is going to be the case, then I think uh, within about uh, five months of actual deployment, or six months into it, you would know about how these things are going to work. And we might end up having another session on KSQL somewhere in March, which will be for two days to talk more about it, you know? So I think that that could be the roadmap for Buster. Okay. 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 Yeah, sure. No Can you also talk about uh, like monitoring maybe later, uh, like what sort of monitoring should be uh, there in the production systems and uh, um, maybe like around logging as well, you know, what we can maybe uh, capture from the logs because what we have seen is like Kafka logs are uh, not uh, like that helpful most of the time because they are like maybe too verbose or like not having very meaningful information at least uh, like let's say we are troubleshooting a production issue where, you know, someone is saying like I'm not able to talk to the uh, Kafka or like a particular offset is just mismatching or things like these like what we can do from monitoring and uh, Kafka logs perspective. Okay. 
Oh, okay, so uh, if, if you're looking at the monitoring part of it, that is uh, to look at whether the messages have come, whether you are already seeing whether the things are flowing. Remember what the Bhaskar was saying last time that hey, he wants to know that somebody has sent them about the 20,000 messages, whether I see those messages or not. So that is what would be there in the uh, standard land loop uh, images as well as with the Cloudera uh, logs also. So the message part of it, uh, I've shown you last time also, right? in the land of image, you can see those things. But then when you're talking about the logging part of it, uh, if you want to look at debugging, the way how JP works on this thing is, uh, they are pretty much getting everything from the log only. See, what we'll have to realize is Kafka doesn't know anything about the data that is going to go into a topic, okay? So if it doesn't know anything about the data, it is not going to come in the log at all. So the log monitoring would be primarily to do with to see whether a service is running or whether the service is not running. So we have to look at it from that perspective. If you are looking at whether I have got the required number of messages and all of those things, I will have to actually monitor the topics and see that data without looking at the logging. So if I'm looking from the, uh, uh, the messages perspective, logs is going to be immaterial for me. I'm not even going to look at that. I will have to look at the dashboards and the, uh, the other pictures to see whether, hey, I have got it or not. So that's the way how we look at it, uh, Gaurav, and to see how the debugging can be done. So with respect to your thing, I think there is a, a, a little bit of a detailed document, even if you look at the Confluent thing. So that is what I was trying to show that to you. Just give me one second. Let me go back to my talks. I had uh, given that link post our uh, uh, this thing, uh, lunch. So let me just scroll up, not this, go over here. And where is post lunch? There we go. So if you look at uh, this one, so primarily monitoring logs and those things will be there in the default link, what you are seeing over here. So you will come to know, and, and since you're using Confluent thing, that's the reason I'm telling you to go back over here and see your monitor and manage. There are a complete set of things how you can monitor and manage, what are the things that you can look at. And this is what even Bhaskar said, that if you can show me some screenshots, unfortunately, they will all be properly done when you have got the 30-day Kafka trial kind of a thing, you know. So it won't be even coming in the standard image what you're having. So this is where, see, how you can do the Docker logging. The logging and all that is to see whether the components are working or not. In case if you want to see the data, I think primarily you have to look at the control center and see how the details will be shown to you there. That's the way how to look at it, uh, uh, got it. Make sense? Yes. Sure. So for monitoring aspect, you're saying like we should uh, be like uh, maybe just looking at the control center, uh, but like let's say we don't have the control center, like there is no other way to like uh, check the uh, health of the broker or that's where the land loop comes in. That's where the land like, loop what comes do you look uh, actually, my question is more around like, what do you look for? Uh, like, uh, what things you should be looking for for the uh, broker's health? Like, what should I be looking for? You know, my broker is healthy or not? Like, what are the typical things? Like, except for the disk space, of course, which should be uh, good enough for the data to be stored. But what else we should be looking for for the broker to be healthy? Okay, no, uh, see, there are only two things when you talk about the broker. You either he will be dead or he'll be alive. There's no concept of health awareness over here because that would again depend upon the size of data, what we are storing into the cluster and how things would look like, you know. So that <coughs> that is one thing I mean, that we will have to look at, friend. This kind of relates to the question that Bhaskar was mentioning earlier, right? Uh, he's why saying all the point of adding the broker so, uh, from what we understand so far is uh, for fault all right, so that you can replicate into one more node. But let's suppose if I have one broker and have has some multiple partitions into which the data, data is being written, if I have a monitoring saying that, hey, these are the partitions on, that we can see on the UI, these are overloaded or owned or out of memory or whatever, then those are the kind of things or signals which can tell us, hey, you have to spin up a broker so that the partitions can be extended to other nodes. No, it depends upon the data what we are having, Nadia. So there, there are two aspects of your question, Ben. One is what we will have to be very clear is the uh, that, that data
data part of it that is what will be displayed onto the screens and see uh, whether the uh, whether it is uh, being overly used or there's a lot of uh, data that is being there because ultimately the kafka broker is not going to handle it he's going to put it into a location you saw it in our examples also right he will put it into a particular folder structure where and that is supposed to be a, a, a what do you call network uh, drive we don't have to worry about those things so if he is alive and if he is seeing there's no question that he is overworked so that will not be the case because at the end of the day you can uh, conflict will give you a performance chart to see what is the performance running of the individual brokers you know so that is one aspect of it the second aspect of it is to do the logging part of it logging is the working of kafka and uh, monitoring is also the working of kafka to see in case if you want to see the data part of it that will be or the message part of it that will be stored into a location and that is something that will be shown in the uh, control center my dear that's what i was saying i mean makes sense okay okay yeah. Uh, so coming from your perspective gaurav uh, that that's what i was looking at gaurav makes sense a little bit as to what you should look for and how you should look for gaurav yeah yes uh, and uh, another question like uh, so recently what happened like uh, last uh, week and actually last to last weekend uh, one of the production application was complaining like uh, i'm able to read uh, from all the topics but like one topic wasn't uh, working so uh let's say like they somehow lost uh, the offset uh, or the offset is like not uh, sitting at a good uh, you know value within the kafka and they want to go back uh, without uh, changing much on their side is there a way we can uh, change things in kafka or we should not be doing that way like uh, it should be more on the application side to uh, you know read the data again no it should be more on the application side to read the data a quick answer for this solution is create one more group id and have a consumer start it he can read all the data right we have actually done this hands on in our uh, example also if you remember i think it was uh, uh, the, the in top to the first example that we had seen so the fourth application so when he was reading it nothing new is added so once he read it he can read the data again right because the cursor has already moved in case if you want to read everything again create one more client and you can see those data so so the, the short answer of uh, what you are asking for friend is anything related to the topic and the messages will have to be dealt kafka wouldn't know about that my dear that is more at the business logic level because uh, when we come from a traditional environment we always think that it is correlated okay the java program is running something is happening on the server and things are happening but here we are very clear the data part of it is has to be there in the form of monitoring in the form of seeing what is happening and all of those things the uh, logging part of it will be only the working of those systems my dear so the short answer to your thing would be just create another client and he could see all the results uh, in that right or do it from from beginning and you can see or from a particular stage i've given you a step where in uh, if you know the stage till a particular level he can assign and from then he can read everything right we did that example also garav so that's how you should try to solve these kind of issues here okay so you're saying like we should be leveraging the application side of configs more uh, in order to uh, like uh, come uh, or like solve these problems exactly exactly doing it on the server or the log will not tell you anything uh, whether what message is being read or whether everything is right or on, and those things the log will only tell you the performance of those things so that is what the beauty is it's it's very different from our existing architectures where 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 things are overlapping here it is very clear the business kafka doesn't even know what is going into a topic and and he is not even bothered with that so it is good for us so that will be there in the uh, uh, visualization part of it where people can see the contents and all that and we should see look at from this angle when you are trying to solve it also so when you are trying to solve an issue whether it is the health of kafka or whether it is the message that you want to see from there you can you can uh, uh, track to see how to solve it my dear okay okay so the confluent ui should give us uh, the application teams the ability to uh, view yes. the message yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. The contents of Kafka would be primarily the viewing of the data. We saw that in Lando also, right? You can actually view the data and see how many messages are coming and all of those things. So the Confident AI will be able to do that. That is one part of it. The second part of it is what Gaurav was asking about the health of my system, how the uh, things are working and uh, how things are running. So that's what uh, I think even Vinay, uh, sorry, Vijay was saying, hey, uh, in case if uh, the brokers are increased, uh, the broker consumption is more, but that is at a risk level, right? I wouldn't really worry about it. So either he'll be running or he'll be not running. It's not that he is going to be in a bad state or uh, his utilization is going to be high. If it is high, that's because more messages are coming. So we should look at that from that angle, dear. Make sense, uh, Buster? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to see that uh, the demarcation between uh, the Kafka team and the application team in, in the sense like uh, messages are coming from source to start that yeah applications exactly. so i'm i'm trying is in that case we have to probably see in other things we can probably go with correlation id to see that okay you log the correlation id from the source and even the middleware and the target and the correlation ids are obviously correlated in uh, splunk or other places so right. here uh, um, we can probably go with the um, what's the other op code uh, the marker what, what was the term i forgot for what, uh, Pascal? Uh, no, no, in the sense like we can, the callback, we can get the uh, message location, right? That's correct. Yeah, so, so that, that. Yeah. yeah, maybe we have to have some strategies to do that. So that uh, clearly it, it will prove that not probably, it's a, not a problem of Kafka, like the source and target are very clear that the messages are reconciled. That's correct. So the reconciliation, in what you said, it is more at the application level. It's not there at the Kafka level at all. We don't have to touch the Kafka because that is more to do with the performance of the system, whereas this is with related to your business. Yeah, so to, to, to help with that, then we have to have a view of the messages in the Kafka also. Right? For applications teams have to have a way of looking at Kafka to see that uh, messages are there. The, the thing is like, um, they, it may be a bad uh, code on the producer side or the bad code on the consumer side that messages were lost uh, or it was not processed properly. It was error out or whatever, right? To, to find out where the problem is, uh, they will have to look at Confluent uh, um, UI to see the messages, to see that, okay, yeah, this is the message. It was actually coming correctly from the source. Then the problem probably is in the consumer. That's so it's right. almost like the applications themselves have to keep track of the partition and the offset of each message that they're pulling off, right? And then they can have that mapping between partition, offset, and the you know order ID or whatever. Right? That way you can kind of go back and look. Yeah, yeah. So either we go with partition. Yeah, if partition uh, number and uh, the offset number is uh, stable and it is not going to change in that sense. Yes. No, it's never going to change. Yes, then we will lose that also. Like we can't go like partition one, uh, offset seven, and there is then if this keeps changing, then this will be a problem. In that case, then we might have to stick with the uh, uh, in other MQAs where we have a correlation ID for each message. Yeah, so I guess you're right because it's going to only be there for seven days. So yeah, it will change. You're right. So, so the uh, offset will change after uh, seven. When will it uh, reset, Vikas? Uh, uh, Every seven days, that is by default. So no, no, let's see, um, messages are there in the Kafka for seven days, assuming that seven days is the retention period. That's correct. Right? So on day one, I start uh, putting it into partition one. Um, okay. On day seven, I had put, let's say 70 messages total. Right? Okay. On day eight, uh, what will be the offset? It will, what be, will, be, it, it will be the first day, whatever messages came, that would have gone. And okay. hey, hey, hey. Okay, I got it. it. The messages will go, but the offsets won't change, right? It is because of Kafka is going to be the way how it is going to, you cannot change something. So it is always going to append to it only, you know? So just because so, something got deleted, the numbers won't change. So right? the, for the part, let's say for partition one, the mm -hmm. offset will be 71 on the eighth day, right? Okay, okay. And uh, if the partition one is reset or restarted, then all the offset, uh, values are gone that's correct then, right that's okay 
that's correct because you are uh, because restarting with the faucet uh, or if something goes down when we are doing it so the other other uh, people who are there in the same partition they will be the, the, those brokers will have these partitions also right because we saw that how the partitions are attached to the brokers right so they did yes, get yes. those things so let's say if i read from a uh, uh, broker one uh, topic one partition one mm. and uh, i read two messages the same is reflected on the broker 2 also right which is assuming that broker 2 is the replica of this that's correct the same would be on broker 2 but then so you, we would we would know of which broker we are going to read so replication is basically for a uh, redundancy kind of a scenario and uh, it, it wouldn't be it, it, you need not worry about replication you know mm -hmm. so uh, scott i think as yes, you as yes, you are also pointing out then probably a correlation id outside of this is a, a cleaner way to reconcile between source and target i think we cannot probably rely on uh, partition and offsets it can uh, it can be there for like a couple of days where if you want to look at it immediately and hopefully that uh, partition is not recycled or restarted or partition is not killed for any other reason then yes uh, if if partition is uh, recycled or uh, it went down and we have to bring up other partition then uh, all the reconciliations for that will be kind of off no 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 it's not true though cuz you have replication right so, the, so that exact same partition with the exact same offset will be replicated across all your brokers so let me to understand that the other broker uh, the partition and uh, offsets are living there so in other words let's say we are starting a, a kafka implementation and kafka is live from let's say day 1 Two years from now, or meaning one year from now, just for our understanding, we haven't. Uh, uh, there are two, two or three brokers, so that uh, Kafka is running twenty four seven. There was no stoppage because one broker was down, the other was up, the other was down, the other was up. So we will have that continuity, and uh, the partition numbers will be perfectly same uh, even after one year. Is that how I, I, I understand? Just for my understanding, is that how it will be? I think in theory, I'm not sure if that's true in practice. No, that's, no, no, no it is right because I didn't answer uh, Scott is because what I said is exactly right. It will be the same thing as long as you have got two uh, partitions and seeing how things are. It will exactly be the same way, my dear. The guarantee is okay. that it will be there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Scott, I think yeah, we will probably start making use of the partition and uh, offset to at least log as part of the transaction logger. so we know that a message was read and uh, this is the key um, probably we have to log something and throw it into the oms logs um. yeah and if it's really important let's just extend it to like 30 days retention rather than 7 days right yeah i think that's uh, something which we have to work with uh, other teams and also devops um. that might be safe to start with and then we can scale it back if we need to just want to add something on what scott was saying uh, when we started off with it we didn't keep a lesser a duration we always started off with a higher duration because since we are learning things and we are seeing how things are happening so ideally we have to put down and say hey keep it for a longer duration so that at least we can understand and play with things once we have understood the working of it then we can go ahead and reduce the duration not start with a smaller duration start with a longer duration boss i think that's where you have to put your foot down and and see uh, we can go ahead with it that's how we should do I agree i think i think uh, the teams are also new so we are also looking for some better practices and best practices in these areas that's correct that's correct so i think that, that uh, for these things we should keep a longer duration that's what it should happen here okay okay thanks okay okay thanks okay one more thing one another question yeah yeah bro very good Uh, what what uh, is uh, like uh, how, how do you like come out with the right number of partitions uh, for a topic like uh, is there any kind of uh, like i mean idea behind it like you know based on these things you should come out with the number Uh, frankly speaking it, it's more to do with the business use case to see uh, the the way how the data would go the uniqueness of the data how the data is coming uh, in fact if you look at the content again there are ways uh, they give you some standard best practices to see what those things are you know So if you look at the complaint, once you know these things, they have given some best practices. But then, primarily, it will be the business use case to see how you are going to segregate the data. So uh, we said that one topic would have one data, right? And it will be read by one consumer. 
So if you are having the proper number of partitions, you will be able to segregate the data and then one consumer need not read from multiple places to get some data. So the way how we do it in JP is to see on the other side, who's reading that particular thing, you know? So that is what would help. So the, the, the short answer would be, what is the type of data that you want to do and ensure that that data will go down to one partition so that the, who's going to read that partition is going to be the consumer. So it's more to do with the, the way how the consumer reads it, that many, that much minimum, what all categories are there, that much minimum number of partitions should be there. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. Sure, buddy. Okay, now Paris was saying, why don't we see what happens to offsets uh, when I give this? Okay. No, I, so, was, uh, I was just telling, um, we, were, we were thinking, right? What will happen to offsets? I was saying, just put it to one minute, 60,000 okay. milliseconds, and then uh, see if the offset gets reset or if offset is maintained in the topic. Okay, okay, okay. You're giving the way how to do this. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one way of uh, seeing we can alter a topic and give the retention for only one minute and then see how it can happen. Okay, so uh, ideally, you can, you can this says, what Paras is trying to say is how we can actually implement it to see what can be done here. That's okay. So that's something that we can check. So I think what we will do is we'll take up a quick break right now, friends. Uh, so it's about uh, 3.20 a time. So we'll take a break till 3.35 and a small request everybody would be to just be here by around by 3.35 so that we can go through the uh, questions uh, part of it to see what all things we have learned to understand this. We have got a set of questions that I'm having and uh, the primarily nothing, this is not to check uh, what is the knowledge that you have learned and how, how, how much you have understood. This is just to see whether you're able to answer it or not here. So there are about 18 questions what we have over here. And let's see how people answer, what, are, what questions are there, and what, uh, I mean, uh, are you able to recollect what we have done. So this will just re-emphasize what we have done, guys, okay? So that's something that we will be doing once we come back. It's about 3.20. So we'll start again by 3.35 your time, and we'll continue with that, guys, okay? Thank you so much. Hey, guys, uh, thanks for your time, folks. So let's get uh, started. Uh, Bhaskar, are you back? Gaurav, Paras? I'm here. Okay, great. Huh? Thank you, buddy. Sure, sure. Thanks, Paras. And uh, Scott, you're back, Scott. Vijay? Yes. Great, thank you. And Abhinay, are you back? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So yep, I'm here. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you, Scott. Okay, folks. So we have seen those things. So now what we will do is just to summarize what we have learned. And the reply to a question, what we'll be giving is primarily in the chat so that we can discuss what we have done, guys. Okay, so this is what we had learned and we saw how the thing should happen. So now we will take a short quiz. There is no way of calculating how much you got, how much you didn't get. This is not going to be evaluated at all. Okay. So, but then the question is just to see whether we have understood it or not, so that we will come to know, okay, what is the efforts that we will have to take to reach that. Okay. So this is going to be total of uh, 18 questions. And uh, I would want you folks to uh, answer it on the chat window, guys. So I will be giving you two questions in one go. So you can just say question one and you can specify what the answer is. And uh, once the answers are done, then we will discuss on that particular question and take it forward. So trying to re confirm whatever things we have learned, if there is a doubt, and uh, trying to understand it, guys. Okay, so that's what we will be doing. So let's get started. So the, uh, the two questions that we have over here is, let me just scroll up a little bit, that's better. So please put it on the uh, chat window, guys. Uh, I already have your names, so that should not be a challenge. So please put it on the chat window and say what the answers would be. Thank you. Paras, Scott, Bhaskar, 
okay okay vijay vinay okay good good so i think uh, <clears throat> most of you have got it correct and yeah gaurav also gave me the answer okay so for the first one i think that the small doubt was there is kafka is a kind of publish subscribe or it is going to be publish retain and subscribe so the answer would be publish retain and uh, uh, subscribe friend okay so that's what uh, when the answer please reply to me privately or your answers will be going down to the other team members also my dear okay some of you have said that to that so that's okay so kafka would be the second one for the first question the point is b so that's correct so for the second question what all are the elements of kafka so i think some people have got it wrong but that's okay uh, the answer would be all of the above if you have got any questions please uh, uh, speak on those things say any clarifications we can discuss it guys okay so the elements of kafka ideally in question 2 would be all of the above because we have a topic we have a producer we have a consumer okay so that's why it will be uh, point number d which will be all of the above that's it let me scroll down so let me go down to the next two questions sorry go up a little bit that that's it okay so if possible try to give it back in the same chat so that it becomes a little bit easy for me guys good bye Question three is simple for that because uh, we had already mentioned that. Okay. Good. Okay. Good, Baskar. So pretty simple. So for uh, the third one, the retention level is ideally seven days. That's what we had said. And in Kafka, the components which holds the streams of data of the same type would be called as a, a broker or a topic. It is uh, definitely going to be a topic. Okay. So now, in case if the partition word would have been here also. Okay. Hold similar types of data. You can even think of it like a partition because partition would have some kind of a data which will go to the partition, right? So you will you can look it up from that angle also. So the answer for that, uh, the third one would be C, and I think uh, that's where some of you have got it wrong. Okay, but that's okay. So in Kafka, the component which holds the stream of the data. okay whereas some of you had wrongly said it as a different level so it is going to be a topic right here that's perfect that's great so now let me go down to the next two things that is question number 5 and uh, okay let me just keep 5 and then i'll give 6 and 7 my dear okay so some people might say that uh, we are talking about right now or somewhere in future so i'm talking about right now my dear okay some of you are saying that we don't need zookeeper but i think that was the first component that we started right okay so we would need uh, a zookeeper to run although the depend if, if somebody puts a question like this saying that the dependency of zookeeper is getting reduced day by day when we talk about kafka that is correct but then they haven't removed it until now the point here is that after some period of time that will be removed my dear but then as of now uh, you would need zookeeper uh, for kafka to run okay so that's why the right answer would be true my dear perfect 
Let's look at this six and seven. Right, uh, Vijay. Good. You must all of you got question number six right. Vijay, rethink your uh, answer number seven. Paras, look at it carefully, dear. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I, I had a wrong question. You are right, Paras. So for the first one, Kafka was created by LinkedIn. So that's correct. Good. Now, uh, the unit of data within Kafka. So what do you want it to be, Vinay? Is it going to be an array of bytes or it is going to be a message, right? So it is going to be a message. It can't be an array of bytes, my dear. Okay, so the unit of data within Kafka would be a message. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you look at it, uh, how would it be? Kafka stores the data in the form of an array of bytes. So that, uh, that would be a right perception. That would be the right the way to look at it here. Sure, perfect, no worries, friend. So now let's go down to the next two things. Yep. A two is a little bit dicey. That's what I thought. So look at your answer spot. The ninth one is simple. Vinay, uh, we are talking about the answer to the A is C, because you just mentioned C, so I was not knowing that. That's correct. Okay. So messages created by the producer is written to a topic or written to a partition. How would you answer that, my dear? So just wanted to know your views on it. Uh, Bhaskar, what do you suggest, my dear? You can unmute yourself and you can speak for a minute, friend. Sorry, which one? The eighth one. The messages created by a producer in Kafka is written into a topic or a partition. Yeah, I was slightly confused whether topic or partition. Obviously, it will go to partition, uh, right. but I thought it is written for a topic. When that, you're writing it. <laughs> that's right. So you will write it to a topic, but then it is written into a partition, right? So you are yep. giving it to a topic, but then the right answer. I just picked up your name, not that I saw your answer also, my dear. So nobody's oh, on right. it. Yeah, yeah. So that's why. So, so you're saying it is a, D is what you is the right answer for that's that. correct that's correct that's okay. correct okay. okay okay so in many of these things deliberately we have made it a little bit confusing so that you know the concept and see how it has to be answered so that's why perfect and uh, for the ninth one it's simple only one consumer in a consumer group can read the message yep all of you got it correct so no issues on that okay so the tenth one unfortunately i can't scroll up because uh, one second, let me see if two questions come. No, because of this uh, page break, it won't be there. Just only look at the 10th question and see what it is. I'll just mute you, Pascal. Thank you. Yep, it's pretty simple. So the unit of data in Kafka is called as a message. You said a commit log, uh, one of you. So do you think that is right, guys? I don't think so. So what is a commit log and how do you want uh, to describe that? So let's just take up Paris. Uh, Paris, uh, why did you mention it as a commit log? What would that be, dear? This commit log is something which is immutable, right? So you cannot change it. And uh, somewhere it was said, right, in Kafka, whatever we are writing, 
it is yeah. immutable. It, that's correct. But then when we talk about a unit of data, when we look at it from within Kafka, so mm -hmm. everything, what do we read and write? We read and write messages, right? Right. So that is, yeah, so that is why the message would be the right word other than a commit log. So commit log is also right, but then it is just from a different perspective, my dear. That's all friend. Okay. Sure. So that's great. Now let's look at the next two questions. We've discussed eleven and spoke about it quite a bit also. Must be it's eleven and twelve, my dear. Good spot. Look at that twelfth one. Take your time. Vinay and Paris, uh, you are saying if you are having multiple partitions in a topic, can we have ordering of all the partitions? No, my dear, right? So we can have ordering only at one partition level. We cannot have ordering for all the partitions, my dear. Okay. So some of you had mentioned that you can have that. No, we can have ordering for only one partition here. You cannot yeah, have ordering. ordering. Yeah, we're ordering within a partition, ordering of messages. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. So, so here when they say ordering uh, of all partitions, no, we cannot have that. So deliberately they have made it a little bit confusing, but then it is, uh, you can have only one partition can be ordered. You cannot have control the ordering across partitions. Okay? And the 12th one was the variable, which is, which will give the correct values of replications in Kafka, even when one of the replicas goes down. Yeah. We did spend quite a bit on this. Okay. Some of you are saying it is ISR. Some of you are saying it is replicas. So one thing for sure is that it is not partition or partition count. So ISR will always tell you the right answer, right? So that is the uh, one over here. Okay. Which will give you the correct values of the replications with the ISR replicas is a static way of doing it at the time when the program starts, right? So replicas will give you a constant answer you, that will not get changed at all. Whereas ISR will give you the right answer, my dear. Okay. So that's something that we will have to look. So yes, the concepts are very clear, but then sometimes some of these things, when we take up a test, we will see that some things uh, go wrong. We assume that that's, uh, that's uh, uh, understood by everybody, but sometimes that, that might not be the case here. So that's the purpose of this. Good. Let me scroll down to the next two. There we go. One of you mentioned for the 13 to 1 as D. That's not the right answer, my dear. D is not the right answer for the 13th one. For the 14th one, it's simple. We know that by default, uh, in, in the second example of our course, we have done 9093, 9094, but that the default listener port number will be 9092. Yeah, most of you got it correct. Uh, for the name of the zookeeper demon, it is called as Coram Pierre Okay, uh, guys, do anybody of you know what is X quorum here? So just wanted to check with you, uh, Gaurav, any idea about what is this X quorum peer mean? Taking a guess, high availability quorum peer. No, 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 no. That is there in because, see, the zookeeper is going to be a very critical component for edge base also. So in edge base, it is called as X quorum peer mean. Whereas uh, for in Kafka, it will be called as a Lipporum Pyramid. Correct on that, no worries. And let's go to the next two. In fact, I have only one right now because we are reaching the end of the page. 
this is interesting. I mentioned that. So from 0 0.9, something really changed. What was that? Good, Scott. Y, uh, A, uh, Vijay, that's not right here. So bootstrap server is what we have to provide, right? Is that changed or? No, 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 no. In the earlier version, we were writing Zookeeper. Yeah, we were using Zookeeper. That's correct. So okay, we are not providing it. That's right. So the changes in from 0 0.9, when we are starting it, we should have the details of the bootstrap server. Right. Bootstrap server is what we provide. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. So the answer is bootstrap server and not uh, the zookeeper because earlier we were having it as a zookeeper. Now that will be bootstrap server. No worries, friend. That's right. <laughs> so no worries. So there we go. The <clears throat> After this, just one more question. This is something that we saw today. Question number 16. No Paris, the answer would be no. We, we saw that today, right? So uh, it will be a simple build tool. The answer would be C, my dear. So simple build tool. And for 17, pretty simple. That's right, Scott. Right, Gaurav. So it will be the schema registry. And these are three more things, streams, KSQL, and the connect APIs. So these are the new things that is coming up. So uh, that, that those names are anyway not here, but those are also there and uh, in the Confluent package. But then uh, some of them are already there in their Apache Kafka also. So that's the reason why I did not say KSQL as of now, KSQL is there in Confluent mode rather than in Kafka. Uh, your connect is there in Kafka also. But one thing that is definitely that, uh, not there in Kafka is the schema registry. That's correct. And now let's go down to the last one, friends. Let's go down. Yep. Good Vijay, you remember that? Good Gaurav. You are, you are thinking it is going to be the default name, right? Vaskar and Scott? No, the answer is wrong, my dear. It is actually called a supported Kafka. That's correct. Most of you got it correct. So the primary purpose of this thing is just to see what all things are there and uh, how did we go ahead and see uh, how we can continue with those things. Steps. Okay, so that was the answer is going to be supported Kafka. So <laughs> that would be the uh, purpose of this uh, small QA kind of a session so that people will understand and see what they are going to have guys. Okay, so not uh, nothing, no numbering, nothing will be there, guys. So now, to just to summarize what we had done is day one and two, we saw about uh, 15, let me go to the beginning. I think it's 15, right? I don't remember. Day two, uh, let's go down to, no, 11. Uh, 10, 10 exercises is what we did on day two. Day three is where uh, we started with our 11th exercise. So this is the roadmap that we saw. We saw the 11th one. Then we saw the Avro. Then we saw the Connect API. Started with KSQL and then did with Streams. Okay. 
So please go through all of these things to see what it is. And let me share my numbers and uh, uh, primarily the email ID because we are there in different uh, continents right now. So that's why the number will not be of any help. So let me share my email ID. So uh, you can be in touch with me on this one at gmail.com. So at any point of time, you can send me this email. And a small request from all of you is if you can click on file and if you can click on download, you can download it as a PDF document so that it will be always there with your friends. So that's what is my suggestion because I'll keep it there tomorrow also. But then I'm in India time tomorrow. Okay. Uh, day after tomorrow, this will be deleted friend, because every week we have this kind of document that has been created. This was created for uh, the earlier batches also. So please go down to your file, go down to your download and download it as a PDF so that you'll have this document with you to see what all things we have done. Please practice all the questions what we have said so that you can go through those things. And I have given you my email so that uh, if, you, if you run into any issues or anything that you would just bounce off your ideas with me, you can do that. In case if you want to uh, WhatsApp me, you can do that also. So we'll share my number also this is what is my uh this is my cell number as well as my whatsapp number folks so at any point of time if you feel but the only challenge is we are there in a completely different time zone so uh, during your working hours it will be night for me dear but but when as and when i see it i will definitely be replying back to that friends so that's what i can tell you so please uh, practice whatever we have done and uh, if you have any further questions uh, we can definitely answer that guys otherwise uh, this is where we have uh, finished with the complete course and uh, we are done with it friends so i'll just leave it for any other questions what you might have friends i'll keep it open so feel free and ask me any questions uh, one more thing Please plan to get certified, guys. So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of scope that is there in this. So look out for your Kafka certification. So plan for your certification and look at uh, this. So go down for Confluent uh, developer. No, not training. Certification is there. Confluent has got their certification, I know. There we go. Go down for Confluent Kafka. I don't want to go for the uh, exam kind of a thing. Yeah, there we go. It's about $150. And this is the link that I want to share with you. So this is about the certification. Okay. And uh, uh, earlier uh, they were, I, I think even now they are planning to have it as uh, objective type. So try to take the certification when it is objective type, it becomes easier. Uh, after that, they will all make it as hands-on, you know. So you will have to go ahead and see how you can focus on the exam that you want to go for. So plan for this. This is something that you can definitely look at. So as of now, also it is objective type. Okay. But uh, uh, looking at the pattern of the other exams, uh, it was initially objective type and then they have made it as a scenario based, you know. So scenario based is what is uh, really good. You will understand how things are and some of the frequently answered asked questions. So this is something that you can easily look out for. And it's a strong suggestion that you should plan for your certification course. So now let me keep it open for questions, guys. If you have anything, uh, feel free. You can definitely WhatsApp me or email me and I'll be in a position to answer, answer that folks. So anything, please let me know, dear. And a request would be to please try this thing right from scratch. And I know that uh, if you want, you can actually download one more image uh, from the same link so that you will have a raw image and you can practice all of these things. Right? So that's how you will understand the whole concepts. Mm -hmm.